That night, the light of the stars in the sky was eclipsed by a castle blazing with fire in the middle of the desert, which had almost burned to the ground, releasing black soot into the sky. The castle was burning with bright tongues of flame and you could hear the crackling of wood from which sparks flew like shots. A sign at the entrance to the castle stated that the Sima clan resided here. The sign with the inscription could not withstand the force of the fire, and the burning one collapsed right behind the walking men, one of whom was old and the other was holding the old man by the arm, and in front of them there were many dead bodies lying on the ground. In front of the men stood a creepy man from whom a green glow emanated, and behind this terrible man stood an army of people wearing red capes on their heads so that their faces could not be seen, and he told them that they tried to escape, but now they were still standing in front of him. The men were stained with blood, which indicated their struggle, and the old man, who was still being held by the younger man, stepped forward to say something to the big man. The monster, in the likeness of a man, also had a green glow in its eyes, and an evil smile stretched across its face when it saw that the old man wanted to object to something. The elder swore at the big man, shouting at him how dare he do such a thing, and had he really completely forgotten about the commandments of the teachings. The old man, because he was angry and screamed, began coughing up blood, clearly being wounded and already very weak. And the man who picked up the old man shouted his father in fear. The old man fell to his knees, exhausted, and with him his son, which greatly amused the creepy man who was still standing and watching them. The killer, showing a terrible grin, told the old man that he did not remember anything from the commandments of the teaching, except the part where it was said about strength. The unfortunate student decided to immediately show what he was capable of, and putting his hand forward, used his strength, from which the old man could only cover himself with his hand for protection. Green tongues crawled from the killer's hand in the direction of the old man, but the son was not going to just give up and decided to resist it. The son repelled the attack of the green flame with a bright light, putting one hand forward and holding his weak father with the other. The big man, turning indifferently to the old man, said that the time had come for him to throw away his life and that he would help him get rid of the pain. The student's plan to kill his teacher was interrupted by one of the subjects who shouted to the owner that he had found the one he needed, dragging in his hand an immobilized body in bloody clothes. Father and son looked at the heartbreaking picture of one of their sons being dragged away. The man furiously shouted for these monsters to immediately let his brother go, and the father stood nearby, grief-stricken, and did not want to accept what he saw. The old man felt bad again, and he knelt down and his son sat down next to him, and the student, happy that he took what he wanted, turned around to approach the subject who was still holding the body by the scruff of the neck like a rag and said that this is the one they need. The young man was unconscious and his head hung, which did not bother the tyrant at all, and he said that they very easily obtained the valuable ingredient. The student wanted to look at the victim, and with the words, let me look at your face, he approached the body and grabbed the long hair. The tyrant saw in front of him the face of a rather young boy whose eyes were large, and although dimmed because he was unconscious, they had a beautiful purple color. The killer saw the young man's weak state and voice that he could barely breathe. The guy's gaze was directed into nowhere and seemed dead and cold, and not a single muscle on his face shuddered. But somewhere deep in the boy's body, a force arose that was bright and emanated a purple glow. And this power did not take long to wait, but manifested itself in full force, which returned the violet color to the guy's eyes and life and energy to his body. In the boy's eyes, at the moment of the return of power, one could see the birth of a new galaxy. It was so powerful. Taking a loud and sharp breath of air, the guy came to life and opened his eyes wide. It was as if the dullness in his eyes had never happened. But now he needed time to come to his senses, and the guy, as he was sitting, began to look at everything in front of him. The first thing he thought about was whether he had really returned and, carefully looking at the first thing that caught his eye, which were his hands, he was surprised why they were so small, and he also wanted to understand at what time he returned. But the young man abruptly pushed all his questions aside for later and decided to first find out how this man dared to grab him by the hair like that. The tyrant, not understanding what was happening, asked the young man what he meant and said whether this kid had gone crazy. The guy sharply but confidently grabbed the scoundrel by the hand, freeing his hair and his whole body glowed with a purple train. The young man getting up from his knees told the tyrant that, to be precise, he had not gone crazy. And finally, rising to his full height, the boy held the huge man's hand above his head with his small hand and ended with the word that he had returned. The Hulk didn't show it, 
but thoughts flashed through his head about how this little kid who was unconscious was able to free himself from his grip and was also holding his hand so he couldn't move. The guy, sparkling with his amethyst eyes, asked the tyrant who he was to do this and, without making much effort, squeezed his huge hand so that it began to shake and added that the bastard was just an empty place. This time the big man got nervous and drops of sweat crawled down his face and he thought to himself how powerful the boy was. The tyrant swore at the young man and raised his fist over him, shouting that he himself should hurry to the next world. The big man was a mountain compared to the boy, and now the tyrant's fist, cutting through the air, almost reached the guy. The hand, like a heavy hammer, came to the boy's head and he looked questioningly at the giant. The fist, just a drop short of reaching the head, was repelled by the guy's jump and the attack of his strength. The thug was in so much pain that he screamed furiously and his eyes rolled back. The tyrant could not help but scream because the boy had pierced his chest right through with his blow. The army stood looking at the fall and death of its leader, who fell at the feet of the boy, and behind him, on his knees, father and son watched everything. The men looked at their son and brother with their mouths open, but saw in him a completely different individual. The servants could not contain their emotions because they could not believe that the one who recently had power and dominance over everyone was now lying dead. But the clan also had its own strength, and instead of retreating, with a feeling of rage and a desire for revenge, with burning red eyes, they rushed towards the guy. The servants, like ghosts, flew at the boy, shouting to everyone not to let this boy live, but to kill him. These cries of death greatly surprised the guy, and he rolled up his sleeves with a smile and was already preparing for the attack. The forces clashed in a bright blow, as if two different fires were opposing each other. Bright purple stripes like blades cut enemies to shreds, leaving behind only splashes of blood. In front of the boy lay a huge mountain of corpses, and the ground was painted red. The ground was so drenched in blood that the guy noted to himself how strongly he could smell it. And I realized that this smell in this picture before my eyes looked exactly the same as on that day. He remembered his past incarnation, how he stood in the middle of a mountain of corpses and a sea of blood of those whom he trusted, but they betrayed him. The warrior remembered even more enemies who wanted his death, waiting for the moment to pounce on him. Warriors with swords and their ringing sound of blades and the screams of rage of those attacking him surfaced in his memory. But suddenly, among all this darkness, one appeared whose movements were like the flapping of the wings of a butterfly. She cut through enemies with a sword as if it were part of her body, leaving behind a bright heavenly glow. The woman looked up where on the mountain of corpses stood the one next to whom she wanted to be now more than life. She stood below wounded and saw death approaching the warrior in the form of an enemy with a sword. And the warrior stood motionless, doing nothing, not moving and not speaking. The woman was shaking from powerlessness and held her hand on her body where there was a large wound from which blood flowed. The warrior, continuing to scroll through his memories, realized that in the place where he stood, he too had to die. At least he hoped for death, and saw in front of him an enemy who was rushing at him with a sword. Accepting his fate, the warrior closed his eyes and froze in anticipation, and the sword was already at his head. But the air was pierced by a scream and the sound of a sword cutting human flesh, causing the warrior's eyes to open. The warrior watched as the sword fell from the enemy's hand, and a blade was sticking out of his chest, and blood was gushing out. The warrior remembered how, as a result, everything changed because of the woman he saw after the fall of the enemy. The warrior, unable to contain the pain and anger that he had to endure, shouted only one word why. The woman moved closer to the warrior, but no longer having any strength to stand on her feet, she began to fall. And while in the warrior's memory, the woman, exhausted and bleeding, was already on her knees in front of him, he realized that if she had not intervened, throwing away her life, then in this place, instead of a mountain of corpses, only his body would have been buried. The warrior on the fly grabbed the woman's shoulder with his hand, which was covered in blood as well as all their clothes. The warrior, holding the woman behind his back, silently looked at her just as she looked at him, and only the wind broke this grave silence by playing with the curls of their hair. The warrior recalled how he decided to ask again why the woman saved him because he was really curious. The woman looked at the warrior's face with eyes full of tears and replied that only now he looked at her. The warrior saw himself in the reflection of the woman's eyes as he had never seen him anywhere else. The warrior looked at how heavily the woman was breathing and remembered that this individual was his sworn enemy. He sat on a mountain of corpses holding a woman in his arms and knew that the outcome of the duel with an old enemy had to be decided here. The woman was already very weak, but she still raised her trembling hand to the warrior. 
She touched his face and asked him not to cry, although streams were flowing from her eyes. The warrior looked at the woman in surprise and asked if he was crying. Large drops of tears rolled from the warrior's eyes, and he asked himself if he still had them. And the woman continued holding her hand on the man's face and said that he was not to blame for anything. The warrior was afraid from pain and hopelessness, and he did not find anything to answer the woman, but he felt her hand lowering. Breathing heavily, she told the warrior to think of it as a bad dream. The warrior realized that she had almost left him and furiously shouted so that the woman would not die. With her last breath, the woman turned to the warrior with the words that if the time spent with her was even a little worth it, even if it was a nightmare, then let him find her again. And she was already flying into her other incarnation of a girl who lived in a castle among the Rocky Mountains. And now, five years later, the story continues in the desert through which, at that time, a wanderer was walking with his camel. The man was wrapped from head to toe in cloth and the camel walked behind him, laden like a mule. The camel stopped because he heard some approaching sounds. Out of nowhere, a man also wrapped in cloth jumped on top of the camel. And just as abruptly this man appeared, just as abruptly he disappeared from the back of the animal. The camel tried to tell his owner about the unknown person by shaking his head, but the owner did not understand what the animal wanted to tell him. Meanwhile, an unknown person moved further along the sandy mounds with lightning speed. Deftly covering a long distance with jumps, the traveler seemed to be playing with the wind in a race. And so he finally landed softly and silently, and from under the mask on his face, amethyst eyes shone. The warrior took off his mask and looked with a smile in the direction where he had arrived. He looked at the city in a green valley from a bird's eye view and thought to himself that he would soon become a general. The sign of the huge house said that it was a martial arts school, but even without the inscription, the appearance of the building was quite strict and restrained, and one would have thought something similar. At the entrance to the castle, there was a huge slab with an image of a dragon and sacred scripture, and the school itself was created to educate novice masters. The students in the classes performed the technique so perfectly and harmoniously that one might think that they were cloned, and it is not for nothing that for a very long time talented children from all walks of life have been gathered here and studied with the best from Murum. Among the best of Murim are the famous old schools, where the direct descendants of the five dynasties, as well as the children of the highest families, study. In the background of the Dongcheon residence, there were mountains and dense forests, and in front of the residence, a flag fluttered in the wind. In the residence, men sat at the table and thought to themselves about rumors that said that a teacher would arrive at the martial arts school. But here was a completely different person. The men continued to think about whether this man was from Gimchen or perhaps from Sinchon, and they were very worried about the question of why this man was even here. The men sat at the table, and while drinking tea, looked at the back of the one who was standing at the window, and thought that someone of such a high level had come here and was personally waiting. The fighters were very interested in who this new master was, and if thoughts could be heard, they would say it all in one voice. The man stood and looked into the distance, and then broke the silence and said that the one he was waiting for was late. This strict master's name was Ma Kil Seong, and he was one of the elders of Gangho, who was always considered the strongest master among the ten great ones from Gangho. Although Ma Kil Seong was an open-minded elder and a prominent member of the Murim Alliance, he was rarely encountered due to his strong passion for travel. The wait for the master and his contemplation of the roofs of the school were disrupted by the address to him as Ma De Yap, the head of Dongchon. Jun Hyun turned to the master, trying to find out the reason why he personally came here, but the master interrupted him. Mako Sun asked if it was really so strange that he, as a master, decided to drop by the martial arts school. He Jong timidly replied that he was simply surprised that the master personally came all the way here because of the new teacher. The head asked the master whether the new teacher was really so talented, to which he received the answer that it was unlikely and asked his next question that the teacher could come from the five great dynasties, or was he a student of the great master, to which he again received a negative answer. The master told the head that he could not go into details and asked for forgiveness. The head smiled and said that nothing could be done, but he thought to himself that since the master was higher in rank, he couldn't question him anymore. Behind the doors, confident and loud steps were heard of the one whom everyone had been waiting for so much. The doors opened, and the student entered the room with a smile on his face, greeting everyone present loudly and cheerfully. The master was horrified, most likely knowing who it was, and the head had the same silent question on his face, but without surprise. The fighters turned their attention to the appearance of the so-called teacher, but there was no reaction. 
The servants announced the arrival of a new mentor, Cho Eun-hwa, who had the mark of the House of Brass on his back. With his hands folded in a gesture familiar to students and masters, the teacher announced that from today, he was assigned to Dong Cheon. The teacher continued to stand in front of everyone with a smile and folded hands in a gesture of greeting and respect and said, I ask you to love and favor. He Jong looked at the new teacher and thought swirled in his head about why this man was making him shiver. The head noticed for himself that the teacher's arms and legs looked thin, but he looked quite neat. The head also noticed, among other things, that the teacher's hair was combed back and tied in a ponytail. But despite the neatness of the teacher, He Jong was still embarrassed by the length and pomp of the young man's bangs, which also got in the way of his face. But the head immediately stopped himself in the bud by saying that these were all the teacher's personal preferences. Now He Jong began aloud to bombard the teacher with questions about whether he was really 25 and indicated that the young man looked quite young, to which Cho Un said that he looked so young because of the childish face that had been passed down in his family from generation to generation. The teacher liked to joke, judging by the fact that he said that he was a respectable man, so there was nothing strange even if he suddenly decided to get married. The head hesitated a little after hearing this, but agreed and then asked how the teacher received permission to get here, to which he replied about receiving permission from Chungamun. He Jong lowered his gaze as if he was scrolling through pictures in his head and repeating, Chung Moon said that he had never heard such a thing before. Cho Un smiled sincerely, answering that this small rundown village is not particularly famous for anything. He Jong was shocked, to put it mildly, because usually when they talk about a letter of recommendation, they proudly stand out with their connections, and no matter how modest the school is, everyone tries to find something to brag about. Jong told Cho Woon that he still saw that he had become a first-class master, but the teacher interrupted him and said that this was not so, and that it was because he was good in himself. The head looked carefully at the guy and felt that something was clearly wrong with him. Zhang dropped this conversation, saying that he understood, but still concluded for himself that the guy was really very strange. The head asked teacher Yom to show Cho Un his room and tell him how everything works here, to which Yom replied in the affirmative. Zhang also turned to the new teacher with a request to take his things and follow mentor Young and Cho Un. Looking at Yom, thought that he looked like a poisonous toad. In a tall building on the fifth floor, steps could be heard, and the voice of a mentor addressed to the teacher that the new one would live here. Mentor Yom pointed his finger to the side and said that the new guy's room was the last one at the end of the fifth floor, and Cho Un silently accepted this. Cho Un simply looked at the mentor, but he bared his mouth through his teeth and asked if the guy had any complaints. The new teacher absolutely calmly answered the mentor that he had no complaints. Cho Un inquired that since Dong Qian is quite spacious, is it enough for him to know where only the dormitory and the training ground are located? To which Yom also overly and through gritted teeth replied that the guy would find out the rest on his own over time. The new guy turned around and walked towards his room, thinking that he had nothing to say to all this, and he didn't understand why Yumu didn't like him so much. And behind his back, the mentor spat to the side, showing his disrespect. Cho Un stood at the window and Yom asked him if he introduced himself as Un Hui to which the new guy replied with his full name, Cho Un Hui, correcting the mentor, and he, as if provoking Cho Un, distorted his statement and disdainfully replied that it makes no difference what you call him. Yom asked Cho Un how he managed to get connections, meaning Master Ma, who was waiting for the teacher. Cho Un answered honestly and calmly that today he saw Master Ma for the first time. Yom made a displeased face and, pointing his finger at the guy, asked why the master came all the way here just to look at Cho Un, and by this he wanted to say that because of this visit they had to clean up early in the morning. The mentor said the last thing, that because of the visit, everyone was on nerves, so from now on Cho Un will have to be more careful and try not to stand out, after which he turned around and went to the exit. The new guy didn't understand why he should do this, but remained silent. The doors of the room were difficult to open and creaked, apparently because they were stagnant. Cho Un was able to open the door completely. Standing at the threshold, he already saw cobwebs in the corners of the room. The teacher realized that the room had not been cleaned on purpose when he saw the state of the bed, the floor, and the walls, and it was all covered in dust and dirt, and there was a bunch of cobwebs hanging on top. The newcomer concluded that not only did the room not smell like cleaning, but that it was completely abandoned. Cho Un put his things on the table, causing dust to rise in small clouds. Cho Un opened the window, and a huge amount of dust flew from it as if the room had not been ventilated for a hundred years. The guy realized that Yom seemed to have given him the top floor on purpose so that it would be difficult to walk back and forth. But this did not upset Cho Un, 
because the view from the window was amazing. Cho Un caught himself thinking that he would like to look around here some more, but then he prioritized cleaning his room. The guy raised his hand in front of him, and barely noticeable streams of wind came from it. But Cho Un raised his hand even higher, and as if increasing the energy of the wind, began to spin the funnel. The teacher competently managed his power, neither reducing it nor increasing it more than necessary. With light movements of his hand, he moved the wind, directing it as needed to clear the room. When all the dust and cobwebs were picked up by the wind, Cho Un directed him to the open window. And so much garbage poured out through the window as if it was not a room but a dirty street. Of all the windows in the house, only one was open, and from it a cloud of dust rose up towards the sky and the sun. Everything in the room sparkled as if after a spring cleaning, so the teacher was pleased with the work done. The evening rays enveloped the building in which Cho Un was staying, changing the color of the walls to a completely different color than it was in the morning. The guy left the window open and had already settled in the room, hanging up his outerwear and sat down at the table to open the box. The small box contained a sharp throwing blade and two bags, blue and burgundy. Cho Un picked up the blue bag and took out a ball very similar to a pearl, only golden in color, which was called the Heavenly Elixir. The Heavenly Elixir pill was needed so that if a warrior with chi eats them, he can restore his chi, but if an ordinary person eats the pill, he will live a long and happy life. And in the burgundy bag, clearly representing blood, lay seven precious pills of the legendary deadly poison that will kill as soon as it is eaten, and the poisoned person will not be able to take even seven steps. Having wrapped his wealth in a cloak, the guy was wildly happy that the most important thing was next to him. Cho Un fell on the bed with the thought that he could finally rest. The guy lay and looked at the ceiling, meanwhile thinking that five years had passed since he returned to life, and there was still a long way ahead, but he had already taken an important step. The teacher was so pleased and peaceful that he couldn't believe for a second whether everything was really as he thought. For the first time in a long time, Cho Un was able to fall asleep peacefully, plunging into the arms of sleep. And the dream was sweet compared to other dreams over the last hundred years of Cho Un Hui's existence. The guy had a dream where he fought with a huge snake that personified those who believed in the words of the traitor and hit him in the back, because of which even more enemies came out against him if that woman had not stopped them at the cost of her life. Cho Un saw the woman in his dream as clearly as when she died in his arms, and he heard her words that it was just a bad dream and that he would find her again at the end of this nightmare. The guy saw in a dream how he was holding a woman in his arms, shouting her name Man Zhang Hui, and telling her how she dared to leave him. Cho Un screamed and woke up from his sleep, trying to catch his breath after all the memories. The teacher thought that he had definitely heard something crack, but could not understand what. But after carefully examining everything around, he saw how his leg got stuck in the wall, breaking it. Cho Un sat on the bed and carefully looked at the consequences of his dream, trying to come to his senses. The guy pulled out his leg and was already reproaching himself for what he had done just arriving at the exercise. Cho Un, looking at the hole in the wall, tried to reassure himself that there was nothing terrible, but something needed to be done about it. The guy, out of curiosity, decided to look into the hole since it appeared. Cho Un saw a pretty girl there who at first didn't quite understand why the wall broke. But when the girl saw the eye that was watching her through the broken wall, she felt uneasy. The guy realized that he had terribly embarrassed the girl, which made him also embarrassed, and began to say all sorts of polite nonsense like how nice the morning and weather were today. A bundle of bandages fell from the girl's hands to the floor and she ran out of the room. The girl's scream was so loud that she could be heard and on the street causing the birds to fly into the sky. From the house where the teacher met everyone, the screams of the enraged head Jong were heard that the new guy managed to break through the wall on the very first day. Cho Un was burning with shame and, at least jokingly, tried to justify himself by saying that the walls were flimsy and the builders had generally done a poor job. The head jumped up from the table, slamming his hands on it and shouted to the new guy to be silent. Zhang, continuing to stand, began to draw something with a brush on a sheet of paper. Cho Un noticed that the head was writing something and worriedly asked what exactly. The head replied to the teacher that on paper, the amount that Cho would have to reimburse. Cho Un could not contain his surprise and voiced his indignation that a tree that seemed rotten was worth 30 silver and asked the head if it was really gilded. The head was so furious at Cho Un's ignorance that he had broken not just a piece of wood, but a hop horn beam, that is, a Japanese tree of the birch family, which is called iron because of its strong trunk and grows in Nanman. Jong threatened the new guy that if he had his way, he would have forced him to pay all the repair costs. But since this was the first mistake, he said to pay at least for the material 
and Cho Un stood and was still digesting the information that, firstly, he was able to break the iron tree, and secondly, secondly, he broke an expensive tree. The guy sighed heavily because no matter how he was in a difficult situation. The newcomer headed towards the exit, but the same girl who ran away was walking towards him, and now she turned to the teacher apologizing and said that it was most likely because she made noise. It was clear from the girl that she was uncomfortable with what happened and was worried. Cho Un at that moment was thinking that he had broken the wall and was guilty, and the girl was apologizing to him and it seemed strange to him. Cho Un made a serious face and asked the girl if she really thought that just an apology was enough, to which the poor girl became even more worried and offered her help in the form of splitting the payment between two. The guy realized that the girl took his joke completely seriously, immediately explained his humor to her, and said that since it was initially his fault, he would pay, which made the girl cheerful. Cho Un looked at the girl and thought that she was most likely worried that he would force her to pay because the mentors in Dong Chion still had a small salary. The teacher continued to look at the girl and found her very cute. Cho Un asked if there was a division between men and women here and whether they really used the same building to spend the night, to which the girl replied that this is only the case in Dong Chion. The girl kindly explained that in Incheon, there are divisions between bedrooms on each floor, but in Gimcheon, everything is different due to the size of the building. But in Sinchon, she heard that the teachers each live in a separate annex. Cho Un changed his face to himself, saying what kind of world this is, in which money is everything. And the girl, noticing the changes in the guy's face, asked what he said. The teacher brought the girl's question back from her thoughts to the real world. And he said that he didn't even introduce himself brought his hands together in a gesture of greeting and said the full name of Cho Un Hui. The girl was glad to meet you and also, folding her hands to show her respect, called herself Yo Mei Hong and expressed her hope that they would get along. At that moment, other mentors came in and Yom turned to mentor Yo and sarcastically said that getting along with the new guy was the best idea. Yom said sarcastically that the new guy is the one who is trying to attract attention by making unnecessary noise. Cho Un repeated that they just have flimsy walls to which Yom asked the guy if he really just called the iron tree frail, adding to this whether the new guy is too bragging. Yom told Mentor Ye to leave this guy and suggested that everyone go have a snack together. Yome said that everything was fine and she didn't need it, and Yom, seeing the change in the girl's face, asked not to be too strict on her, arguing that they were close. Mentor Yo repeated that everything was fine, to which Yom agreed and added that she knew that he was not the one who would force anyone to do anything. Yom shouted that in this case, everyone is going to have a drink together. To which the other mentors asked if he would pay for the drink, and now it's clear why he looked excited since the morning. Cho Un asked Yom Mei if it was normal that the mentors were going to drink at such a time. To which the girl explained that they have fun like that only sometimes because the students in Dong Chon are not particularly keen on martial arts. So they slack off during group training. The girl continued that, Instead of learning from mentors with enthusiasm, they simply use only the fighting skills learned in the family and therefore most invite external masters and learn from them. And the girl herself also often takes private lessons. Cho Un asked a completely logical question. Why then try to enroll here at all? And the girl explained that there is no better place than here to make connections. The guy said in disappointment that he didn't expect that Kang Ho's cradle was rotten through and through and the girl said that this was especially true for Dong Cheon. Cho Un decided to lighten up their conversation and concluded that you need to have a good time to understand this place and invited Yo Mei to talk over food. Mentor Yo said that it was great, but explained that although the food here is free, it tastes like nothing. Cho Un reassured the girl and said that he would buy his mentor something tasty in the dining room. Yo Mei was surprised and explained that the food here is free because it's not called food here for nothing. The guy didn't seem to hear Yomei and joyfully walked towards the dining room, repeating that he would buy food and called her to come with him. Yomei was even more surprised because most of the teachers in Dongcheon are arrogant. Mentally, the girl remembered the behavior of the other mentors and already knew that among them it is customary to exaggerate their achievements, which in fact are not there, and they brag to show their superiority. And now she looked at the new mentor and realized that on the other hand, he seemed to be different from the others. Yomei covered her smile from the thought that this new mentor seemed like a pleasant person to her. The mentor followed the guy and thought that, thanks to the guy, the impenetrable life in Dongqian would become a little more fun. The girl quickened her pace and called Cho to wait for her because the guy had almost entered the dining room. A blush appeared on Yomei's cheeks from the fact that life really began to sparkle with different colors. 
Mentor Cho realized that he had become very close to Mei after that incident with the broken wall. The more the guy got to know the mentor, the more convinced he was that she was very capable and strong, and she also told a lot about the school and showed everything. Yomei explained that Dongqian has a total of 12 pavilions and 30 rooms, and in the back there is a training ground for mentors. And in the very central part, there is a large training ground where they conduct group training twice a week. Mentor Cho sat down on the bench and tiredly asked if Mentor Yomei didn't say that Dong Qian is the smallest of the schools, to which the girl smiled and said that their school is the smallest. Cho Un asked in an exhausted voice if they really call it small because they spent half a day just to inspect everything here. Mentor Cho recalled that he managed to see only five huge pavilions and several smaller ones, and as if reading Yomei's thoughts, she said that the Inchin residence was twice as large, and Gimshin was three times larger. And tired of just the words, Cho asked why make them so big. Teacher Yomei explained that most people study martial arts here, but this is only a small part of what the school can provide. And the girl gave examples that here you can learn such art as poetry, drawing, or calligraphy, and even study military strategy. And there are also several places to drink tea and countless training grounds. While the mentor was saying that it's not for nothing that such establishments are called the cradle of the political faction, Cho thought that if he sold a few tiles, he could increase his monthly salary. Yomei asked if Cho knew any of his students, to which, out of misunderstanding, the guy asked again, repeating the same question with one of the students. The teacher was shocked that ten days after Cho, he was not assigned students, and the guy was dissatisfied with the fact that in addition to carrying out the orders of the nasty teachers, he also needed to take care of the students. Cho remembered that same nasty toad in the form of mentor Yom and thought that he was working hard. The guy analyzed that the fact that Yom did not approve of him was obvious, given that he looked at the guy angrily every time Cho just appeared in his field of vision, and Cho jokingly thought to himself that he would soon have a hole in the back of his head. Mentor Yomei asked what Cho had been doing all this time and the guy replied that he was cleaning the training ground or watering the orchids in the backyard and sometimes fixing broken mannequins. Yomei was both angry and upset at the same time because this is the job of juniors in rank, and they are mentors, and their job is to instruct and teach martial arts. The girl came to her senses and asked Cho for forgiveness, saying that she didn't want to be angry with him. Cho said that everything was fine, but thought to himself that the mentor seemed to be able to get angry too. The guy still wondered why none of the students were assigned to him, but at the same moment he realized that he would have more work if the students appeared. This issue was resolved on its own because Cho learned from Yo Mei that every month competitions are held between mentors and their students. Mentor Yo said that such competitions for the achievements of teachers are the best way to test how well a mentor teaches martial arts. And this is also an opportunity to find young masters among students. Cho Un thought about Yo Mei's words that if you compete every month, then the mentors will not neglect their responsibilities and the students will keep themselves in shape and this is quite effective. But the guy returned to the same problem with which he started, that he now has no opportunity to teach anyone martial arts because he has no students. Silence fell between the interlocutors, but Cho Un continued to look at Yo Mei, which made the situation awkward, and the mentor became embarrassed, thinking about why he was looking at her like that. Cho Wung immediately went to the main building of Dong Chan where Chief Zhang usually stayed. Mentor Cho sharply opened the doors, and Yo Mei could barely keep up with him, and turning to the head of Zhang, he asked how this happened. In front of the head's table stood that same nasty toad in the form of Yom, already grinning at what was happening. And when head Zhang asked what had already happened, Cho asked why none of the students were assigned to him. Judging by the reaction on Jun's face, he really didn't understand what Mentor Cho meant. And Yom thought to himself how quickly this guy noticed it. Mentor Yom, pretending to be a fool, began to bleat that in fact, he was going to assign students to the new guy, but the problem was that no one liked the mentor. Mentor Cho directly asked a completely logical question that they didn't like him, whom the students had never even met. Further, pretending to be innocent, Yom said that thinking about Mentor Cho, he selected several good talents. But the problem turned out to be just as fictitious as the rest of Yom's words, and it was that most of the students stated that studying with an unnamed mentor would hurt their pride, to which Head Zhang said that, be that as it may, Shouldn't the guy be given a chance to prove himself? Swan Yom bowed and said that this was his mistake, and he would immediately take measures to correct the situation. Chief Yong approached Yom and said that since he took over as the head of Dong Cheon, he has been losing his precious hair due to such daily troubles and asked his mentor not to let him go bald ahead of time. Mentor Yom realized that the matter was really serious, 
and the demand for his antics would be dear to him, so he replied that he understood everything and asked the head not to worry. Mentor Yom and Cho were left alone, and while on the street the toad said displeasedly that the new guy wanted Yom to take care of him too, and added that he really couldn't sit quietly, or had he decided to kill him completely. Mentor Cho remained silent, but turned his head and looked around and realized that there was no one nearby, which means there were no witnesses. The new guy's fist clenched, and he thought that since no one was there, he might as well try this nasty, poisonous toad just once. But Cho stopped Yom from throwing the notebook in his direction, which the guy managed by deftly grabbing it, and heard from Yom that the new guy was now responsible for these students. Cho flipped through a notebook with many sheets of paper and asked Yom if he was answering for everyone, to which the toad disrespectfully spat to the side and replied that there were only 20 people and added that it was Cho's direct responsibility as a mentor to take care of each of them. Yom was jubilant at having delegated such a difficult job to a new person and sarcastically thought that it would be seen whether Cho could cope with the task. Meanwhile, there were already about 20 days left before the competition, and Mentor Cho was actively visiting students from the list and was now just looking for Kuso Hep, which means addressing a fighter of junior rank. Mentor Cho pulled back the screen and found the student in the room, and he began to make excuses by saying that he was absent because something happened. Mentor Cho didn't even have time to insert a word before the student replied that he did not need the teachings of a newcomer and was going to learn from Master Chan and Yang. Another student answered indifferently that he was studying forensic science and, in general, was not interested in group training from someone who was not even a martial arts master, and the student objected that she was not going to study from someone who came from God knows where. Mentor Cho went outside to sit and catch his breath because he didn't understand what was going on, and the situation began to piss him off. The guy analyzed that all the students he visited last night sharply refused him, and it was not just a lack of motivation, because as soon as he spoke to them, they immediately avoided him as if they saw something unpleasant. At a moment of reflection, Yome approached Cho and asked if the mentor had met with the students entrusted to him, to which the puzzled Cho turned to the mentor, looking at her carefully and asked if he really smelled bad, to which he saw surprise on the girl's face. Mentor Cho explained to Yome the problem he encountered yesterday and expressed his misunderstanding of the situation. Yome thought about it and gave Cho the puzzle that was missing, saying that this behavior of the students was due to the fact that rumors were spreading. And this surprised the guy, but he asked what kind of rumors. Mentor Yo explained that the rumors first circulated among the mentors and now seem to have reached the students. Yo Mei told some of the rumors that Cho doesn't know how to do anything and got here because of connections and paid a lot of money to be accepted. But Yo Mei immediately said that she dismissed it as rumors and the guy, in turn, thought that it was strange that doesn't sound so bad. And to everything else, the girl added that there are rumors that Mentor Cho is beating around the bush trying to lure men from which the guy was shocked and shouted if they were really trying to stop him from getting married, and Yo Mei asked if this matters now. Cho Un changed his face, becoming angry, but answered not to the girl, but to himself and his thoughts that this is very important, because the reason why he came to the martial arts school in the first place was to meet her. Out loud, the guy asked only one question. What is the point of doing this to him? To which Yo Mei put forward her assumptions that teacher Yom is in this way trying to oust those who have exceptional abilities or those he does not like. Crackling his fists, Cho said that since this had already been done, it seemed that there was no way out, and he was now thinking whether he should act in the same dirty way, to which Yo Mei replied that it was not worth it and added that although Yom has a bad character, he is talented and outstanding master. The guy smiled, thinking that even if that toad was a master ten times over, he was far from him. Yo Mei's mentor said that she had a person who could help Cho solve his problem, and the guy was embarrassed and happy at the same time because the girl was trying to help him and thought that it was great to finally meet someone. And while Cho was wondering who this person was who would help him, they came to Yo Mei's sister and the guy noticed that she had a uniform for Inchin mentors and did not understand why people from one school would help people from another school in their work. The sister made Yome blush because she said out loud that the guy is a little different from what she heard and doesn't know about his character, but he has a cute appearance. The sister from Inchin saw Yome's reaction and placing her finger on her sister's plump and pink cheeks said that she was joking. Afterwards, the girl introduced herself as Mo Yan Sun, a teacher at the Inchin school. The guy also introduced himself as Cho Un Hui, the mentor of the Dongqian school. And in addition to everything, in his humorous manner, he said that he was 25 years old, which is the ideal marriageable age for a warrior. Mo laughed and said that, as expected, 
the guy was a really funny person, which was in line with the words of her sister May. May put her hand on her sister's shoulder and said that she and Song studied at the same martial arts school. And Mo added that she didn't even think that she would become a mentor in such a boring place. They were served food and Cho asked if Yom had always been the way he is now, to which Mo replied that he was, and he was famous when the sisters were in school. The Baozi looked delicious, and Mo took the first one, continuing to say that everyone who knows about the background of the rumors knows what kind of person he really is. Mo explained to Cho that teacher Yom is in good standing here, provided that if you constantly pay him a monetary contribution and do not cross the line, then he will have no reason to kick out the new one. Mentor Cho asked Mo about his suspicions that because of Yom, he was about to be thrown out of here and asked what he should do in that case, to which Mo replied that it would not be easy. But Mo still suggested that it would be best to attract a good student to her side and achieve noticeable success in competitions. And then Mo warned that no one had ever managed to do something like this before. But if Cho succeeded, he would be able to make an unusual impression on other students. Yomei understood what Mo meant and wanted to ask if she really meant what she thought. But Mei interrupted Cho and said that this was the only way out. And Mei tried to talk about that man with horror in her voice, but Mo did it for her sister. Mo named Namgung's student Yun Ho and designated him as a disgrace to the great Namgung family and the ghost of Dong Cheon. Cho immediately began to analyze in his head that if he bears the surname Namgung, this means that he is a descendant of one of the great families, and why then would someone from the Namgung family enroll in Dongcheon? Cho introduced this student and wanted to know why he is a disgrace to the family and also the ghost of Dongcheon. Mo, with a slight movement of her hand, threw one of the chopsticks onto the table, addressing Cho by his rank as Sohep. And while the wand was sticking out from behind the table, stuck into it and swaying like a pendulum, Mo asked Cho if he wanted to hear one legend. The wand caused cracks to spread across the table, but the guy didn't pay any attention to it and only asked Mo about the legend, showing his sincere interest. In one of Dong Cheon's rooms, Yom was having a conversation with one of the students and asked how things were going with the under-mentor Cho, to which the student replied that he cursed him to his face and he left very depressed. Yom asked what happened after, to which the student replied that he heard Cho go to see several other students. And the guy, being pleased with the fact that he worked as an informer, said that everyone closed the doors in front of Cho like everyone else and said to do Yom. This poisonous toad was satisfied and decided to encourage the student that it was time for him to get a promotion too. So he would assign a suitable mentor to the guy for these competitions so that he should show his skills properly. And Yom thought to himself that he wouldn't allow this new guy to stay here. So it's good to take care of it. Yom felt superior to other mentors and students since he was appointed as a leader on behalf of Head Yong, and his influence in Dong Cheon became absolute. This toad has used all sorts of methods to gain power, and the method he is now using is called repression. Yom recruits obedient students and manipulates public opinion among them, also forcing them into group actions against teachers he doesn't like in order to kick them out of school. When the goal is achieved, Yom manipulates the results of the competition to promote the people he needs. Be that as it may, holding competitions was within the competence of teacher Yuma, so there were no problems with rigging the results, and students of low and medium ranks whose skills were at stake were obsessed with moving up the career ladder. Well, after the students received this promotion in their careers, they kept silence about what happened, and Yom believed that Kanho is not only martial arts. Yom knew that all sorts of tricks were common here, and that some were not even shy about plotting intrigues against others while he was just letting arrogant mentors know the bitterness of life and he was sure that this was the mission of every teacher. Yum was distracted from his conversation with himself by a student who wanted to add something else, which greatly surprised the teacher that the guy was still here. The student put his hand into his shirt to take out something with words about his family, who wanted to thank the mentor as a school teacher. The guy took out a bag of coins and said that this was the teacher's troubles something like a small compensation for the fact that Yom took care of the student's promotion. Yuma was delighted to see money from what he was doing, and continuing to flatter and dissemble, he told the student that he was very proud of him. Throwing the jingling bag in his hand, Yom said that since the student shows such sincerity, there is no reason why he cannot help. Yom promised that this time the student would definitely advance in his career, which made the guy very happy, and after bowing, he thanked the teacher. Mentor Cho was haunted by thoughts about the ghost of Dong Cheon, and sitting on a bench in the garden in the evening, he studied the information. It was written in the notebook that the Namgung family 
is the first ranking family among the five great families whose power is beyond the reach of the influential forces of the nine great ones from Kanho. The heir of the family is praised and called the best among the past chapters. And in the text, Cho got to Namgung's younger brother, Yong Ho, who was also called the small dragon of the sword. It was also indicated in the scriptures that the outstanding talents who lead the future of the Kanho faction are called the five dragons and the three phoenixes. And Namgung Yong Ho was the most famous genius among the dragons but Namgung Yun Ho was the worst of the worst. Namgung Yun Ho is 21 years old and has been living in Dongchon for seven years, while others stay in Dongchon for no more than a year and at the latest two. Cho thought that it would be interesting to hear about this and realized that if Yun Ho has been rotting here for seven years, then the family has given up on him. And Cho also noticed that Yun Ho is not on the list of students. And what can we say about the meeting? In addition, Namgung Yong Ho was considered the young master of the great family, and those who were not familiar with the situation of how things were in Gang Ho did not even know about the existence of his brother Yun Ho. Cho continued to wonder one of which was whether the eldest son of the family could disappear and hide from everyone like that. Cho also remembered from Mo's story that it was not a coincidence at all that she knew about Yun Ho, who was not even on the list of students in Dong Cheon and that at first he studied at the same time as Mo, but then disappeared. That's why Namgung Yun Ho became something of a ghost, absent even from the documents. Cho continued to read the notes, realizing that no matter how you looked at it, it was all very strange. It's strange because this man was supposed to be fluent with a sword, but he is considered just a ghost of the school. Mentor Cho became quite interested in this whole mysterious story, and he smiled because he wanted to solve it. Dong Cheon, stern but lively, was bathed in the rays of the sun on this beautiful fine day. A long-haired fighter was walking around the school grounds, and to the side of him the voices of other students were heard talking among themselves. As soon as the fighter noticed the direction of the students in his direction, he rose upward like a spring. The guys, not noticing that there was literally someone just in front of them, continued to talk enthusiastically. The fighter, with his jump, ended up on the roof of the wall absolutely silently. When the fighter jumped from the tiles to the ground, Cho found him and said that he had done very well. Judging by the thick stubble on his face, the fighter had not been among people for quite a long time, as if he had gone wild and now did not expect that someone would take him by surprise like that. The fighter asked Cho who he was and the guy replied that he was the new mentor in Dongqin. The fighter indifferently turned around without answering Cho and went on about his business. Mentor Cho followed the fighter and said that he wanted to talk, to which the fighter replied that he had nothing to say. Cho insisted, and said that the conversation would only take a couple of minutes, but the fighter still said that he was not interested. Cho caught up with the fighter and asked him to at least listen while touching him. Touching the fighter was a big mistake because he turned to Cho very angry. Cho removed his hand and absolutely did not expect such a reaction from this man, but did not say anything. Yun Ho asked if Cho was also going to sell him some rare medicine. Cho did not understand at all what medicine we were talking about and his face also showed misunderstanding. And Yun Ho asked maybe Cho wanted to say that he would train him in a special way and Yun could even become a master. And without waiting for an answer, he said that before Cho, there were more than 10 mentors offering rare elixirs and those who tried to teach ridiculous tricks under the guise of special practices. And in addition, Yun told the story that there was someone who introduced him to the shaman and he said that he was cursed and Cho stood and listened silently to which Yun finished and asked what the mentor would do. Yun understood and said that Cho wanted to become famous by asking to be his mentor, and if he showed his favor to the shame of the Namgung family, he could boast of a good heroic story. Again, without waiting for Cho's answer, Ghost Yun added that he had no more money for quack medicines and there was not even hope left. When Yun left, he told Cho to follow his request to try to create a hero story for self-soothing with someone else and not disturb people with his curiosity. Cho did not catch up or call Yun this time, but simply remained standing in place silently watching the ghost go. Cho concluded that this guy himself said that he had nothing to talk about with me, but he didn't even let me get a word in. A blanket of night and silence hung over Dong Cheon, but somewhere under the trees, the movements of a sword could be heard. These sounds of cutting the wind came from Yun Ho, who was attempting to train. As always, fencing disappointed him, and no matter how much Yun Ho tried to awaken his internal energy, he could not control it properly but not to control it to such an extent that you stop feeling the energy. But at some point his stomach, in which he strongly felt the energy, began to go numb and sensitivity disappeared. Yun Ho was told that this could be a rare disease and he desperately tried to get some medicine, but in the end, 
nothing helped him. Still, Namgung Yunho could not lower his sword, so he continued his training desperately. Yunho thought that if he stopped training, he would forget the technique of wielding a sword, which is why he swung it so furiously. Yunho was still disappointed with his swordsmanship and clung to his training as hope. The fighter stubbornly continued to train, not without sometimes exhausting himself. If it weren't for all the rumors that were circulating about Yun Ho, he performed the technique perfectly, but his lack of faith in his own skills made itself felt. Yun Ho felt that he was tired and stopped, but it was clear from him that he was tired not only physically. The fighter drank plenty of water from the flask after such an act of training. Yun Ho wiped his mouth with his hand, removing the remaining water from the thick stubble of his face. And then Yun sat down on a bench to rest and think about what happened today. Yoon remembered the meeting with the new mentor and concluded from his appearance that he looked younger than him. Yoon grabbed his head from the fact that everyone was ahead of him and wondered why only he stood still. Yoon looked at his training tool standing next to him and thought that he was pathetic. The fighter looked further at his training weapon and realized that this was truly a pitiful sight. Yoon Ho took up the wooden sword and prepared to leave and somewhere nearby you could barely hear the words, I'm so sorry. The fighter headed towards the exit from the field with his head down once again disappointed in himself. The shop, like a good old friend, was left alone to wait for the next guest to support him both morally and physically. A purple glow appeared near the shop like a ghost or a teleport. As it turned out, Mentor Cho was nearby all this time and saw Yoon's training and heard how he was suffering from the problem. Mentor Cho, analyzing everything he heard, thought that Yun Ho was saying strange things. Cho followed Yoon with his eyes to the gate and realized the obvious that it was the same ghost. Mentor Cho wondered why the fighter couldn't just show this level now. This was an unanswered question, but one thing was clear for sure. Yun does not give up, even if he is disappointed by the countless number of attempts, which means he needs to push him somehow. After all, how many talented people in the world have given up in the face of disappointment? The only thing that makes Cho happy is that Yun is still holding on no matter what. Cho realized that he needed to find a way that could influence Yun the most because it is rare to see a talented person who moves straight forward and does not retreat even if there is darkness around him. But one thing became clear to Cho, and not because he knows the future and not because he needs it. Cho continued to look after Yun as he left and realized that it had to be him. Cho realized that his main mission would be to gain the attention and trust of this guy. Cho, smiling widely, made this decision for himself because he likes idiots like Nam Gung. From the house illuminated by lanterns in the evening, a dialogue between two men could be heard. One of the men in light clothes, walking from side to side, asked Master Ma if he had met Cho Un, to which the master answered in the affirmative. And then the next question was asked what Master Ma could say about the young man. Master Ma replied that he did not see anything special in the guy, and it seemed to him that the young man had not even mastered the demonic martial art. The man in a white robe was the head of the Zhang Quan Chu Martial Arts School, and his name was Song and Hyuk and she asked Master Ma if the master had such suspicions about the new guy. Master Ma argued that he doubted Cho Un's abilities more than that he could use demonic martial art because he saw his hands that did not have a hint of calluses from training. Master Ma also added that there were not only no calluses on the young man's hands, but even no scratches, and the head of Song replied that this was not a very common occurrence, but this could also happen. Head Sun expressed on this matter that he would not like to admit but there are warriors in the world, and they, like weeds, spend their lives in real battles. But there are also those who continue to remain on the training ground like a hothouse plant. Headsong thought that Cho Un was a rather ordinary guy, but the elder himself came and even asked me for a request, so the head wondered what kind of person the guy could be. Head Sun ran out to meet the elder, surprised that he had come personally, and Sun was ashamed that the master had to wait so long. The elder sat at the table drinking tea, and told Sun that he heard how he was appointed head of the Zhang Quan Chu Martial Arts School this time and congratulated him on his promotion. Head Song was embarrassed and half-heartedly thanked him, but then asked why the elder decided to go such a long way to him. It was clear from the old man's dirty and tired hands that the road had indeed been long, and the elder took a sip of tea from a mug before answering. The elder replied that he had come to ask the head for a favor, and Sun clarified what kind of favor he was talking about. The elder voiced that he wanted Sun to place a mentor somewhere, that he was 25 years old and a first-class master. The elder looked quite seriously at the head of Sun and added that he would not even mind if this was the lowest position, and at the end he added that he hoped that the request would be fulfilled. Headsong stood up from the table and offered to drink a glass and talk a little more because he had just recently received good alcohol. 
The elder followed the head with his eyes downcast, flying in his thoughts, and kept thinking about the same thing. The sage kept replaying his mentor's name in his thoughts over and over again, as if he was afraid to forget him, and it was Cho and Hui. The elder recalled that he used all his connections to find out something about him, at least where he lived or where he was from, or maybe something about his parents, but it was all in vain. The elder wondered to himself, this man could not appear like this out of nowhere. The elder decided to remember again how he and the guy met, and it all started on a fine day. Grandpa, having nothing to do out of boredom, decided to clean his obviously already dirty nose. And it was not in vain that I decided to check because a dried lump of snot launched into the air from my finger. The elder yawned sweetly through all his remaining teeth in old age, as if he wanted to suck in all the air. The yawn was followed by stretching since grandfather spent quite a long time sitting, but this did not stop him from noticing what a wonderful day it was. The old man decided to check his bowl and in horror, grabbed the place on his chest where his heart was. The bowl was empty and only a leaf fell there, as if nature itself felt sorry for the grandfather and wanted to help. The elder, looking carefully at the bowl, thought that maybe he should go back. Immediately after these words, something heavy and bright fell into the bowl because the elder's face glowed brighter than the sun. Grandpa, in shock, picked up a real gold bar and couldn't believe his eyes. Grandpa was even more surprised by who stood in front of him and threw this gold, and a tall, long-haired guy in clothes stained with blood addressed him. The guy again turned to Elder Chivigolka and asked if he was right in tying his long and thick hair at the same time. Elder Chivigolka watched the guy wield the ribbon in his hands, putting his hair in order and still tried to come to his senses and asked himself the question of whether this was an ordinary young man in front of him. The young man said that he came because he heard that this particular grandfather was Elder Chivigolka, and he asked that, judging by the appearance of the young man, he should turn to a doctor and not pester a beggar. Elder Chivigolka, seeing that in front of him was an ordinary guy, decided to test with his tongue whether the gold was real. The guy stretched out a smile on his face and replied that there was nothing to worry about because the blood on his clothes was not his. The elder, at the same time suspicious and dissatisfied, thought that this young man could not tell that he was bluffing and asked why the guy was looking for him. The guy smiled mysteriously and put his hand behind one part of his clothes, still looking at his grandfather. The young man said that he was going to turn to Elder Chivigolka with one request. Grandpa cleverly hid the gold in his clothes and said that if a guy is looking for a hitman, it's better for him to go to the black market. The guy got close enough to scare his grandfather and said that if he needs to kill someone, he doesn't have to resort to someone's help for this because he is sure that he moves and acts faster than any mercenary. After the words were spoken, the guy clarified that he saw his grandfather hide the ingot and the elder thought that the young man was also big-eyed. The old man was thinking about what to do and realized that most likely he would not be able to leave the guy so easily. The elder had already prepared his hand in which his strength was glowing in order to carry out the escape plan. Grandpa suggested that maybe he could quickly attack the guy and escape. But if the elder had the strength of a raccoon, then the guy had the strength of a tiger, and the young man, noticing the old man's hand with his strength, was ready to attack too. The elder had an uneasy feeling because not only he but also the guy had energy. The old man became excited and drops of sweat flowed down his face indicating that there would be no battle. The elder cast aside his disturbing thoughts, chalking it up to the fact that his joints had been hurting like this lately. Chivigolka reluctantly agreed with the guy and told him to explain what the request was. The young man, to celebrate, said that he wanted to create a new personality, that is, himself, but someone else. The elder lazily said that for such a guy it was not necessary to look for him, to which the young man said that with an ordinary fake personality it would be difficult to realize his plans so the guy wants to get a job as a mentor at a martial arts school. The elder objected indignantly that the guy was really asking him to betray the Murum Alliance and added that the young man's request was so impudent that the elder was speechless. The young man was surprised and explained that this was not betrayal, and he just wanted the elder to get him a recommendation and so that his origin would not be obvious. Namely, it would be better if the guy came from an existing clan and a neutral faction. The guy explained that the heavenly faction is too boring, and the evil faction is disgusting. In addition, the stranger asked that he be moderately good at martial arts because he did not want to look exceptional, but at the same time, so that he would not be ignored because of his skills. The young man quite clearly outlined the most important thing for him, which is why the grandfather was in a stupor, not knowing what else to expect from the guy. The guy insistently indicated that he must be 25 years old without fail and unconditionally. And since the guy repeated the word necessarily many times, the elder asked why he had to be exactly 25. 
The guy, knowing his whole plan, put his hand to his face and full of drama said that she was now 20, and since Grandpa didn't know what was in the young man's head, he didn't understand anything. And the young man, as if not noticing the presence of the old man, continued to explain in all colors that she was old-fashioned, and therefore the difference of one or two years would be too small, and even if he was 24, therefore it was too dangerous to take risks. The elder realized what was going on and he said in surprise, but with understanding that the bride was quite picky. The guy fell apart with sadness and said that his goal was to hear her call him big brother and that he would rather bite his tongue than allow himself to be called younger again. After all, the old man turned to the guy with the fact that he had one question and the guy asked what it was. The elder inquired that the guy seemed to know his future wife well, so why should he create a new identity and increase his status and get to know her again? The guy answered quite seriously that the girl didn't know him yet, and the old man again asked if the young man really didn't know this woman. The guy looked carefully at the old man and put his hand under his clothes as if he wanted to get something out of there again. The bowl rattled and swayed from the weight after two gold bars fell into it. Two gold bars were in excellent condition for the old man to not know anything else, and the guy repeated that the person he wants is 25 years old and a martial arts instructor. And while the elder was trying to wake up from the fact that he now had three gold bars, the guy was already leaving and finally said that the old man should try to do everything as quickly as possible and let him know how everything would be ready. Elder Chwigolka shouted to the guy to stop and asked what would happen if he just left with the bullion and did nothing. The guy didn't even turn around but confidently asked the old man if he really thought that this was a problem. The elder realized that the guy was not to be trifled with and asked what his name was because he had to know the name in order to create a new identity for him. The young man was pleased with the work done and the fact that his plan of action was slowly being implemented. The hitherto mysterious young man turned around and said his full name, Cho Un Hui, and added that he was a warrior of marriageable age. In the room, the conversation continued between the head of Song and Master Ma, and Song expressed his thoughts that the guy is still capable because the elder guaranteed it and he's not mistaken. Song also said that demonic martial arts are of course good, but since the guy still got a job as a mentor, teaching skills are more important. The head and master knew that among masters with outstanding abilities, in addition to developing skills, teaching is often considered a more difficult matter. The head made a comparison of his thoughts with lions in the wild, where there are lions who set an example for the younger generation, and there are those who lazily lie on a stone and just watch. Chapter Dream continued that in any case, if a guy encounters a difficult student, sooner or later his potential will be revealed and they will find out what is so special about him. Both masters understood which student they were talking about and all they could do was wait. Five years ago, on that same moonlit night, something happened in the Namgung family palace. Father and sons walked under the moonlight from one part of the palace to another. The father and his rather young son, Namgung Yunho, stopped because they noticed a bright light from the side. The radiance emanated from the old man and his sword which trailed a trail of blue flame after every movement, and Yun Ho recognized him as his grandfather. It was not for nothing that Nam Gung Yun Ho's grandfather, who was called the Silk Tiger Sword Sin Gong, appeared that day. Sin Gong, having realized enlightenment, abandoned his ignorance and was able to reach the highest peak of his level in swordsmanship. Nam Gung Yun Ho accidentally witnessed the scene and could not take his eyes off the sword fighting dance. The young man forever imprinted this moment in his memory, and it was he who began to guide him through life. As always, life was in full swing at Dongchun School, and the beautiful weather was pleasing to the eye. Yun Ho stood in the middle of the field with one hand on a wooden fighting instrument and silently looked ahead. The ghost's attention was caught by the good morning greeting from Cho Wun, and he already grabbed the katana for protection. Cho Wun stretched well and yawned sweetly, after which he asked Yun whether he slept well that night. Yun Ho looked at the guy indifferently, but he was surprised that Cho still did not give up. Nam Gung turned around and began to leave, but Cho, with a smile on his face, said after him that the fighter can leave if he wants, because it doesn't matter because the guy will come one way or another tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Yun Ho stopped but remained silent, and Cho continued to speak as if provoking that the fighter really thinks that if not here, then he can hide from him somewhere else and train. Cho's plan worked and Yun reacted to his mentor's words, but Nam Gung was really angry. Although the ghost was unaccustomed to people, he did not lose his boundaries and asked the mentor why he was doing this to him. While Yun was already holding on to the katana with all his strength that the veins on his hand were already popping out, Cho simply stood there as always and smiled, answering that he didn't know why he was doing this. And again, provoking Yun, the mentor, smiling, 
asked if Namgung was going to hit him. Yun stared at the mentor and had an internal conversation with himself about what he knew about the opinions of others, that he was crazy, but how crazy you need to be to hit the mentor. And Cho reminded the fighter that he really decided that the guy would leave him behind if there was no money. Yun continued to watch the guy and realized that he didn't like him because, for a mentor, he was not only young, but also terribly arrogant. Namgung continued to think in his head, relying on rumors that the new guy was just an arrogant warrior without any special abilities and also paid to get here. And the most crazy question about Cho being a sodomite, according to the rumors of others, was asked directly by Namgung, to which Cho vividly responded and said that this was not the case at all. Here Yun Ho turned on the provocation and said that now he understood why Cho was pursuing him, which made the mentor already angry as a beast. And the last cry of the guy that he said that it wasn't so loud was so loud that the birds sitting in the trees flew into the sky. Mentor Cho persistently came to Namgung's training sessions and sat watching the fighter on the bench. Yun Ho in turn was not going to miss a day of his training and now he was still getting ready for work. Namgung was sorry that the uninvited guest showed up again, but the fighter decided for himself that he had no right to rest. Yun raised his weapon and prepared himself by taking a deep breath and exhaling, fully concentrating on the task at hand. The fighter began training by waving his weapon, and Cho still sat behind him and watched. The next day, both the student and the mentor appeared on the training field. Only one was waving a weapon and the other was sitting on a bench and yawned sweetly. And on the next rather rainy day, the fighter still came to the field to train, walking through puddles. Cho was also on the field and happily greeted Namgung by waving to him while standing under an umbrella. And in the dead of night, when the moon was shining, Yun Ho was training, and Cho was sitting on the bench, almost falling asleep. Even a day later, Namgung was still training, and Cho was lazily lying on the bench eating something. But he asked if the fighter was hungry. But five days later, during the next training session, Yun Ho lost his grip and fell, unable to keep his balance. Before his gaze was a clear sky and a scorching sun, and leaves were falling from the trees. Yun lay exhausted on the grass and was dripping with sweat, but he was more tired of the fact that he couldn't do what he wanted. Mentor Cho approached the fighter and told Yun to stop using the three-edged sword method. Nam Nu turned over on his back and explained that it was important to complete this technique, because how could he practice sword ascension if he could not perfectly complete the three-pronged sword method? Mentor Cho suggested an alternative by asking what about the Namgung family's techniques. Yun Ho asked a rhetorical question. Is the guy really suggesting that he practice family techniques in front of a stranger? Cho Un answered quite logically that it doesn't have to be some kind of secret technique and gave an example of how at school quite a lot of people know the basic sword techniques of the Namgung family, one of which is the refreshing wind technique. Powerless Yun barely rose to his feet and decided to demonstrate the refreshing wind technique having already tried so many times and become disappointed. Cho folded his hands and stood watching the fighter, while Yun Ho prepared himself holding the katana in front of him. Yun Ho performs the technique as easily as it corresponds to the name of the method. The fighter was shocked by what he had just done, because before that there were only failures and falls. Nam Gung felt that just now he was unable to even stand, but now everything was different. Yun Ho felt that it became easy for him to control his breathing, and he continued his training while Cho continued to silently watch. Mentor Hui was pleased with the result because right here and now, before his eyes, a person is being reborn again. Namgung stopped and asked the guy how he understood what exactly needed to be done. Mentor Cho came quite close to Yun and pointed his finger at him and declared that he knew the reason why he could not continue to practice fencing. Yun looked at Cho's finger and thought that this mentor would now tell him yet another nonsense that he had already heard many times. The new mentor saw the fighter's dissatisfied reaction and said that he really knew the reason why he couldn't continue fencing. Namgung removed the mentor's finger from his shoulder and said that he understood the difference between the teacher and other Keraltans who were trying to profit from the student. At least none of them had watched him for so long. And before he could say anything, Cho interrupted the student. Mentor Cho directly asked the fighter if things weren't different from the very beginning. The teacher's words that most likely at some point the sword skills suddenly changed to such an extent that the fighter was confused, touched Namgung to the quick. For the first time, Yun did not hide his sincere surprise that the teacher had learned such information from somewhere, even though they were complete strangers. Cho noticed that his voice suspicions left a mark on Yun's face and said that it was quite strange, but he seemed to feel that something was wrong. For the first time in such a long time, Namgung Yun Ho, with more animated features, asked his mentor what he wanted to say. Mentor Cho pointed out the way the student was trained 
and that was where one of the problems lay. Cho continued to explain that the whole point is that the way of training is wrong, and that's all he added, that the problem is in the fighter's head and not in the body. Yun asked if the mentor wanted to say that the fighter was not cursed and everything was fine with his body, to which Cho Un asked what kind of curse it was, but did not wait for an answer and suggested that perhaps it was really a curse of some kind. Nam Gong puzzled, asked what this meant, and asked the mentor to explain his statement. Instead of verbal explanations, Cho walked up to the tree and plucked a large branch from it. The guy, in complete silence, removed all the twigs and leaves from the branch so that it became an ordinary stick. And as always, in his comic form, holding a stick in front of him, Cho asked if this kid had become interested and become kinder. The thin part of the placa, like the tip of a weapon, was on Yoon's forehead, and he asked what the mentor was planning. Smiling like a contented child, the guy replied that he had planned exactly what the fighter had thought. Nam Gung nevertheless asked for clarification whether the mentor wanted to fight with him, to which he heard that a warrior can only learn by meeting face to face with the enemy's sword. Cho Un immediately performed a jump from the ground, thinking to himself that they would see if the guy was right when they tested it in practice. The mentor continued his thought out loud in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, raising the stick above himself to strike. Yun immediately realized that this was a technique for openly combining energy, being quite educated in this matter. The fighter, having attempted to defend against the blow with the help of his weapon, then remembered that this was a simple, direct attack that concentrated energy passing from the top of the head to the heart. Yun stretched out his arms in front of him and put his training weapon under attack, realizing that it was just a branch. But at that moment, Namgun caught himself that somewhere inside, he felt an eerie feeling of fear, and the stick was no longer tiny, but with such a charge of power, like a tree trunk. Being under such a state of a certain numbness, the fighter kept a defense in front of him, but his confidence became significantly less. Suddenly, instead of hitting directly, the stick hit where the water bottle was hanging, and Yun realized that the mentor was quite fast because the fighter couldn't even keep up with him. Yun was frightened by the most terrible thoughts about how he could be so helpless because these thoughts are self-destructive. Cho stood in front of the loser just as lightly and with a smile and asked if the fighter had really expected such a turn. After such a long time, life was seething in Yun's body and he asked the mentor to repeat the techniques again. Mentor Cho, of course, agreed to repeat it, being no less excited that he had succeeded. Shui again used the same technique and the technique of blowing wind from all directions, and Yun realized that he knew all these techniques, but for some reason, he still could not dodge any of them. As a result, the water bottle gave up faster than its owner and fell to the ground, breaking off the cord. A joyful Cho at the end of the training told Nam Gung that this was his limit. The mentor explained to the student that he must monitor the grip of the sword and regulate the speed of the wrist strike because the situation can change depending on how the fighter manages his power, and Yun's problem is that he does not understand how his opponent thinks. Nam Gung thought that he tried so hard, and that's why it was hard for him to believe that he could never defeat this young mentor. The fighter's hands were red from diligence, and he let his training weapon fall to the ground as if he had given up. The wooden sword fell to the ground, never before being such a heavy burden for a fighter. Mentor Cho laughed so loudly and fervently and asked if Yun agreed that he was a genius and rushed to hug the fighter, shouting to him that he was crazy. All Yun could answer was why the teacher was doing this. Hui did not understand the question but only answered that it was great and added that he really knew so the fighter would no longer have to suffer. Nam Gung, embarrassed, pushed the teacher away and told him to let him go, which made Hui laugh even more. Yun said that no matter what the mentor's method is, he doesn't want to be a homosexual which is why Cho Un went wild again, repeating that he is not interested in men. The mentor noticed something on the student's face that was very surprising and difficult to believe. Cho amusingly leaned towards Yun's face, which was covered with his hand, and asked if the fighter was crying. To which, of course, Nam Gung replied that his eyes were sweating, and Cho jokingly began to tease the student that he was still crying, and Yun repeated that his eyes were sweating, to which the mentor asked if he was crying because he lost which was already starting to infuriate him. The conversation between teacher and student continued, and Yun asked if the mentor meant that ordinary people accept the technique as it is, to which teacher Cho answered in the affirmative to the question of the fighter who became more active not only physically, but also mentally. Nam Gung continued to learn that if they hit the head, then you need to block the head, and if they aim at the legs, then you just need to block the blow or move to avoid an attack on the legs, to which mentor Cho asked if this was so. 
Yun Ho cited the words of his grandfather as an argument that wielding a sword is a game of reading an opponent, and after that the fighter clarified with Cho, after all you can only block what you can see and feel, and the teacher replied that it's the same with others. Yun asked that people are not stupid, and how can everything be so simple? To which Cho Un, dissatisfied with the answer, asked the student about what he said about simplicity. The mentor cited Confucius as an argument, who said that if you just look and think you won't achieve anything, but you have to endlessly think and search. After an example of wisdom, Cho pointed out to Yun that this is the whole problem, because looking at your opponent's technique, you need to predict his next move and the next one with an accuracy of several moves ahead. Namgung absorbed it all like a sponge and gradually began to understand that this meant not just thinking quickly and doing quick calculations in his head. It dawned on Yun that this was a kind of foreseeing the future, and he seemed to feel it with all his being. It would be a blessing if Yun had the ability to be able to predict an opponent's techniques ahead of him, which would help defeat not a stronger opponent but an entire army. But his curse was the enlightenment gained with an unprepared body. Cho sternly addressed the fighter with the words that it is usually not so easy to parry the blow of a sword when it hits the target and a person is afraid of dying, so why not stop the sword right now, not counting five steps ahead and accept it as it is? Considering Yun's long pause in communicating with people and generally leading a hermit's lifestyle, there was a lot of information at one time. Hui warned Namgung that there were some things to pay attention to before he started training. The mentor showed three fingers and said that from now on, Yun just needs to remember three things. Yun Ho, not believing what was happening to him, asked his mentor again if he would really help the fighter become a better fighter. Cho was already irritated by the passivity and murder of his student, and he asked if he had lived only in deception all his life. Nam Gung admitted that he really was deceived by a low-grade master, and also bought into the sweet lie of another charlatan that his illness could be cured. The fighter was most ashamed for the fact that he even went to shamanic rituals, but the answer was on the surface. Cho Un did not cry like a fighter tired from walking in a circle for so long. But when Yun began to speak, the wind blew and the mentor's eyes began to water as if he was crying too. The mentor was determined and told the fighter to forget about everything he said and knew, but just need to remember three things, the first of which is to change the old-fashioned manner of speaking. Yun said that Cho himself spoke like an old man and thought that he would be older than the mentor, but Hui asked how old the student was. Namgung Yun Ho replied that he was 21 years old, and this was the reason for the mentor's further actions. Mentor Cho, with the words get it, hit the student on the head with the same stick that he took from the tree. While Yun was rubbing his head in the place where the blow landed, Mentor Cho angrily replied that he was 25 years old. Namgung began to say that, be that as it may, you can't tell from the teacher what to him, but he didn't have time to finish and the stick flew to exactly the same place a second time, and the teacher said the second rule is never to doubt his words. The third rule was to only call Cho a mentor or an older brother. Yun decided to ask since when the mentor and the elder brother are considered something equivalent, and did it in vain. Mentor Cho mentioned the second rule of not doubting his words, and to reinforce it, he hit the student twice instead of once. The teacher said that now that Yun had understood these three sacred truths, it was time to get to work because they had little time left. After 15 days in Dongcheon, everything was ready for the competition. The students stood serious and ready to be selected for the monthly competitions. Head Jong sat in front of the lined-up students looking at all these young faces. A nasty-toed Yom stood next to his head, and Jong told the mentor that he saw how all the students had a sparkle in their eyes, and Yom replied that they still carefully taught all these kids. Head Jong was pleased with both what he saw and what he heard, and approving of the overall picture, he said that it was time to start. In front of the students in gray clothes, Mentor Yom in a white robe stood and loudly proclaimed that it was time to start the exam. The nasty toad turned to Saigon, who broke down and became closer to his mentor. Yom announced that since Saigon is the best of the students, he will be the one who will start the big exam. And the student bowed and thanked him. Mentor Yom loudly voiced whether there were any students who were ready to go against Saigon in this exam. Behind Yom, the voice of a wisher was heard, and to everyone's surprise, it was the same ghost of Dong Cheon. Saigon was clearly nervous because Yom's plan to make him the best student was no longer in line with their agreement. Yom stood next to Namgung Yun Ho and did not notice who the student bowed in greeting. Raising his head, Yun turned to Mentor Cho, saying that he had come and he was ready, to which a voice that was already familiar to Yom sounded, and he nervously turned in his direction. Toad Yom cursed to himself about how this upstart Zhou and Hui could be here. 
Cho, not paying attention to Yom, approached the student and holding him by the shoulder, said that Yun had not taken part in the exam for a long time, so he instructed him to do his best. And while Cho continued to talk to Yun about how he regretted that he couldn't personally participate, Yom, behind their back, couldn't help but be in disbelief that Cho had found an approach to Namgung. Yun remembered that five years had passed since he took the exam and already thought in his head that it had taken him by surprise. But even so, no problems would arise. Yom looked at the ghost's back and remembered that when Namgung Yun Ho first came here as a student, the mentor thought that Yun would be his golden ticket, and Yun was a little hesitant and wondered whether he should really take part. Toad Yom was replaying in his head the story of how Yun's family abandoned him, and he didn't go to group training and stayed away from his mentors. And mentor Yom concluded that even if the guy has talent, it's insignificant and overall he's a spineless loser. Yom took this situation as another opportunity to kick Cho and Hui out of here, and he headed to the mentor and student. Yom came closer and called mentor Cho, and he turned around at the call, not at all expecting that it would be Yom. Toad, with his usual dissatisfied face, said that he didn't think Namgung Yun Ho deserved to be here. Cho asked if Yom meant disqualifying the student, to which the Toad replied that his skills could disqualify a warrior, as if he wanted to knock the ground out from under his feet. And now Yom, instead of mentor Hui, turns to the ghost with the question of whether he is wrong and added what the student Namgung himself thinks about this. Yun silently accepted the poison that this toad was spitting and at the moment it was the best decision. Yom was pleased with his dirty tongue and concluded that Yun still couldn't say a word against him and decided for himself that if everything went well, he would show these two their place. Mentor Yom came up and put his heavy hand on Yun's shoulder, clearly not out of friendly intentions, and then said that if he wanted, Yom would take him as his student and teach him everything. Yom continued to poison with words and said that he knows that Yun is in a hurry, but with martial arts he doesn't work like that, no matter how much and how much he studies, and throwing in another seed that a strong rush could turn out to be poison, this already hurt Cho. Namgung, after listening to everything that this nasty toad Yom said, asked what the mentor meant by all the words. Yom explained that he wanted to tell the student not to overdo it today if he didn't want to end up in an awkward position. Namgung once again encountered a hidden threat in his direction and became thoughtful. Mentor Cho always told the truth directly, and now he said after Yom, who was leaving, that if he cared, he should have paid attention to the student earlier and asked why Yom didn't abandon one of his charges like that. Yom stopped and turned dissatisfied to Cho, ready to tell him everything he thought about him. But holding himself back through gritted teeth, Yom said, Does the guy have any idea how busy the mentor is now? After all, he only has enough time to train special talents. We realized that now it was his move and, agreeing with Yom's words, the guy smiled to say something equally poisonous. Cho looked carefully at Yom and asked what it was that Namgung Yun Ho, mentor Yom, considered an insignificant talent. Yom turned purple and immediately turned away, saying that he didn't mean it at all. But the crowd behind heard what they heard. Mentor Cho turned to student Yun and, as if stirring up interest, asked what he would do now, because Namgung was considered not very important, and Yun realized for himself that Cho was no worse in saying caustic words for Yom. Disciple Namgung Yun Ho remained silent, thinking it over after all, a really long time had passed. And raising his head, Yun said with confidence that he would take part in the competition. The poisonous toad Yom became so angry that the veins appeared on his forehead. Head Zhang, still waiting as if sensing something, asked Teacher Yom what had happened. Yom got nervous but turned to the head and tried to evade it by saying that this was not a matter that Jun should pay attention to. The head showing a hand gesture for everyone to speed up, ordered in this case to hurry up. Chief Zhang's words only made Yom even more worried about the change in his ideal plan. There was talk among the students about whether Namgung Yun Ho would really take part because a lot of time had passed since he could not use a sword. It was a shame for both the students and mentors. They did not understand what the new guy was thinking about, and only Yomei stood and looked at all this without condemnation. Yomei turned to one of the mentors and said that they still don't know whether Namgun can win, to which the most indignant mentor replied that Yomei seems to know nothing but Namgun Yunho is a loser who disgraces his family. Mentor Yomei and the mentor looked at Cho and Yun and the mentor asked the girl that she didn't understand what this meant because even if the ghost wins, it's not good because the person who was abandoned by everyone and decided to stand out now is just an annoying hindrance. Yomei couldn't even put in five cents as the mentor continued to say incessantly that Yun's younger brother was now serving at the imperial court 
and in this case, would anyone allow the forgotten older brother to be remembered? The mentor said that this was news that the Nam Gung family would never be happy with, and Yo Mei looked at Yun with annoyance. The most key word here is forgotten, because his existence was denied by both his family and the whole world, and this word refers to Nam Gung Yun Ho. The problem is that Yun Ho himself also knew about this like no one else, and nevertheless decided to speak out. There was no time to delay the competition and both masters and their students were tuning in for the event. Mentor Cho called his student Nam Gung Yun Ho to say something important, and the master pointed to the competition area as if inviting the student and told him to have fun. Mentor Yom called his student Sagon to him, clearly not in the mood for a fair fight. Bearing his insidious smile, Yom came close to Sagon and told him something good in his ear so that the student could properly concentrate on this battle. Namely, he asked the question of what Sagon thinks, why they began to treat Yun as a ghost. Sagon began to think out loud that this was a lack of abilities and pulled himself away from this thought. Mentor Yom supported the student that he was right, and the ghost really did not become like this because of a lack of abilities. Yom, wrapping everything up, told Sagon that he had received a request from the Nam Gung family, namely that they want everyone to forget about their son, Yun Ho. The mentor continued that since the Nam Gung family asked, isn't it the duty of the Murim warrior to keep his promise? Sagan supported his mentor's insidious plan, saying that Yom was absolutely right. All students who took part in the competition were instructed to take positions. Sagan and Yun Ho entered the field, and Yom stood between them and voiced that everyone has their own achievements. They are different, so you need to be impartial and added to use only the power of your sword, and in this way, they will judge them. Sagan stood with his eyes closed and prepared to fight, while mentor Yom continued to voice the conditions that students would be disqualified if they used prohibited techniques. Yun Ho, in turn, stood in front of Sagan and watched him, and Yom added that killing is prohibited. Master Yom made a hand gesture to start the fight and wished the students good luck. Sagan readied his sword, raising his hand in front of him, which Yun had already noticed. Disciple Sagan put his training weapon fully in front of him, looking carefully at his opponent. Sagan voiced to himself that he would win with the first blow, because he was not determined to fight, but to do what Yom ordered him to do. And so Sagan makes acceleration and the first kicks from the ground, heading towards his opponent. Yun Ho remained standing and watching Sagan attack, and instead of his body, he prepared himself mentally. Nam Gung recalled training with a mentor who explained that when you learn to wield a sword, don't look further than one step ahead. Yun Ho asked if it was not necessary to think through the opponent's movements in two or three steps. Cho replied that first one needs to predict only the next attack and consciously refrain from predicting the enemy's actions. Nam Gung, acting completely differently all this time, asked the mentor if it was normal to calculate only one action in advance. Cho took advantage of the opportunity that the student had forgotten the rule and already raised a stick over Yun's head, asking if he had forgotten his instructions, to which Ho immediately put up a defense and the rule of not doubting the words of the mentor bounced off the teeth. Mentor Huai was pleased that the student remembered everything correctly and told Yun to hold on until he understood what the next attack would be. They continued their training and Hui reminded the student to focus on the sword. And so Nam Gung looks at Sagan running towards him and realized that he sees the attack that the opponent wants to use. Without making much effort, Yun Ho simply smoothly moves to the side and Sagan's blow goes wide. Sagan makes another attempt to attack from Nam Gung, spending quite a lot of energy on this. And here is another attempt by Sagan to strike the ghost, and this time the attack came from above and with both hands. Nam Gung Yun Ho, unexpectedly for everyone, was able to brilliantly rebuff Sagan by putting himself on defense. Both rivals froze, and Sagan also did not expect that the one who had been ownerless for quite a long time would be able to fight back. Sagan had never heard of such abilities from anyone in Dongchun, and Yun Ho was glad that right now he knew how to resist a sword and what it felt like. For Nam Gung, understanding the principle added strength and greatly motivated her to continue. The living force began to churn in the body of the ghost, and this time it was he who made the pushes from the ground for a run. After such a long time, Yun Ho smiled again and ran contentedly towards his opponent, as if not for an attack, but for a friendly greeting. And so Nam Gung makes a powerful jump, swinging his sword over his head, but Sagan puts up a defense in front of himself. Yun Ho deliberately sent the blow past his opponent, and there was a very small distance between them. The ghost caught himself thinking that he couldn't allow what he really wanted to do. After all, if Yun had made that blow, the competition would have ended too quickly. 
But Nam Gung realized that he couldn't just end such an exciting moment after much suffering. The battle dance became more and more dizzying, and if Yun did not make much effort and move smoothly, then Sagan, with rather typical and wooden movements, had every chance of getting exhausted quite quickly. Nam Gung was overjoyed that he could afford such luxury and thought about how it could be so different. In parallel with the battle, Yun recalled their conversation with the teacher and how Cho asked that Nam Gung had to go through something before he could look a few steps ahead. Wai also added that Yun could not suddenly gain the ability of foresight without having the necessary skills, after which Nam Gung clarified what the teacher meant and Cho explained that it must be something very strong and memorable. Mentor Cho tied his hair with a red ribbon as always, and he asked Yun if anything came to the student's mind. Yun Ho, looking at the curly ribbon, realized that if it was something strong and memorable, then he understood what it was. The student shared with the teacher that several years ago, Yun saw his grandfather dance with his sword. Yun Ho explained that suddenly his grandfather had an epiphany and he danced with the sword alone. Cho, analyzing, realized that if grandfather Yun Ho, then it must be Shin Gong who is called the Silk Tiger Sword, and the dance with the sword that he performed at the moment of enlightenment must have been very exciting. And so we realized that this dance simply could not help but be imprinted in Yun's consciousness, and Cho asked if the student was shocked by this dance on a moonlit night, to which Ho said that he was not that shocked. Cho Wen saw Yun's prevarication and began to explain that the student's problem was that since he suddenly saw a huge mountain, he stopped seeing the stone under his feet. Cho also gave an example of how if you look at the sun and then look at a candle flame, it won't seem bright. Nam Gung recalled that both his father and younger brother saw the sword dance, and he wondered why only he was so captivated by it. Mentor Cho, sitting down on the bench, told the student that this was obvious and all because those two were less talented than Yun. Yun had the epiphany that it turns out that what he considered his curse was, on the contrary, his gift. Nam Gung timidly stood in front of the teacher and bleated to him about how he could be more capable than his father and brother. Cho was annoyed by the fighter's uncertainty, and he shouted at him that if the teacher tells him something, it means it is so. And if the teacher says to do something, then Yun must do it. Nam Gung realized that there was no other way, and answered the teacher that he would try, to which Hui shouted that Yun didn't need to try, but just needed to do what was said. The last words of the teacher who caught up with Yun during the battle or that his body has great potential and you shouldn't get too hung up on the movement of the sword. No matter the training or battle, it was worth remembering that on the blade lies the abyss between life and death. And even if you lose in a battle, there are times when you can win if you fight to the death. Yun came to the realization that he would not die if he continued to move, and this thought was large scale. Sagan was angry and at the same time scared because he could not understand what to expect from a seemingly frail opponent. Nam Gung struck, but Sagan's defense was rather weak and uncertain. Sagan stood in a completely wrong stance, and one could see in his eyes that this was not at all what he and Yom expected. Yun was analyzing all the time, and now he realized that Sagan was moving too awkwardly and decided to try to compare his opponent with his mentor's sword. Moments of training with his mentor appeared before Nam Gung's eyes, and the student realized that Cho was faster and brighter. Yun dealt blow after blow following all the techniques and movements that were in training. While delivering his blows, Yun still tried to understand how his teacher moved, but all the comparisons were not the same. Now Nam Gung again saw Cho's movements before his eyes, and he realized that the teacher was as fast as lightning. And in parallel with the lightning speed, the student noted for himself that the teacher was strong as a storm. While Nam Gung's strength only increased, Sagan's strength decreased with each blow. Yun also remembered that Cho was like a whirlwind, but at the same time, he moved quietly like the spring wind. Sagan held on with all his strength, but did not at all expect what happened. Nam Gung looked at Sagan screaming and tired and how he, like a wounded beast in agony, was trying to strike. Disciple Yun realized that now was the right moment to finish. Taking the best of his training, Yun realized exactly how he should finish the fight. Nam Gung Yun Ho realized that if there had been a mentor instead of him, he would have done exactly this and repeated exactly what the teacher did to him during training. This was the last blow of this battle and Sagan, coughing and breathing heavily, began to lose consciousness. While Nam Gung completed his blow, Sagan, already exhausted, fell to his knees. Mentor Yom and the others stood with their mouths open, not believing what they saw. The students, no less shocked, began to whisper whether this fighter was really called the Ghost of Dong Cheon and that all this time he had been hiding such abilities. Yom had veins appearing on his face from excitement and his teeth were grinding. 
and in his head he was cursing terribly about the fact that he had failed to carry out his insidious plan. Mentor Hui stood happy and peaceful and understood that this was the end. In front of that very ghost of Dongchun, whom absolutely everyone doubted, what seemed to be the best student Sagon lay unconscious. As at the beginning of the battle, Mentor Yom stood between Sagon and Namgung, only now with a completely different expression on his face. The students silently watched what would happen, having been initially set up by Yom, both against Cho and Namgung. With the same thoughts, the mentors froze, waiting for the words of Mentor Yom. Namgung Yunho stood absolutely calm and only wiped the sweat that was rolling from his face with his hand, and poor Yom hesitantly announced the winner. Mentor Cho, approaching his student, asked what his feelings and impressions of the victory were. Yun Ho was ready to answer something like, okay, but he stopped because the feelings were mixed. Yun looked at his hands, which were red and calloused, and thought that he didn't really understand his feelings, as if it was all just a dream. Chui said that Nam Gung should just enjoy himself and forget about this feeling. And the student asked the teacher if he really wanted to say that Yun should forget about the feeling of victory. Mentor Cho Un, on the contrary, said that he was sure that from now on, Yun would often experience a feeling of victory. Nam Gung could not believe that he, who always suffered defeat and ran away in regret, would feel victory. And seeing this doubt on the student's face, Mentor Cho asked if he really disagreed. Large tears appeared in Yun's eyes, as if he had not cried for an eternity. And the lips of the mouth and chin clenched because just before the bitterest tears, a person's facial expressions change. When Yun finally realized that he had won and allowed this feeling within himself, he fell to his knees in front of the master, holding his sword. Tears rolled down Namgung's face in large hail, and he cried out in mental pain. Mentor Cho was surprised that the student was crying again, but did not force him to stop, but rather was simply there. Water poured from the fighter's eyes as if washing his wounded soul, and a scream frantically tore from his chest. Namgung Yun Ho cried like a beast until he cried out the remaining tangle of emotions from pain and resentment. Mentor Cho continued to stand next to the student and understood that this guy seemed to have a very difficult time. While Yun was coming to his senses, someone called Mentor Cho and asked him to give him some of his time. Hui saw that it was that same nasty and poisonous toad. Yom and the guy smiled and replied that of course he would take the time. Cho cheerfully hummed some melody to himself and followed Mentor Yom. The mentors came to one of the Dongxian buildings in which, naturally, at that moment, there was no one else except them. Mentor Yom let Cho go ahead and then went in himself and locked the door behind him, looking sternly at the guy. Barely holding himself together so as not to break down, Yom asked what Cho was thinking and what he was doing. Mentor Cho, although he perfectly understood what this toad meant, but fell for a fool and said that he did not understand what Mentor Yom was talking about and what he was trying to tell Cho. Mentor Yom turned into a red bloated ball, holding his hand in front of him and muttering through his teeth that he meant that kid Namgoon. Yom exhaled and curbed himself, and then told Cho to give him Yunho for good, to which the new mentor quite logically asked the question, why Yom talks about the student as if he were some kind of thing. Yom dismissed the fact that Yun wasn't initially under his leadership, and the mentor was simply busy with other work, so there was no time to properly deal with the guy. The nasty swan toad threw Cho something like gratitude that the new guy taught him this time, and casually added that the guy did a good job. But Hui replied that he didn't teach Yun Ho to receive compliments. Also, Cho Un Hui said that teaching martial arts to Dong Cheon students is the job of a mentor, which made Yom furious and muttered that he was just going to talk to the guy. Yom no longer tried to calm down, and if earlier he had spat behind Cho's back, now he did it right in front of him, showing his disrespect in his face. Crackling his fist, this toad said that in fact he did not like Cho from the very first day he appeared here. Mentor Cho, even here, could not do without a sense of humor and giggling, asked Yom why he brought him to such a creepy place. Yom replied that it was so, and now they could talk directly, and flexing his fists, told the guy that there was no better way to communicate than this. Joan smiled and told Yom that this was the nicest thing he had ever heard from him. Yom was suddenly puzzled not only by Cho's strange answer, but also by the appearance he had acquired. To be sure, Cho repeated to poor Yom that such a conversation with fists is just Hawaii's thing. The unfortunate toad still didn't understand who he was dealing with, and raising his hand at Cho said that the guy had really gone crazy. Cho grabs Yom's hand on the fly, just as he once grabbed the hand of the man holding him by the hair. Cho twisted the toad's hand behind his back and said that the caterpillar should eat pine needles and by analogy, asked Yom why the new mentor continues to feel hungry when he tries to eat at least something. But you can't say that from Yom. Mentor Cho hit Yom on the inside of his knee, saying that his eye level was too high. 
Yom was already on his knees, screaming and sniffling in pain while Hui simply held his hand by the little finger. Due to the fact that the toad was too loud, Cho asked him to be quieter, and with one clear blow to the neck, he deprived the poor fellow of his voice. Gloating, Cho said that, now that they seem to be on approximately the same level, they can talk and ask Yom that this is the very method of communication that he was talking about. His strength awakened in Cho so much that the ribbon broke from his hair, which was also torn to freedom, and Cho asked Yom if he liked what was happening, but Mentor Yom, unfortunately, could not even make a sound, let alone words. Mentor Cho, although he possessed colossal power, was still a man and, turning to Yom, he cautioned that he would sort out his affairs himself, so Yom needn't worry. Mentor Yom realized that he not only lost his voice, but also could not use his power to do anything. Cho, as always, jokingly lowered himself to Yom's head and said that it was really good here, and added that most likely no one would hear, even if Yom died here. Teacher Cho noticed that Yom seemed to prefer this kind of talk. And being very close to Yom's head, Mentor Cho smiled like crazy and asked if they could talk like this more often. Having shown Yom his amethyst eyes shining with energy, Mentor Cho asked what Yom would say about such conversations. It was as if Mentor Yom looked into the eyes of death itself, felt a real threat and realized that there were chances that he could really die. Hui, holding Yom by the scruff of the neck like a kitten, looked him carefully in the eyes and called him by name. And then Cho continued that if the toad wants, then let him continue to show his character, from which Yom turned away. But the guy warned that with such success, it will be clear which of them will regret in the future. They knocked on the door and called one and the other mentor and asked if everything was okay. By Cho's voice, he realized that it was Yomei and looked out from behind the door, asking how she knew that Cho was here. And the girl asked again if everything was okay and asked why his hair was down. Yomei said that she saw how the mentors walked here together and added that it is not easy to move unnoticed when being a poisonous toad. To which Cho asked in surprise what kind of toad and felt that there was really no ribbon. Mentor Yo explained that among mentors, Toad is the nickname of Teacher Yom when he is very angry and quietly added that if he hears this, there will be problems, to which Cho asked to stop talking about toads and better go to the cafeteria. Teacher Yom was trembling and remained sitting outside the door on the floor, gradually coming to his senses. Yom heard Mentor Yomei talk about the fact that he was a toad among others and couldn't believe it, which made him feel offended. In the main building of Dongqion, there was a dialogue between Chief Jun and Mentor Cho, and the chief asked if the guy repented that it was a little cruel. Mentor Cho asked what the head meant, and he explained that the guy has one student and he receives a salary from the Murim Alliance. Cho rubbed his nose out of pride and said that this student won the exam, which the head himself saw. Head Zhong showed his fingers and said three, and Cho asked what the head meant. Jun said that in addition to the excellent Nam Gung, the guy must take responsibility for three more people, because there is a rule that a mentor in Dong Qion must be responsible for at least three students, to which Cho objected where there is such a rule. Head Zhong threw a notebook with words to Hui so that he could carefully read the manuscripts. Mentor Cho flipped through the notebook to the right moment and was extremely dissatisfied with the fact that he found such a rule. Cho launched a cunning like a spear about the fact that he was a new mentor and wouldn't it be too much to entrust him with training three people at once. Like a shield, Head Zhong put forward the argument that usually a mentor supervises about a dozen students. And now the spear of cunning breaks against the shield of the law and Jun voiced the Fox Cho, which gives him a month to take custody of three students and added that Dong Cheon does not need a mentor who cannot fulfill his minimum duties. Head Zhong, in order to finally finish off the enemy, so to speak, in his arguments, said that among the new mentors, there are those who are responsible for 30 students. The training field looked very structured from a bird's eye view. Just at this moment, the students were training on the field, all as if for selection. As one, they performed the movements. Teacher Yo Mei stood in front of the students and observed the correct execution of the techniques. Mentor Cho clearly did not suspect that in the person of the new mentor, who was responsible for 30 students, a girl. Yo Mei, in turn, indifferently replied that she was already tired of this, so she was no longer going to take on any responsibility. Mentor Cho jokingly replied that the girl was very perceptive and explained that he had just returned from the head and he was ordered to take charge of at least three more students. Yomei asked what about her students and Cho, unable to resist a joke, asked if it was a test and added that if Yomei is a good friend, she might share one. Mentor Yo said irritably that Hui was acting ridiculous again, but the guy was pleased. Master Cho, as if he wanted to be persuaded to look at the students, smiled and began to observe. 
If it weren't for their different statures and hairstyles, the young fighters moved almost identically to each other like one mechanism. Mentor Cho indicated to Yo Mei that capable students are always in sight, and Mentor Yo was proud of this because she had invested all her might in this teaching. Without thinking twice, Master Cho pointed his finger at the first student in the second row. The second student to fall under the mentor's hand was the fifth student in the third row, and the third choice of the teacher was the first student in the first row who stood out from the general background. Teacher Yo was amazed how Teacher Cho was able to choose students just by looking at them. Yomei was surprised for a reason because it took her a month of observation to notice anything. Mentor Hui explained to his colleague Yomei that even if the students perform the same movements, there is a slight difference that depends on the skills, and the students he has chosen have a more lively tip of the sword. This can be seen in the dance with weapons, and if some perform the dance like everyone else, that is, those who seem to be imbued with the dance. Teacher Yo pointed to one of the students and asked Teacher Hui what he thought about the dance technique. The mentor's hand pointed to the fighter who was performing the dance in an unusual way. Mentor Ho did not quite understand this rather strange dance in his opinion. At night, the sky was thickly strewn with stars and in some places, small clouds floated by like ships. Among the visitors to the dining room were mentors Yomei and Cho, who ate deliciously and had a conversation. The girl asked Cho if he didn't initially want to go to the soup kitchen, to which teacher Cho replied that he wouldn't want to eat food today, and Yo Mei joked that the guy came here because she would pay for the food today. Mentor Cho brushed it off, calling it nonsense that he was eating at Yo Mei's expense, but still asked why she suddenly decided to treat him to lunch, and Mei explained that she had a request to her mentor. But at the moment when Cho wanted to find out what the request was, with an apology for being late, teacher Mo came up with anticipation to tell what happened. Mo's interesting story began with the idea that as soon as you start leaving work, something inevitably happens. Mo sat down at the table and asked to bring her a drink, and Mentor Cho again reminded her of the incident that Mo's mentor wanted to tell. Mo admitted before telling everything that she was very ashamed of what happened. Savoring her drink, the mentor began with the fact that there was a fight, and if usually disputes happen between students, this time the student got into a fight with the mentor. While Mo refilled her cup with drink, Mentor Cho was surprised by what he heard, and having filled the cup almost to the brim, Mo explained that the worst thing was beating the mentor to such an extent that there was no living space left on him, and everything happened in front of other students. The teacher also mentioned, by the way, that an attack on a teacher entails immediate disciplinary punishment. But Cho did not hear the story to the end because he noticed that both sisters were already drunk. Mentor Hui could only watch the girls and he concluded that these two become more animated when they meet. Mo looked away from her conversation with her sister Mei and remembered that Cho did it after all. Mo suggested that everyone must have been surprised at how they were treated by a new mentor whose weight was ignored. Cho chewed and at the same time explained that because of this, the hassle had only increased because he now needed to take on more students. Mo still remained sure that everyone was upset because Cho rediscovered for everyone the talent of the one who was rejected, and Cho confirmed that everyone had a terrible look. Mentor Mo laughed loudly, raising the cup of drink and agreed with Cho that they were all terrible, but she knew that Cho Un would succeed. That evening, Mentor Cho also joined in the drinking. Both sisters painfully persuaded him. In the dorm where Cho was placed, the lights were still on in some rooms, and Mei and Cho's room was no exception. Mentor Hui was already slightly drunk, so he staggered and plopped down on the bed, exhaling heavily. Where there was a hole in the wall, there was a piece of fabric hanging, and Cho, lying on the bed, noticed its movement. Hui lifted the piece of paper and saw Mei's blushing face there, and the girl thanked her mentor for the time they spent together. Cho reciprocated and added that he also had fun and said that perhaps they would drink so often in the future. Mei remembered that she wanted to ask for a request, and Cho asked what it was. The girl asked if Cho could consult one of her students and give her some recommendations. Hui happily replied that today he drank and ate at the mentor's expense, so he agreed to help. The next morning, despite the evening drinking, mentor Cho and Mei were on the training field. Mei pointed to a student with braids who was dancing a ridiculous dance that Cho didn't like right away. Mei's mentor explained that at some point the student stopped training with everyone, and now she does these movements alone. Cho realized his mistake by making a promise in a drunken state while Mei had already ordered the students to get ready and warm up. Teacher Mei called each student by name, indicating what they should do, and Cho decided to try to leave quietly. Hui mentally asked Mei for forgiveness, because in the case of that student, nothing would help, and the guy realized how much he just wanted to run away this time. 
And then May grabs Hui's shoulder with her hand, pointing him again in the direction of the student, and the guy realized that the mentor is too attentive. Mentor Cho walked towards the student as if on a death sentence while she wiped her face after training. The student said Ryan Ryong, and immediately a servant appeared who put up a chair and opened an umbrella, and also took the training sword from the mistress. The servant gave the mistress cold water and asked if the mistress was tired because there was also honey water for that. Cho's desire to give recommendations at the sight of the maid decreased significantly, and he remembered that he had heard about people born with a golden spoon in their mouth and how they could not live without servants, but he did not expect to see it here. Mentor Hui thought as he came closer and was able to see the student's face, after which he realized that he felt as if he had already seen her somewhere. The maid, doing her job, immediately reacted to the rather short distance between Cho and the student. Covering her mistress with her whole body, the maid flew like an animal at Cho, asking if he had any business with her mistress. Cho calmly replied that he had nothing to do, but interrupting the mentor mid-sentence, the maid immediately bared her teeth and began bombarding him with questions from the family, whether he knew who his mistress was, and without waiting for an answer, she answered herself that it was the princess of the Pakri family. After Cho was threatened to adhere to etiquette, he couldn't even really answer anything but only turned around to leave. Hui shouted to Mei that he had done everything he could, but at the same moment the student herself, calling her servant, ordered her to leave. The maid, doing her job, warned the mistress that she could not talk to a lonely man like that, especially with such a dirty tramp. The last words about the tramp angered Cho, and the maid continued to explain something to her mistress. Ryong Ryong reminded the student that she is from the Pakri family and is the precious treasure of the family and that man is not the right person to deal with. But the student replied that everything is fine. The student folded her hands and turned to Cho and asked if he was the same person. A very sweet-looking girl said that she heard about Mentor Cho from Mentor Mei. The lady smiled and asked if Cho really should consult her. Mentor Hui looked at this young talent and wondered if he really should take care of this little one. History has it that swordmasters belonging to great families even stood at the head of the Marima Alliance for a time. After all, the martial arts of the Pakri family are unique, one of which is the White Dragon Sword. When the swordsmen of the Pakri family reach their epiphany, a white dragon can be seen dancing with the sword, demonstrating the illusion of a roar, which is why the great Pakri family is also called the White Sword Dragons. Nothing lasts forever, and therefore, at the moment when Monchon began their dominance, the Bakery family fell apart, and the head knelt down and crawled on the ground barking like a dog in order to save his life. Mentor Cho mentioned to the princess that she was good at the very beginning of her training and asked why she didn't study the school's techniques, and the princess, in turn, explained that since she was the treasure of the Pakri family, she was obliged to master a special martial art. The princess rather dismissed the fact that she didn't like the basic techniques that even dogs and cows could learn. Cho listened to the princess whose words were quite expected, and he understood that the only right decision would be to simply leave. The lady wanted to get closer to the point and called Ryan Ryong, who appeared nearby like lightning. Ryan understood her mistress without words and poured out various jewelry from the bag onto the table. Cho did not show any sign of looking at the jewelry, and the princess explained that if the mentor could help her master a new style of swordsmanship, and after the words you can take away everything in the bag, Cho's eyes sparkled. Hui looked at the pearls, stones, and gold that every now and then sparkled in the sun, and the princess continued that if something is needed for her training, the mentor can ask for it, and also listed the benefits of helping her in the form of fulfilling any whim, even up to a good personalized sword. The princess looked at Hui and asked after all that had been said, whether the mentor could help her. Mentor Cho immediately fell to his knees before the princess in admiration. Mentor Cho and the student moved to the training field in the school garden. Cho greeted the lady with folded hands as usual and bowed to her. The princess reminded the teacher, with particular importance, that she does not study martial arts for everyone, because in the Pakri family, she has access to special martial arts that are available only to her. Mentor Cho, remembering the bag of jewelry, nodded to the princess and replied that he understood everything. The lady continued that she has this access not only because she is the treasure of the family. The princess indicated that allowing her to study secret martial arts meant that she was a genius and that she was gorgeous and also strong and cool. And all the while, Ryan clapped for her mistress. Spinning like a flower in the wind, the lady asked what the mentor's special skill was since he undertook to teach her. Cho did not miss the opportunity to joke and pointing his finger at himself, questioningly said that it was his face which is why both ladies were in a stupor. Ryong and the princess began to look at Cho with interest, but even here he could not do without humor, 
So he warned the ladies not to look so closely because if they fall in love, problems will arise. For the lady, the teacher's answer that his special skill was his face sounded so strange that for a moment she was even speechless, but handing Mentor Cho a sword for training, the princess once again asked about Hui's abilities as a master. Mentor Cho Un took the training sword and answered the princess that he was good at using a sword and a knife. The treasure of the family Pakri clarified that the sword and knife are the specialty of the master. Cho and Hui slightly corrected the princess's judgment about his specialty and named the sword. Also, Master Hui was excellent with a knife and a spear and did not forget to mention the club. Mentor Cho, holding a training sword in his hands, imagined how he pulled the bowstring and said that he could also use a bow, adding to everything that he could perfectly use any weapon. The princess was irritated because she thought that the master was mocking her, explaining that it was difficult to ideally master even one weapon, and the master said that he specialized in all of them. Mentor Cho answered absolutely honestly that he was in no way lying, but the princess persisted and mentioned that Hui had recently lied about having a beautiful face. Cho raised his thick bangs and said that he was not lying, and the lady again seemed speechless. The young talent looked at her mentor as if spellbound, without making a sound or even moving. Only Ryan Ryong was able to return her mistress from heaven to earth, calling her as if reminding and warning who she was. The treasure blushed all over with embarrassment and, in an attempt to curb herself, became strict again and stubbornly stated that she could not believe that the master had mastered every weapon perfectly and then even threatened that if Cho did not help her, she would mercilessly fire him. Mentor Hui unquestioningly agreed with the lady, and he himself thought how picky this little employer is. Mentor Yomei approached Mentor Cho and indignantly asked what the master was even thinking about. Hui quite seriously replied that he was simply trying to guide a student who had lost his way. Yomei clarified that she meant the master's bow in front of the princess with cries of madam that she saw. Mentor Yo blushed, indicating that she was terribly ashamed of such an act by Master Cho, and this amused the guy. Mei was seriously angry at how Cho reacted to this even now, standing in front of her and laughing. Mentor Cho, not without a sense of humor in himself, continued smiling and said that this was such an incident that it would be impossible not to laugh at it. Putting jokes aside, Shui asked why such a respectable person ended up in this school. Mei explained that the Pakri are a big family and they have branches all over the continent and this is one of them in this area. Mentor Yo also added that the branch of the family is located in the endless city in Wuhan, where the school is located, and Pakri Sol is the only daughter in the family. Master Cho expressed his assumptions that the Pakri family probably made a lot of efforts to get an estate where there is the Marima Alliance and a new school, and Yomei confirmed the words of her colleague and clarified that Pakri Sol is a direct blood descendant. Mentor Cho additionally inquired whether it was true that the Pakri family were adherents of the heavenly faction. May answered in the affirmative and added that it was not surprising that the Pakri Sword family supported the celestial faction. Mentor Cho gained enough important and valuable information for himself that can also be no worse than a weapon. The guy smiled in anticipation of interesting training with the nobleman Saul and realized that time would tell how everything would turn out. The day was beautiful thanks to the clear and warm weather and the trees were basking in the sun. In the garden on the training field, Princess Sol was dancing and Hui was sitting on a bench and watching. And Nam Gung came up to him from behind, asking if everything was okay with the master. Saul swung her sword at full speed so Hui could calmly take a break from training. Mentor Cho told his student Yun Ho that everything was fine and continued to watch the princess. Nam Gung, wanting to warn the master, asked if he knew that he could be fired if he cheated money from his students. Cho didn't even look in Yun's direction, but simply answered, moving the needle, that Nam Gung has no money so he has nothing to worry about. Yun Ho silently accepted the master's sarcasm and tried to fence him off again, reminding him that the bakery family is not gentle and kind, and if something goes wrong, you won't get away with a refund. Nam Gung looked at his mentor and thought that he had a slightly strange character, but he liked this meticulous and calm teacher. And so Yun decided that someday, he would definitely repay the teaching, even if the price was his life. Mentor Hui smiled and asked Yun in a friendly manner not to worry and stop muttering so much. Nam Gung silently accepted the mentor's request, but the student remained as if on guard. The clouds in the sky acquired a pleasant creamy hue, which was colored by the setting sun. Poor Saul was breathing heavily and was terribly tired, but she asked the master what he would say about her training. Saul explained that what she was studying was the best technique in the world for wielding a double blade, 
and clarified that it was incredibly powerful, but according to the princess's brilliant intuition, it was not yet ideal. The princess suggested that it was worthwhile to refine the technique in the transitions from the third to the fourth movement and from the sixth to the seventh. And Cho asked again what Saul said about the incompleteness of the technique. Mrs. Saul stood with her hands on her hips and stated that it was unfinished because she was more special. And Cho decided to play a little joke by asking the princess to show again her highest technique of playing with a sword, which made the girl terribly angry. Master Cho, or rather even the master of sarcasm, clarified with Saul that it would be okay if she showed him some kind of greatest technique. The teacher awakened the beast in the princess, and she ran up to the master, stomping her foot and shouting, repeating the correct name of her technique. Having let off steam, Saul turned her back to the master and explained that all this is necessary for perfect mastery of martial art, so she shows the teacher her skills so that he can tell where the girl might be making mistakes. And then another day of training came and the princess danced and Master Cho sat on the bench and watched. The mentor mostly just watched and was silent and Ryan Ryong sat next to him, also watching the mistress. Again training and again dancing Sol and the silent Master Hui watching the movements of the student. Cho took advantage of the fact that he was the master of the princess herself, so he clapped his hands and said that he didn't mind eating. Ryan Ryong opened a box of food that looked very appetizing and there were only two pieces. The mentor was glad that he could take advantage of such privileges, and Ryun, looking at the master's grin, suspected something was wrong. The weather that day was cloudy, but Seoul was still training, and in addition to the master and Ryong, Yun Ho was also watching her. Hui noticed that Ryong Ryong was holding a wooden round box covered with a cloth in his hands and asked what it was, and the servant replied that these snacks were specially sent from Wuhan Zhang for the lady. Cho took the entire box of sweets and continuing to sit on the bench, gobbled it up on both cheeks. Ryung Ryung was as unhappy with this charlatan now as before, and Nam Gung was ashamed of his teacher. The mentor told Nam Gung to also help himself and handed him some sweets, but the student refused. Yun Ho wanted to ask the master more about Princess Sol and her training. Nam Gung, watching the princess and understanding what was really happening, asked Cho if everything would be okay with the lady. Ryan Ryong also asked if the lady would get injured at this rate because she is primarily responsible for the safety of the princess. Cho Un continued to eat sweets and responded to all his worries about Seoul that everything would be fine. On another day, when Seoul was training, Nam Gung asked the master if everything should happen like this, which Hui did not understand. Yun Ho explained that he simply meant the mentor's observation of how the lady has been training for several days in a row, and Cho replied that the teacher's responsibilities include monitoring the student's growth. Nam Gung did not stop his meticulous lectures and said that if the girl continues to handle her sword like this, her muscles and energy will be damaged. Yun also concluded that this method of testing abilities is useless because the mind and the sword exist separately. The student noticed things that the teacher had not voiced during all this time, namely that swinging a sword with all his might and so recklessly salt could damage ligaments or muscles. Cho responded to this long monologue of his student with only one word that he knows. Why understood everything a long time ago and put it on his shelves in particular that the sword technique that Saul studied was non-standard because her heart alone rules and the sword moves completely as he pleases. If the mentor were explaining this to someone, he would say that it felt like she was doing a long run at full speed with calm breathing, the same as when falling asleep. As a conclusion, Cho concluded that if the mind and sword are not synchronized, then the body will be destroyed. And as if reading the teacher's thoughts, Yun said that perhaps the lady would not even be able to raise her sword again. Nam Gung was shocked by the mentor's indifference because with him he was different and therefore asked if the teacher really knew everything but would remain silent. Master Cho replied that he would continue to do so and his eyes burned with amethyst power. The master and student looked at the princess and the poor thing was already out of breath and wet as if after rain. Another fine day and another training session in which Cho was already lying on the bench eating sweets for the princess and at the same time told Yun Ho that if he continues to stand like this, then let him come closer and cover the sun for him. The mentor jokingly began to be indignant that the only teacher Yun's eyes were terribly blinding, and he was treating him like this and called him callous. Sol stopped her movements and firmly took the training sword in her hands. The princess stood still for a moment and then changed her face. The long-awaited shadow appeared above Cho's face, but it was not Yun Ho but Princess Sol. The girl stood over her mentor burning with rage and continuing to hold the sword in her hand. Sol cursed at Master Hui for why he was just watching her for ten days straight. 
The princess began to come closer to the teacher in order to express even more of her dissatisfaction, but Cho, as if nothing had happened, warned the girl that if she came closer, he would see her underwear. The master ensured himself from danger and continued to lie there and eat sweets. Sul could not resist and shouted for the master to do his job properly, and Hui asked again that he was already doing everything correctly. The princess realized that there was nothing to catch here and ordered Ryong that they return to Mentor Yo, and the servant obediently snatched the basket of sweets from Cho and went after the mistress. Ryan Ryong walked next to the princess and consoled her, saying that her time was just wasted. That's when Mentor Cho entered the game, slamming his fist into his hand and making a sound of disappointment. The still angry lady turned around and said that it was too late to change anything. Even Cho was sorry. Mentor Hui, in his cunning manner, said that this is very sad because he knows the secret of how to improve the technique and now salt the fish is on the hook. The princess, who just a second ago was more furious than any animal, turned to the master with childish, genuine surprise. But Sol kept herself under control and warned her mentor that if he wants to stop her again with the help of lies, then this will not happen. Master Wee explained absolutely seriously and without joking that to use the double blade technique, you need two swords. And for further form transformation techniques, you also need two swords. After these recommendations, the teacher turned to Yun Ho standing next to him and took the sword from his student, indignant that he was not a bodyguard to hold the weapon so tightly. Teacher Cho threw the second sword to Saul and she deftly grabbed it with her hand as if it were a ball. When the princess had both swords in her hands, Master Cho suggested that she try to perform the technique in this way. But Saul asked the mentor if he understood that during the dance, the swords would collide with each other. Mentor Cho calmly explained that if he turns out to be wrong, then the princess can return to Mentor Yo at any time and still suggested that Sol try to perform the technique. Sol Pakri crossed her swords and it was clear that she was not entirely sure of this, but her interest was already sparked. Mentor Cho accompanied Saul with his instructions that first point the swords towards the ground and then continue the technique as usual but stand on one leg and most importantly, spread the rotation that began from the tips of the sword and transfer it to the tips of the toes. And in that moment where Saul usually failed, this time Mentor Cho caught the moment and commanded her to make a blow. It was difficult for Princess Saul to hold this blow because its power was great, but he did not give up. The lady looked to where what she had been working towards for so long and persistently was taking shape. Cho Un understood that this was the most important moment and shouted to Saul that she needed to withstand this blow. The student heard her mentor and made every effort to hold the swords together. And here is that very moment of enlightenment in which everyone sees some kind of image in their technique, and in Saul's it resembled a bird. The princess remained standing in place with her arms outstretched, and she felt that everything had worked out. Master Cho watched what looked like the flapping of the wings of a huge white crane as it rose to the skies. When the dance was completed, Sol Pakri turned in the direction where everyone usually watched her training. The girl looked at the mentor, who filled with pride did not miss any moment from this dance. Master Cho expressed his recommendation to the princess that he would call this technique White Crane Ascension. Student Yun Ho was even more shocked than the student, and it was difficult for him to believe that what happened now was possible. Yun began to have thoughts and questions swirling in her head, one of which was whether the master had come up with the technique simply by explaining to the princess what to do. Everyone who teaches and studies knows that, as a rule, when teaching the art of combat in a neutral faction, Sword techniques are taught only after numerous basic trainings. The reason for such a long journey to sword techniques is that the student must know in what situations it is worth using the sword and what skills are best to use, and usually this was the part of the training where the mentor's effort was greater. As a result, it turns out that no matter what style the master adheres to, if the student does not get a good base, then the master will not be able to continue teaching the student properly, and Yunho understood that this also applies to Seoul Bakery. Knowing all the canons and rules of martial art, Yun did not understand how the girl was able to reproduce the technique as needed in an instant, only with the help of general movements and the recommendations of her mentor. Yun Ho realized that he was able to see something amazing, namely how Seoul Bakery's talent was revealed. The realization that the dance that the princess recently could not bring to perfection has now turned into an excellent technique has kindled the fire of dance in Nam Gung. Yun Ho took the sword and outlined for himself an important rule of survival in battle, namely, to develop the habit of paying attention to the opponent's strengths instead of looking at the weaknesses. Student Yun was inspired by Seol's dance and awakened his power. 
remembering how not so long ago he was called the ghost of Dong Cheon, and that now he is in no position to evaluate anyone. And so Nam Gung Yun Ho also started dancing with his sword, unable to hold this energy inside. Like a cold flame, Yun Ho was surrounded by his energy, merging with the sword into one in a battle dance. Mentor Cho continued to sit on the bench watching his two students and eating sweets without a twinge of conscience. The master smiled looking at Saul and Yun and thought that they were both like happy children. But no matter how nice it all looked, Mentor Cho still understood that both students were strong enough, which he was also pleased with. Sol Pakri's training did not stop there because she wanted to bring the technique to perfection. And therefore, even after 15 days, she continued her training. The princess's movements became smoother but at the same time dexterous, and she easily moved across the field dancing with swords. Throwing her hand forward for a lightning attack, the girl launched her sword like an arrow. The sword flew right through the wooden training figure, cutting through it like a hot knife through butter. Mentor Cho looked displeased at the figure cut in half and began to be indignant that it had to be repaired again. Sol Pakri, out of breath, looked towards the figure and remained motionless, which worried the servant. Ryong Ryong went up to her mistress to ask if everything was okay because the girl didn't have a face, and the princess burst into tears of happiness because she finally managed to bring the technique to perfection. Ryong Ryong stroked the lady trying to console her, and the girl wiped away her tears with her sleeve, while Mentor Cho, having heard out of the corner of his ear what was happening, was pleased with the result of his work and the breakthrough of the princess. Sol Pakri calmed down and proudly stated that she knew that she would succeed. The girl began to praise herself and remind herself that she was a genius and she was the princess of the great Pakri family and their priceless treasure. The master smiled and answered the young talent that he also knew that she could do it. Perhaps the princess was not used to hearing that someone else really believed in her, or she was already accustomed to the teacher's sarcasm, so she could not at first believe in Cho's words, but he assured her, reminding her that he was really speaking empty words. Saul laughed loudly and cheerfully with joy that the master really believed in her. But Cho would not have been Cho if he had not ruined this joyful moment again with his remark that since the princess broke her figure for training, she should fix it. But Saul was not upset. It was on that day that all four unfinished techniques were completed, and after training, Sol Pekri invited Cho and Yun to her room. And when they arrived, Saul joyfully asked if the room was not big. The princess also asked if looking at her room you could feel how much her family cared about her. Mentor Cho looked at everything around him, so he answered after some time, shifting his focus to the lady's question and confirmed that everything was as she said. Namgung silently analyzed what he saw and felt, and there was something strange about it all for him. Looking to one side of the room, it was indeed spacious and reserved for a student of a different level, but it was empty. On the other side of the room, where there were also a lot of shelves for placing books or other things, was empty. Ryan Ryong was very quick and had already set the table and offered tea to the guests. But Mentor Cho refused, and instead of tea, he asked if there was alcohol. Sol remembered that she didn't call the master to show off the large room, and while she was going to get what she needed, snacks and drinks appeared on the table. The lady indicated that the master was here to repay for his work as promised, and clarified that he would give Mentor Cho whatever he wanted, because the Pakri family is not stingy with gratitude. The joyful princess asked her master what he would like as a reward for the work done. Mentor Cho, savoring his drink, began to think out loud about what he really wanted and winked at the princess and said that there was something. Sol Pakri was a little puzzled, but asked again that in her thoughts what the master wanted was money. And Mentor Cho confirmed that this is a relationship that started with money, so is it wrong to end it with money too? The lady turned to Ryan Ryong and asked her to bring everything she needed, and the assistant obediently left. Ryan Ryong brought and placed on the table a chest with 30 silver won beautifully arranged in rows. Mentor Cho, looking at the reward, began to calculate that one won is equal to 20 coins, and thus there are 600 of them here, while the monthly salary in Dong Cheon is 10 silver coins, so it is worth saving. The master was happy, but Nam Gung, looking at Cho, could not understand how a mentor could teach only for money, because this is not what a Kanho warrior should do. For the first time, the student was disappointed in his teacher, because after so long a time, they will be able to gain at least some hope. Yun Ho sat saddened because he thought that Master Cho was different from other mentors. But at some point it dawned on the student, realizing what the mentor might have planned. Nam Gung remembered that the master said that he had to find students for himself, and given Cho's character, it would be difficult for him to do this. Yun also added to everything that Bakery Sol has real talent, and perhaps she's even stronger than his younger brother, the genius of the Nam Gung family. 
Yoon continued to analyze the situation and wondered why a person with similar abilities from the Baekri family decided to study in Dongcheon. And the student also did not forget about the room, because what is very striking is that this large room is empty and without any decor. Mentor Cho thanked Saul and again reminded her that she had also done a good job and said about the money that she would use it for a good cause, and the princess was surprised that the master was already leaving. Cho Eun smiled and said that he was really leaving and was going to visit Wu Hanjiang with the goal of getting even more money soon. Mentor Cho and student Yun stood at the door about to leave and Sol promised that she would definitely keep her word because as soon as she said it, her father would even give out gold coins. The master comfortingly stroked Saul on the head, reassuring her that everything was fine and again reminded her that all this time she had worked hard and added that Kanho is small, so if there's another opportunity they will see each other. The girl was a little embarrassed and lowered her gaze to the floor, but replied that of course she would see each other again. Almost leaving, Mentor Cho turned to Ryong Ryong, thanking him for the snacks, which were very tasty. The master slowly walked forward, holding a bundle of fabric behind his back, which contained a chest, and behind him Namgun walked a little behind. Disciple Yoon turned to Mentor Cho Woon, because he wanted to know something about the lady from the bakery house. The teacher turned around and told Yoon not to worry in vain. Cho added that he knew very well what the student was so worried about. Yun Ho realized at that moment that the teacher understood everything and seemed to have his own thoughts about Bakery Soul, and he even noticed the disappointment of his student. Mentor Cho voiced his thoughts that Yun Ho was ready to find out the truth without giving in to temptation and asked if the student was ready for a new lesson. Nam Gung did not understand at all what this mentor was thinking about and what was going on in his head, but he replied that he was ready. And although Yun did not understand the thoughts of his teacher, he thought that if he followed him, he would understand everything. Evening came and the lanterns were lit in the rooms, thanks to which a special atmosphere was created. Yun Ho had Master Cho's words in his head about dressing up well, but without explaining why. For the student, there were already prepared and folded clothes on the bench that looked better than what he had been wearing for a long time. Nam Gung got dressed and remembered that several years had passed since he last wore his family's silk clothes. For the first time, Yun Ho preened himself as if he were going to some important event. The young man also decided to tie his hair, which almost completely covered his face when it was loose. Yun looked at his face, which was overgrown with stubble, and thought that too should be tidied up. That night the sky was illuminated by the full moon, and the place where the mentor and student gathered was glowing from the lanterns. Yun Ho was unrecognizable because just without the beard, he began to look ten years younger but the guy was a little excited about where they were going to go. The student was confused by the moment of such a crowded and lively place. And in addition, he admitted to the master that he had never been to such places before, but he had heard many different stories and only one of his friends was a real expert in this field. Cho clarified whether this only friend and student is from Incheon, confirmed that this is so, and from his friend's stories, Yun knows that areas with red lanterns or flags are places where women sell their bodies. But in places with blue lights, there are performers who entertain guests with songs and dances and sell art objects. Mentor Cho smiled slyly and said that he also knew the basic information, but he did not bring Yun here so that he could show off his knowledge and invited the student to look at everything from the inside and study how everything was arranged. Nam Gung became even more agitated because he couldn't understand what the teacher was up to and what he even meant. Cho jokingly asked why Yoon continued to only ask instead of figuring it out himself, and pointing out that the night was short and they had a lot to do, he pushed the guy in a friendly manner, asking him to do something with his red face because Cho was ashamed to walk with him. The mentor went forward to the entrance to the house over which blue lights were burning, and the student stood in place looking after the master. Nam Gung Yun Ho didn't understand at all what had just happened, but he really felt his face burning. For some reason, Yoon assumed that the case would be connected with Pakri Sol, but the master behaves completely unpredictably. With all these chaotic thoughts, the student overcame himself and still moved after the mentor. In a large house near which blue lanterns hung, guests were greeted properly and shown to them free seats. The servant asked the guests to wait a little and he would send the girl to them, to which Master Cho thanked for his concern and offered to enjoy alcohol for now. The servant bowed and thanked the honorable guest for the offer to drink with them. Cho Un turned towards the servant, actually offering the servant a drink and not out of politeness, and the man asked whether the guest really wanted to treat him to a drink. The servant, as follows the rules, took his leave and regretfully replied that he would not be able to repay the guest's kindness and would also not be able to keep them company since he had to work. 
Yun Ho couldn't believe what he just saw, because the mentor offered a drink not to the Gi Seng who would come to entertain them, but to an ordinary servant. The servant poured the drink into cups lined up in a row and once again apologized to the master and insisted that he had to refuse and then asked if he could help with anything else. Mentor Cho once mysteriously said that the warm spring was coming to an end when the servant asked how he could still help. Shui asked if the servant would take the third glass, to which the guy replied that the guest should give him any glass. The teacher looked carefully at the servant and said the fact that the guy could not take the glass himself. Cho turned the cup of drink over, pouring out the contents, and asked the servant if he could turn over another glass and give him the seventh cup. The servant silently accepted the guest's strange gesture at first glance and looked carefully at Cho. The servant realized that the guests were not here for fun, but that some other matter had brought them here, and he asked Cho if he wanted to buy or sell something. The mentor indicated that first he would like to buy something, and at the same time he had something to sell. A servant trained in such things reacted instantly and told the guest to wait a little, and Cho did so while enjoying the drink. For some time, the teacher and student sat silently at a large round table, and if there were many cups in front of Cho and he continued to drink, there was one in front of Yun and he did not touch it. Nam Gung mistakenly asked the mentor what had just happened, and Cho calmly replied that this was a special code of the Hao clan. Yun Ho was amazed because he knew about the Hao clan, and these were those who are in the shadows and they are adherents of the neutral faction, that is, those who are called the lower stratum of society. But this is a huge organization created by marginalized people from all over the world, and they have the same huge information network when compared with the one owned by one of the pillars of the Alliance. Elder Twigalka has hundreds of thousands of beggars under his command as sources of information. And the Hao clan is an organization that uses people of humble class to obtain information, for example, a servant who cleans the house. Also, the informer of information can be a coachman carrying a drunken gentleman with his tongue loosened. A Kisang who pours alcohol on some gentleman is no exception. All these people are those with whom no one ever takes into account so they can get anywhere, which meant that the Hao clan has eyes and ears everywhere, and it was this clan that created such a force and is the support of the neutral faction. Nam Gong is quite young and, due to his naivety, could not believe that in Wuhan Jiang, there was an organization of the Hao clan and also close to the evil faction, and the student anxiously asked the master if they should first inform the Murim Alliance, and the master replied that they everybody knows. The mentor explained to the guy that not only the Hao clan has spies, but Elder Chwagolka, as one of the pillars of the Huasan faction, also has his own informants, and as long as no one goes beyond what is permitted, everyone calmly turns a blind eye to what is happening. Yun Ho was surprised that Teacher Hui knows so much besides the fact that he is also a talented teacher. The student was interested in whether the only branch of the Hao clan was here, and Cho Un explained that such dangerous people cannot settle in one place, so they constantly move around posing as traitors. Yun could not calm down his interest and asked the teacher how he knew that this was the Hao clan. But Hui snapped that their lesson was over for today and gave Yun the task of finding out how Cho found out about the Hao clan. Cho put a cloth bundle on the table in which was the same chest with silver one from Pakri Sol. Nam Gung, having received both the lesson and the task, decided that it was time for him to go because the task required sobriety of mind. The student was leaving the house of entertainment and was so immersed in his thoughts that he did not notice the drunken exclamations of other guests. Many questions were spinning in Yun's head. For example, what did the mentor come to buy? And if he brought silver one from Seoul, then most likely it is connected either with her or with her family, and, in the end, what information does he want to receive? Namgung was distracted from the noisy thoughts in his head by someone's voice, and the man asked why someone like Yoon from Dongcheon would be forgotten in such a place. It was clear from the man that he was already tipsy, because he started asking Yoon what kind of clothes he was wearing, and that the guy looked like a rich man who decided to have fun with a Giseng. And without waiting for Namgung's answer, the man offered to drink. The night mission had not yet come to an end, and although many were already asleep at that time, right now for Cho it was all just beginning. Mentor Hui was able to go where not always and not every person was allowed. In the room, an old man sat at a table with writings, greeted the guest, and introduced himself as Chong Yo, who was responsible for the branch in Wuhan. And the master was laconic, simply saying his name, Cho and Hui. The old man raised his gaze a little at the guy in order to assess who this Cho and Hui was. The elder concluded for himself that the mentor should have already been intoxicated by the Giseng's laughter, but instead he needed an old man like him 
to which Hui asked to stop this game because he had only recently finished training the student. Cho smiled and explained in a friendly manner that he was tired and did not want to carry on empty conversations. The elder was amused by the young man's statement and advised him not to look down on the Hao clan, even if they were considered the lowest stratum of society. Cho called the old man talkative, to which he replied that the guest was ill-mannered, and asked if the mentor from Dong Chion had forgotten where to be. Asking if this was enough, Cho threw a piece of paper with a large number of hieroglyphs on the table, and then the old man's eyes, which had not really opened before, now widened because he read on the paper an inscription about a million monetary units of nannies. Hui leaned his elbows on the table and said that he gets tired of this every time, so he asked the real head to come. A lady in a beautiful dress stood at the door and turned to her dear guest to take care of him, and she ordered the old man to go. Slowly swimming towards the mentor, the woman introduced herself as the head of the branch in Wuhan. The details of both her face and clothing were exquisite, like a work of art. The woman was dressed not too magnificently but not scantily, but in such a way as to emphasize her status, and her name was Yuran. On the table, in addition to treats and tea for the ceremony, there was a chest with silver one. Yuran asked how Cho found out that the old man was not in charge, and the master explained that someone who is not able to even watch the expression on his face cannot be the head. Mentor Cho closed the chest with silver one, indicating that they had something to talk about. Yuran noted this gesture for herself and realized that the person was in complete control of the situation. While Cho enjoyed the drink, the woman wondered where it came from and also concluded that her opponent was not just an ordinary martial arts school teacher. Yuran decided to check what Cho would say and voiced that she did not think that they would be able to get such precious information. Cho always behaved evenly, and this time he replied that if the information was reliable, then there was no reason for him to save money. The woman, finally convinced of the guy's skill, said that in this case, sooner or later, even her heart might open to him. Mentor Cho was pleased that the conversation was finally proceeding normally, without obstacles in the form of doubts. Head Yuran did not take her dark and mysterious eyes like smoke away from Mentor Cho. The woman decided to try to take the master by cunning and play by her own rules and let seduction enter. But Mentor Cho remained faithful to only one woman, who once asked her to find her again, and therefore named what he really wanted from a woman. Namely, Hui came for information and specifically named what he wanted to know, and it was the great Pakri family and after Wu Hanjiang, and the cherry on the cake was the master's desire to find out about the white dragon of the bakery Zhang Sun Sword. Head Yuran did not expect such a turn at all, and was angry that the cunning move did not work. The woman realized that the guy was no slouch and was made of durable material, so she agreed to tell the information and started with the Pakri family. Having told supposedly reliable information, the woman asked if this was enough to satisfy the mentor's curiosity, and Cho replied that it was more than enough. And so Yuran made a second attempt to deceive the guy, and pretending to be innocent, said that the information provided exceeded the payment of 30 silver won, hinting that the master would show his generosity. Mentor Cho decided to play along with the woman and asked how much she wanted now, to which Yuran indicated the amount of 10 gold coins. Cho looked at the head and said that she was right and he had to pay, but at the same time indicating a condition if the information was indeed correct. Yuran did not like this statement that the master doubts the abilities of the Hao clan. The woman made the mistake of saying that the fact that she told was known to all of Kanho, to which Cho quite logically indicated that he had no need to come here for information that all of Kanho knew. Now Cho began to tell the woman that the rot began from within, and they were gradually losing their business being deeply in debt. But Yu did not agree, citing the argument that the strength of great families is not determined only by gold. The mentor expressed his suspicion that the novice warriors stole all the property of the great family, so without wealth it was greatly weakened. The human factor of curiosity worked, and Chief Yu clarified whether it was all the work of the warriors, which greatly amused Cho. And the woman herself caught herself thinking that she accidentally asked a counter question, and now it turns out as if she was receiving information from the guy. Cho realized that the process had started and cast another bait in the form of rumors that soon the current head would appoint the next successor, and the woman already mechanically covered her mouth with her sleeve, so as not to say too much. But this time she couldn't resist. Yuran said that it is nonsense to appoint a new successor, since the current head of the house already has Bakery Jun Young, to which Hui gave her more information that the current successor is very weak in battle, so he will not become the head of the great bakery house. 
The woman realized that they had incorrectly interpreted the information received, and if anyone found out about this, the authority of the Hao clan would receive a blow. Cho Un asked about the woman's conditions at the beginning, that the price of information had increased to 10 gold coins, but immediately indicated that he had corrected the information she had received and asked to triple the price. The master also clarified that, in order to remain silent about the mistake of the Hao clan, Head Yu should increase the amount five times, and after carrying out mathematical calculations, the mentor announced that ten gold coins were eight times each, and in the end his bet was eighty niang of gold. The woman was shocked by the scrolled diagram, and understood that in rare cases the clan pays three times more than it was initially if someone helped with the interpretation of important information. In addition to this, the clan paid five times more if it was necessary so that no one was informed about their mistake to preserve their reputation, and Yu was more horrified by how this person knew their prices, which were practically inaccessible. The woman realized that she couldn't let the guy just leave and, hiding her hand below the table, gave a special sign. Cho, after taking a sip of his drink, told the head that there were too many listeners here for the information he was paying for. Continuing to sit at the table, the master waved his hand using his strength. The boards overhead crackled, and one of the spies began to fall from the ceiling. A man from a high ceiling fell straight onto his back, hitting the hard floor. The woman tried not to show it, but realized that the master reacted quickly, even without seeing her give a sign. Yuran was calm because there were two more assassins in reserve to protect her, and she also gave them a sign. Mentor Cho at that moment took two chopsticks in his hand. One stick flew like a bullet through a pillar in which cracks appeared. The second stick flew into the wall, also breaking through it and leaving cracks behind it. Two dead bodies in dark clothes and black masks on their faces were flying from the wall and from the pillar. All this time, they were behind the guests and they were all lying dead on the floor. Mentor Hui sat just as calmly in his place, and the woman was seriously frightened by the fact that in a matter of seconds she was left without protection. The master looked at the woman who was observing the bloody bodies and explained to her that the price must be paid with information. Yuran was numb with fear and turned to the guy, ready for the fact that she too would die. But Teacher Cho reassured her by saying that he was not going to hurt her if she gave him what he wanted, and clarified that he did not want to seem rude. So he removed ten informational values from Adi Niang. Shui poured the drink into the cup and continued that as an apology, he would deduct another 50 Niang and only 20 gold coins would remain. He handed the cup of drink to the head, Yuran, who sat scared out of her wits. The woman did not take the cup, so Cho placed it in front of the woman and suggested that they now talk about Wu Jiang. The poor thing drank a drink to somehow come to her senses and almost stuttering began to tell the information. Meanwhile, in a house with red lanterns, Nam Gung Yun Ho was sitting with a guy who, already drunk, met Yun in the corridor and dragged him to a drink. The red-haired young man, having already drunk a fair amount, laughed loudly and had fun. Student Yun told his friend about his mentor Cho Un Hui, and the drunk guy could not believe in the existence of such a person. The guy didn't even drink from the cup, but straight from the jug, and said that the mentor was quite an interesting person, and then he remembered that he didn't know how much time had passed since he laughed like that. Yun sighed in disappointment and told his friend that he had not changed a bit. The red-haired guy loudly declared that Yun, too, is still in the same situation, because his story with his mentor is the same as that he was first in the shadow of a smart younger brother and now subordinate to a more capable elder. But the guy smiled at this fact, saying that maybe it's not even bad. The drunkard grabbed the girl by the hand and dragged her to him, telling Yuna that it was not thanks to sympathy that they lived so wonderfully. The guy casually threw the gold coins onto the table, shouting that they were sending him as much money from home as he wanted. The young man continued to hold the girl's hand and shout out that his family had no expectations for him, so he would not let his family down. The girl tried to get out of the guy's strong grip, saying that she was an ordinary dancer, to which the young man threw a golden one into her hand and commanded her to dance her best dance. Yun remembered how he became close to Jay Kaltan because his friend was experiencing the same pain as Nam Gung because he was forgotten by his family and the student realized that if he had not met his mentor, he might have become like Jay and Yun suggested that his friend meet with Cho. Jay asked if Yun meant that madman and took a sip from the drink, and Nam Gung, in turn, told the guy to watch his tongue. He liked his friend's answer because before he was a mattress for him, but now the answer sounded convincing. Yun once again clarified that for Jay, a meeting with mentor Hui would not be superfluous. Jay was already quite drunk and cheerful, so he agreed with Yun, saying that he had nothing to do because he was suspended from classes. Yun was surprised and asked what Jay meant by defamiliarization, 
and the guy, as if nothing had happened, cheerfully answered that he had recently beaten one mentor. Namgung's jaw almost dropped when he heard what his friend had done. Z explained that the mentor kept saying that he knew him and understood him, but the guy was infuriated by such expressions. Yoon silently accepted Jay's answer but still thought that his friend was a complete idiot. Jay, drunk again, said that if he makes another mistake or fails the exam, he will be kicked out and he will come to Dong Cheon. And then Yoon asked another alternative that his friend could be thrown out. Jay shouted that since his friend Yoon continues to talk like that, the guy can't pretend that he doesn't understand. And then it dawned on Nam Gung that he seemed to have made a mistake. On the street, the moon was still burning brightly in the sky, as if competing with the lanterns near the houses to see who was brighter. Meanwhile, Mentor Cho told Head Yu Ran that he heard everything he wanted and thanked the lady. The woman, already more dissatisfied than frightened, reproachfully said that she had no choice, and the master replied that there was nothing wrong with that because she just sold the information. Yu Ran remained silent, but realized that she had crossed the boundaries of what was permitted and told everything she knew. Mentor Cho voiced the fact that he does not understand a woman's heart because before that they had such a nice conversation and now Yu Ran is acting so cold. The woman got angry because they touched a nerve and she thought to herself that she was cold because she had completely lost to her mentor. Hui saw the changes on the lady's face and said that there was nothing to be offended about and said that getting to know him was the best benefit for you. Head Yu couldn't believe her ears and asked what was profitable here and Cho mysteriously replied that he didn't know. The lady was already completely confused and did not understand what this guy was talking about. Mentor Cho stood up and concluded that it was time for him to go, but Mrs. Yuran asked the master to stop. The head couldn't let her mentor go so easily after she was humiliated and reminded that Cho said that he wanted to sell information and asked what it was. The master realized that he had done a good job and clarified whether the lady really wanted to know because it would cost a lot. Yuran said that she was ready to pay if it was worth it, and Cho again added fuel to the fire by saying that he could not trust someone who was surprised by a million niang. The lady still knew her worth and was not going to sink below the plinth anymore, so she sternly replied that she makes decisions here. Cho was pleasantly surprised by the resilience of this lady and asked her to listen carefully and evaluate the information he was going to sell. Such information would shock any clan head because Cho said that this was about the end of the existence of the Hao clan. Head Yu Ran could not believe that the mentor was so simply talking about the collapse of the Hao clan. The woman decided for herself that she could not let this man go even if he died, so it would be better if he took her with him to the grave. For such cases, the lady always had protection with her, hidden in her sleeve in the form of a blade with a ring for her finger, and armed with it, Yu Ran understood that she needed to inflict at least one fatal blow on the master. Head Yu stood up from the table to implement her intentions, and Mentor Cho was already at the door at that moment. The woman bared her teeth like an animal, realizing that it was either now or never, but Hui was acutely aware of the danger behind him, so he stopped and half turned around. Cho looked at the lady with his amethyst eyes, which had already made many people horrified, and this time was no exception for the woman. It was as if she saw a ghost in front of her, and like everyone else, she saw murderous energy in those eyes and did not understand how someone like him could exist. Head Yuran was so scared that she swayed and had to lean on something. The lady realized that those who are in the clan are not opponents to this man, and since her body was weakened and did not obey, the blade flew off her finger and fell loudly to the floor. Yuran sat down because Cho did not have the strength to rely on energy, but he himself was pleased with the woman's obedience. Cho Un Wei looked carefully at the head of the Hao clan and said that as a Kang Ho warrior, he could not leave in this way. The master quietly said that this was a list of traitors and kindly indicated to Head Yu that she could consider this a presale tasting. With the help of her power, a list of traitors flew to the mistress's ear, and now only she knew this information. Yu Ran even touched her ear to hear better and to make sure that this was really happening to her now. On the table remained the only evidence that the lady was not alone today in the form of a vase and cups for drinks. The woman sat motionless not only because she had received a huge number of impressions during the evening, but also in order not to frighten off what had literally flown into her ears. Under the light of the moon, the statues on the houses took on a different appearance as if they were about to come to life, flying into the sky. In front of the house, an excited Yoon was walking from side to side, and Mentor Cho was already approaching him. Nam Gung finally noticed the teacher and asked if he had finished his business, to which Hui replied in the affirmative. 
The mentor put his hand on Yun's shoulder and, looking closely at the guy's face, asked if he had been drinking. The student hesitated, but replied that he really drank a little, after which Cho Un twisted the guy by the neck and jokingly said that while the mentor was doing hard work, his student was enjoying the drink at that time and the master, satisfied, asked whether it was tasty. Yun responded with relief that it was delicious, and the mentor laughed at him and was doubly pleased. Cho suggested that Nam Gung go to the kebab shop across the street and eat a few pieces of meat and then return to school. But the student was surprised that the master, having been in the magnificent cabana, now wants to go to an ordinary kebab shop. We jokingly told Yun that if he doesn't want to, then don't let him do it. To which the student himself, already losing his saliva from imagining how he eats kebab, objected to the mentor that he didn't say at all that he didn't want to. Meanwhile, Sol was in Pakri's house, and judging by the way she was sitting with her legs crossed, something was bothering her. The princess held the fabric of her dress with her hand in a death grip and sat motionless. Sol was upset about something and her gaze was full of sadness and worry. The girl seemed nervous, expecting something, and this only made things even more tense. Saul was sitting on a chair in front of the table where her family and father were just reporting on her achievement. Unlike the empty princess room in Dong Cheon, here in the bakery house, everything indicated status, such as a porcelain plate. On the other side of the room, a hand-painted porcelain vase sparkled with cleanliness. And also the screen with the image of mountains looked more like a work of art than an ordinary screen. The father read about his daughter's achievements and concluded that everything was even better than he expected. The gentleman praised the princess rather coldly and dryly, saying that it was a good job. The father added that he doubted his daughter's ability to cope with the budget he allocated. Next to the gentleman stood a son who sarcastically agreed with his father and then, in the same mood, called his sister small and untalented and, in addition, voiced his thoughts about where the girl could be used. The guy continued to throw mud at salt, saying that even larvae like her can succeed, calling it a relief. But the father turned to Man Young so that his son would not forget that he was standing in front of him, so he needed to be more restrained, and the guy began to make excuses, after which he asked if Saul agreed that it was a relief that she was capable of something, and the poor thing said yes. The head of the family looked at his daughter and was pleased with the result, saying that he could now keep his promise. Brother Man immediately picked up his father's words and loudly declared that Mr. So will definitely take care of Saul because he's a big-hearted person. The mother also did not lag behind and explained that if everything goes well, the day will come when Saul will become the support of the head of the house and the father confirmed this. The princess did not understand what they were talking about, but she knew that Mr. So had a huge trading guild and seemed to be close to her father. But Saul could not understand what kind of promise they made between themselves and why they were talking about it now. Someone said that in the end, she would also be able to take a worthy position in the family and everyone would envy the princess, but this did not make it any easier for the girl, and she looked down at the floor, still crossing her legs in excitement. Sol didn't seem to notice them, but heard again that when she moved to the main house, it would be better to change all the furniture to new ones, and the princess silently accepted what she heard, and her father's severity returned to his face and voice. The head of the family rose above the table, saying that he would take care of the expenses and indicated to his daughter that she could now return. Saul nervous and hesitating, called her father when he had almost left the room. The gentleman turned around with a very surprised look and said that he was not going anywhere. Sol grabbed her knees because her nerves were on edge and reminded her father of the promise she had made to her. The father frowned and looked at Saul with an almost withering look and asked what kind of promise it was. Little Saul said in a trembling voice that the promise was that when she finished with the new sword technique, her father would give her what she wanted. Mother and brother at that moment approached Saul and man told his sister that if she did something for the family, she should just be proud of it. And the mother picked up on this, adding that if the girl becomes too greedy, she will become useless because no one likes greedy women. The princess had to make a titanic effort so that important words for her would fly out of her mouth. And the little girl, plucking up the courage to ignore her mother and brother, turned to her father, declaring that she wanted him to keep his promise. The mother was shocked by such impudence, and the brother told his sister that she was old enough so she should stop being selfish. And when the head of the family got tired of this bedlam and a large number of exclamations, he said enough to everyone. Reluctantly, the father asked what his daughter wanted while urging her to answer. Sol was glad that she was finally heard, but at the same moment knowing the severity of her father, at first she could not say anything. But nevertheless, again plucking up courage, she announced that she wanted to become a Kanho master that is to be a mentor and teach others martial arts. 
And now there is one last push left before the salt sounds loudly and confidently. The princess raised her head and screamed loudly that she wanted to learn all the techniques of the Pakri family. And after that, Saul said to herself in her thoughts that she had done it. But if the girl at that moment was proud of her courage to declare her own desires, the father was horrified. Saul looked at the floor and was very happy for herself that she didn't back down and praised herself. But Brother Man just opened his mouth and began to say, what kind of nonsense his sister is talking about now, when the father raised his hand, indicating to his son to stop and be silent. The father came close to Saul and said that since he promised, he should listen to his daughter. Saul was beside herself with happiness and asked again, just in case, whether her father would really listen to her. After which the father took his daughter by the shoulders and asked again whether the daughter wanted to be a master. And to this rhetorical question, he himself answered that Mr. So would support her in this endeavor. The brother was very amused by the way his sister found out about her father's plans for her. Saul seemed not to feel the ground under her feet, and being in prostration, she again asked what her father's words about Mr. So meant. The father explained that if Saul marries a member of that family, then the whole world will belong to her, and this cannot be compared with Kanho. And the mother agreed that having become the mistress of such a rich house, Saul will do whatever she wants, and Man also said that her sister will bathe in gold. The princess couldn't believe it, and a lot of questions were swarming in her head. Like, should she really get married? And why the hell are they talking about everything as if everything had already been decided? Saul cried out that the promise was different, because her father said that if she learned a new technique, he would allow her to do whatever she wanted. Saul clearly replayed their conversation, in which her father said that he would listen to her wishes when she finished improving her martial art. And it turns out that despite the understanding that it was harmful to her body, she went to the result like a warrior and tried her best. The father was unshakable and said that if his daughter gets married and gives birth to several children, she will be able to do whatever she wants. From the pain and injustice that is sprinkled on top with severity, Sol's teeth clenched. Tears flowed from her eyes in streams and she shouted how they could all do this to her. A strict man is a frightened man who behind a mask of severity hides his fear of manifesting himself, even in emotions. And when he saw real tears and bitterness, his father decided to remove from sight what he himself was afraid of with a slap in the face. Saul was all afraid from both physical and mental pain that her own father could do this to her. The father stood attentively and looked at his daughter and concluded that she had picked up a lot while she was at school and announced that her classes were over so that she no longer needed to go to Dongchon. So he ordered her to go there tomorrow and say that she was leaving. Saul stood with her face turned to the side and continued to stand, numb with horror. The princess realized why she had been called a priceless treasure all this time. Saul realized that she is a precious pearl that can be looked at and enjoyed, but in response she can only shine. The little girl wiped the blood from the corner of her mouth with her hand, and the words that she was a pearl that belonged to someone and could only shine dully echoed in her head. One day, Mentor Cho was watching Yoon's training when someone called the master and Mentor Yo appeared at the entrance. Mei was excited and asked if his student Bakery Sol had come to see Mentor Cho, to which the master answered in the negative. Cho explained that the last time the princess said that she would go home, but since then, he had not seen her and asked Mei if something had happened. Yun continued the training but heard the conversation between the mentors and Mei said that Sol had recently visited her and apparently went straight away to meet with the head and since the last person who trained Saul was Cho, she was a mentor and thought that maybe the master knew something. Cho, as always, in his own manner, answered that he didn't know anything in particular and asked again what happened. May began to say that that day she was minding her own business in the library. Mentor Yo, like other masters, was looking for some information for herself on the shelves with records. And then she heard a rather familiar voice calling her, to which May naturally became distracted and turned around. Mentor Yo was terribly glad to have a guest who came to visit his master. At the entrance stood Sol, who shone brighter than the sun, and behind her, as always, her faithful assistant, Ryan Ryong. The girls sat down at the table to talk and drink aromatic, freshly brewed tea. May said that they had not seen each other for a long time, and that she had heard about the success of Sol and Mentor Cho in completing the technique, and also asked how the princess was doing now, to which the answer was that everything was fine. It was clear from Saul that she seemed to want to say something important, but she couldn't make up her mind. And then Saul looked down at the table and finally admitted why she had come today. The silence was broken by May's shout to the entire hall, asking if the princess was leaving. Mentor Yo was very surprised and said that Saul trained harder than anyone 
And just like that, she suddenly quit studying, and of course, May asked if something had happened. The little girl replied that something really happened, but she assured the teacher not to worry because nothing critical had happened. Sol, who had just laughed, suddenly changed her face, but it was unclear whether it was sadness or pain. Teacher May just froze, waiting for the princess's answer and just watched. Sol placed a neat package in front of the mentor with a request to accept it from her. May was a little confused, but began to unwrap the fabric and ask the student what it was. The package contained a beautiful pendant with flowers, and Saul explained that it was a farewell gift that she bought, thinking that it would look great on the hilt of her mentor's sword. May, as befits a master, said that she could not accept something so expensive. But Saul smiled again, reminding her that she was a priceless treasure, so it was not such an expensive gift, so she asked May not to be shy and take it. This is what alarmed Mentor Yo, because the sudden changes in emotions and with them leaving and a farewell gift did not look like the usual behavior of a student. Having told about the meeting, May continued to explain to Hui that Sol suddenly, out of the blue, started talking about leaving and her intuition tells her mentor that something happened to the girl. Yomei carefully and silently looked at Cho and then asked if the master had made a mistake while teaching the princess. But Hui remembered that, in fact, he had not done anything special at all and just shook his head. May continued to think that even if Cho is not to blame, if the official representative of the Paikri family leaves the school, then Mentor Hui will get a bad deal from the head of Zhang. Now Cho started to get nervous and couldn't understand why he would get into trouble, to which Mei simply replied that it was all because it was the great Paikri family. Mentor Yo explained that if Sol herself expelled, it would damage the reputation of their school. And as Cho knows, head Zhang really wants to work at the Inchun school, so he values his reputation very much. And in order to finally finish off the mentor, May explained that if a student suddenly decided to leave 10 days after changing the mentor, then it would be the mentor who would be blamed for this. Cho wondered if Sol did this because he just watched her for 10 days, but then he remembered that they had discussed everything. May noticed the expression on Cho's face and almost shook the soul out of him, demanding to tell him what he knew and why Sol decided to leave. Like thunder in broad daylight, a scream rang out at Dongchen School, and it was the name of Master Cho. The voice screamed and called the mentor, growing more and more and approaching where the guy was. And the one who shouted was already at the door of the library where the mentor was sitting. With the words, what are you doing? Herod opened the doors, and if the other masters realized that this was the end, Cho, as always, ate. Mentor Hui tried to put on a cute face again and joke about a warrior of marriageable age. Zhang ordered him to shut up. Hui absolutely calmly asked why the head was yelling at him and asked what happened, and Zhong was even more angry from the guy's reaction. Behind Zhong's back, as always, stood his right hand in the form of the nasty toad Yoma, and the head began to explain that the student bakery soul came to him and said that she wanted to expel. The mentor, yawning sweetly, pretended to be surprised and asked why she made such a decision. Out of nerves, Zhong began scratching the back of his head and could not bear these stupid questions from Cho, as if he did not understand anything. The head began to mention to the mentor that Saul decided to leave 10 days after the guy took responsibility for her training, and she had to inform the first mentor about this and the mentor already to the head, but Cho logically replied that Zhang himself came. The head did not stop and shouted that how could a student escape from a responsible mentor and not even say a word to him, and Cho sighed heavily but remained silent. And then Hui looked thoughtful and said that Sol was initially so unshakable because she is still a Kanho warrior. And this was the last drop of Head Zhang's anger that fell into the boiling vat. Turning to the mentor so that he turned his face in the right direction, Cho launched a notebook. And with shouts that the guy was a damn brat, Head Zhang began to throw notebooks at the mentor one after another. But the guy waved them aside with ease. We got tired of this and catching one of the notebooks, the guy said that the head is absolutely right so Cho should go somewhere. As it turned out, the toad was holding a stack of notebooks that the head shot at the guy. But Zhang stopped after the mentor's statement. Cho rose from the table, holding the notebook he had caught in his hands, and headed to the entrance where Yom and Jun were standing, telling them that he wanted to go to Baikri Sol's house. Hui put the notebook on a stack, and taking Yom by the shoulder with one hand, so that the poor guy grimaced, told the mentor that his shoulders were very tense, and the guy replied to Zhang that as the head of what he wanted, he would go and find out what happened. Before leaving, Cho smiled and asked Jun to give him a pass so he could get to the Beckery family. To get from one place to another, you had to walk among the walls along a cobblestone road. Cho carried a cloth bundle and also took a sword with him. And walking along this road, he told himself, what a deserted area this is. Hui looked at the high walls and didn't understand what people found in them. 
because you couldn't even see what was happening next door. Cho continued walking, but the further he walked, the more he realized that he didn't like it. While the mentor was walking, he analyzed that truly beloved children would not talk about themselves like Saul. Cho remembered how the girl called herself the princess of the great Pakri family and that she was a priceless treasure. The mentor also remembered Saul's words that in her huge room, one could feel how her family cared for her. But just like Yun noticed that the room was empty, the mentor also did not ignore this. Cho wondered if a child who was madly loved would be abandoned to live in an empty room with nothing. We continued on his way, preparing for the fact that perhaps everything was much worse than he had imagined. The guy came to the Pakri house, at the door of which there were two guards. One of the guards asked who the guy was and Cho replied that he was a mentor from a martial arts school. Since the guards received news from Dong Cheon, they let the mentor through and he walked further along the huge square that led to the house itself. Almost reaching the door, Someone from the side shouted the name of the mentor, and the guy was surprised. Cho turned around, and a frightened Ryong Ryong was running towards him, shouting something about her mistress. Meanwhile, in the house, the lanterns illuminated all the pomp and luxury of the home. Precious vases stood polished to a shine on the shelves and shone like diamonds. The table was set in the best possible way, with all the delights both in food and in dishes and cutlery. The head of the Pakri family, as well as his son, Man, and the honorable guest, Mr. So, were sitting at the table. The father ordered the servant to hurry up and invite Saul to enter their hall. Like a bird in a beautiful long dress with flowers, salt floated across the floor. The servants announced that the lady had arrived and the guest immediately looked in the direction where salt was. The girl was more beautiful than the most delicate flowers on her dress, but her face was so unhappy that the color of her eyes dimmed. Mr. So was delighted with the so-called agreement saying that the princess was indeed incredibly beautiful and added that her beauty made his heart ache and he was happy that he would see this face for the rest of his life. The father asked his daughter to sit down at their table in the place reserved for the princess next to the gentleman. At the large round table, only one place reserved for the mentor was empty. Sol did not eat or drink, but only sat with her eyes downcast at the table while the honorable guest drank and looked at the beauty of the girl. The little girl sat and understood that this was the end, but she still couldn't understand why it all turned out this way. Sol thought that it would be wrong to follow the words that she should live for the sake of her family and for their benefit. But was she really unable to escape from home because she was not beaten here? The question came to the princess if it was because she had kept hope in her heart until the very end, harboring unrealistic expectations. Tears began to fall onto Saul's hands from a terrible state of hopelessness. But where there seems to be no hope in sight, everything is just beginning and the servants announced that a mentor from the Dong Cheon Martial Arts School has arrived. The doors opened, and the first thing you could immediately see were bright amethyst eyes. Mentor Cho entered the hall in the same place as Ryong Ryong and looked at where the guests were talking at the table. Sol noticed a man who was perhaps closer and more pleasant than everyone who was sitting at the table with her now. Cho also met the girl's gaze, and so far the mentor's eyes were calm. The head of the family looked at the fact that the mentor was not standing alone, but next to him was Ryan Ryong. The master, without even greeting Cho, asked if the maid knew this man. Ryog Ryong responded in the affirmative, indicating that this was Cho Unhui, the instructor in charge of the lady. When Cho came closer to the table, the gentleman told him that his daughter told him a lot about the master and asked if it was true that Cho had helped her a lot. The mentor remained silent and looked at Sol, who sat drooping. Cho realized that the girl was now terribly embarrassed by the fact that her mentor was present here now. The master realized that the girl was apparently ashamed that he had suddenly appeared at her wedding with a man who was old enough to be her father. But in order not to stretch the pause into awkward silence, Cho answered the head that he, as a mentor, was good at it. The father laughed, saying that the guy was quite brave, but usually many people could not utter a word in his presence. The gentleman was interested in the fabric bundle in the hands of the mentor, and he asked what was inside. Cho put the package on the table and replied that there were pennies that were given to him the other day, and that's why he was here to return them, because it seemed wrong to the master. The father opened a chest in which were the same 31 that had already visited the queen of the Hao clan and were even able to return to where they came from. The head replied that he was sorry that such a precious person had to come all this way for the sake of some insignificant amount of money. Sol again became convinced that, as it turns out, if 30 silver won is nothing for a father, then what can we say about the happiness of his daughter? The father just shouted the word hey to the servants and they did everything as needed, as if they already knew what to do. While the servant was carrying and placing a larger chest on the table in front of Cho, 
The head said that his child was still immature and could not properly present a return gift and added that it would be quite suitable for a reward, meaning what was in the chest. In front of Cho stood an open chest with just gold ones, and there were an order of magnitude more of them. The head apologized for the mistake of his stupid daughter and asked the mentor to accept this chest. Cho scratched the back of his head and replied that if he accepted this gift, he might get into trouble. The father was amused again and replied that he was not going to offend the instructor who diligently trained his child, who really lacked a lot. And Hui thanked the head for his words, but could not speak further because the master said that in this case he also has conditions. Having changed his face to a formidable man, the head said directly that he had heard that the mentor was well-versed in martial arts. And the head of Pakri asked his mentor if he would like to work with him. Cho replied that cooperation with the head of Pakri would be difficult. A man who was rarely refused because he had wealth and power, it was very surprising to hear such an answer. Therefore, Hui explained to the head that they were prohibited from combining mentoring with other work. Mr. Pakri laughed loudly and menacingly because for him nothing was impossible if you had money. The head understood but was not happy that the mentor did not like his generous offer. And the gentleman gestured forward with his hand to the guards with swords standing behind him. The guards were already trained like watchdogs, so they slowly moved towards Hui, taking their swords out of their sheaths. Both guards stood behind the mentor, awaiting further instructions from their master. The head of Pakri grinned and suggested that Cho think carefully because the proposal would be in force for some time. Master Hui didn't even twitch a nerve on his face, but he just looked at this bastard who decided to ask the question again. The head looked with his dissatisfied and stern gaze and asked the guy if he would accept his offer. Mentor Cho held the tyrant's gaze, looking at him still exactly without a single movement or emotion. And after a pause, Hui said that this was too important a conversation to have in front of strangers. The owner of the house replied that Mr. So is not a stranger and that they will soon become a family. Cho, despite the fact that he could have been killed at any moment, sarcastically noted that there seemed to be a misunderstanding and he did not notice the love in the eyes of those present. The head of Pakri warned the guy to watch his language and pointed out that Lord So is not the person with whom an ordinary mentor can talk like that. Mr. So himself laughed, embarrassed by the words of the head and said that everything was fine. Seo said that how could it be that there were no feelings in a man's eyes when he looked at his bride and turned towards Seol, to which Cho grimaced and pointed out that the man looked old for this. So disagreed with the guy, saying that he and the princess did not have such a big age difference and thought that this was not an obstacle because he was ready to love and care more than anyone. Mr. So, while he was talking about great love, took out a scroll from under his bosom and told the guy to look and unfolded it. The picture showed a woman exactly flying out. The salt seemed to have been created as a carbon copy. While So was asking if this woman doesn't look like Pakri Soul, only that in the picture she is a little older, the mentor could not contain the surprise that jumped out on his face. So introduced the woman as his ex-wife, and explained that he proposed to Saul because it seemed to him that she was the reincarnation of his ex-wife. So asked if the guy now understood what was in his heart, and Saul, looking at the picture, was horrified by what was happening. Unexpectedly for everyone, the mentor let out a loud laugh, although before that he stood emotionless like a rock. So hid the scroll back under his clothes, and now, instead of love, there was misunderstanding in his eyes, just like Saul's. The rest of the Pakri family members also seemed to have changed places with their mentor, because if he was laughing now, those sitting at the table had a stony expression on their faces. Cho smiling turned to Saul, asking her if she also thought all this was funny. And as if Cho had a piece of immortality somewhere in his pocket, he declares to So's face that he cannot believe that a toad like him had such a charming wife and wondered if the uncle had confused a dream with reality. Sol realized that things were bad because her creepy father heard it too, and she was filled with cold, which is why she twitched. The owner's fist hit the table like a sledgehammer, causing the furniture to shatter into splinters. And screaming like an angry beast, the head of Pakri turned to the mentor that he was going to be polite with him, but the guy crossed all boundaries. The guests stood around the wooden parts that used to be a round table and looked at Cho. The owner shouted that such an ill-mannered youth should know his place and gave the command to his watchdogs to draw their swords. Hui was glad that finally it wouldn't be so boring. He asked Sol what they would do, and Cho questioningly said that he could kill everyone here. The poor thing, already frightened, shouted how the master could joke in such a situation. But Cho, showing his beautiful amethyst eyes, said that he was quite serious and warned the princess to think carefully before answering, because her fate would depend on him. Sol realized that the mentor was really not joking, 
and the main lever for her to wake up was the word fate. The girl repeated these two words in her head, my destiny, as if regaining herself. Saul looked carefully at the faces of her seemingly dear people who almost sold her today. And maybe the princess would have changed her mind. But then the mother ordered her daughter to go in their direction and quickly, and the brother, as always, with a dissatisfied face, pointed out why his sister was just standing there and that she was, as always, narrow-minded. After the words spoken in her direction, the girl changed her hope into something of anger, which had not yet fully revealed itself. But Cho, unlike everyone else, was pleased, and even said that the princess should take her time and think. And after the mentor told Sol that she even had time to think, he broke the chair lying in front of him so that two strong legs remained. Cho deftly threw these legs upside down and they ended up in his hands. Sol, most likely, having given her consent, warned the master that he should be careful because these are warriors raised by her father. And Cho, laughing at the fact that everything was only becoming more interesting, answered the princess well. From the entrance, warriors with swords rushed towards Cho like two trained bulls. Chui stood with sticks from a chair and was already ready to greet such frisky guests. Cho wielded sticks no worse than the warriors wielded their swords. And when they reached the place where the guy stood, the master was at the entrance in the blink of an eye. The mentor caught two fighters when he changed places with them and they got hit. While Cho stood with his back to everyone, a warrior was already running towards him, screaming and also armed with a sword. The warrior swung and punched, but missed because Cho was skilled at dodging. The mentor decided to lighten up this boring action a little and tilted the chest with the silver coins that he had brought today with his foot. Cho kicked two silver one to the level of his hands and prepared his finger for the strike. With two resounding blows on there, the mentor gave them the direction as if they were bullets. The silver ones crashed into the warrior's chest with terrible speed and he screamed in frantic pain. The fighter fell to the floor and mentor Cho remained standing in front of him with his hand raised. Smiling, the master told the princess that first he would get rid of the garbage that was preventing her from collecting her thoughts. The warrior who was hit in the chest by Cho with silver fell to the floor face down. Sol could not resist, and asked how the master defeated the warrior only with Wanami, to which the mentor reminded the princess that he had told her that he was good at everything he undertook. But the girl exclaimed that the mentor did not say, but what she remembers is the possession of a sword, a club, a spear, a knife, and a bow. Hawaii smiled and asked if he had only named such a short list and took his sword out of its sheath. In front of the mentor stood the owner, and on both sides of him, just like those dogs, stood two more warriors. The head of Pakri indignantly hid that the guy was hiding the real level of his skills. But Cho proudly stated that he never hid his skills and added that it was the head who did not know the basics. The father ordered his watchdogs to take Sol away from here, still considering the girl his property. One of the warriors began to say that the lady should come to them, but could not finish speaking to the end. The one who couldn't finish speaking had something hit him right in the forehead, and the second warrior in the chest in the area of the heart. The owner only had time to watch his two guards fall face down on the floor. The head of Pakri saw that near the unconscious warrior, there was a silver one from which both guards fell. The owner, holding his sword, muttered through his teeth that he was trying to be lenient with the guy, but he was not going to tolerate someone hurting his people and misleading his precious child. Fueling the flames of rage inside, the head of Pakri threatened the mentor that the guy would not get away with just an apology. Sol was truly afraid of her father and tried to persuade him to stop. The daughter pleaded with the head of Pakri to forgive her mentor Cho, because she knew what kind of father could be furious. But the owner of this house made a huge mistake by shouting to the defenseless girl to shut her mouth. Head Patri, although he was angry and terrified if you looked at him, he still did not fully understand who he had contacted and who his opponent was. Mentor Cho was not a timid type, and it is said about such people that he literally laughs in the face of danger. The head of Pakri kicked the floor and repeating the technique, Cho swung his sword and struck the stones while they were in the air. With this, the owner wanted to distract the guy, and while he was dodging the stones, the head would kill him, but not in the case of Cho because he had already violated the plan and was focused on the enemy while knocking off the stones. The head ran furiously with a sword at the guy, while Cho, in addition to his sword, also had a stick from a chair in his hands. And Cho Un would not have been Cho Un if he had not figured out how to use a chair leg, namely repeat the same meanness as the owner with the stones. The head of Pakri waved away the wooden pieces, calling them pathetic tricks. But no matter how pitiful they were, they were really tricks because while Pakri was distracted by sticks, Mentor Cho kicked his sword off the floor. And now the guy is already standing with two swords, having a serious advantage over the head. Pakri realized where everything was leading, namely to the Mentor's use of the double blade technique. 
Cho, as happy as a child, told Saul to watch carefully because this is a special and perfect method of using two blades. The master made certain movements similar to flapping his wings right in front of the head. The blades of the blades passed quite close to Pakri's face, leaving behind an amethyst glow, which is why the old man even had to close his eyes. The mentor made a jump and entered the battle, dancing with swords, and all that remained for the owner at that moment was to at least put up a defense in front of himself with the help of a sword. Pakri had to lean with his whole body to withstand Hui's blow, but the old man's legs began to move along the floor. For the first time that evening, the head realized the scale of the problem and what he had gotten himself into. And the mentor's power only began to grow, and Cho, as always, was glad of what he felt at this moment. The mentor again made a jump and hit the defense of the head of Pakri with a double blow, causing the old man to stagger. The owner could only keep his defense in front of him because Cho struck blow after blow like a hurricane. The old man was both scared and angry that for the first time he couldn't cope with the situation. There was someone stronger than him. Sol, who had been watching the battle all the time, could not believe what she saw as Master Hui pushing her father aside. Cho, spitting sarcasm as if it were poison, called the head of the White Dragon of the Sword and added that he should come to the martial arts school and he, Hui, as his instructor, would teach the old man how to properly handle the sword. Such words hurt Pakri's pride and he yelled at Hui's mentor that he was a degenerate. The greedy anger that was raging inside the head spread to his weapon, making the sword look as if it had just been pulled out of the brazier. The sword glowed with a red flame and was heated to white, which indicated the release of energy outward. Saul looked at her father's transformation and realized that everything was only getting worse. The girl shouted to mentor Cho that it was the energy of the sword that had manifested itself and asked the master to be careful. Master Cho looked at how uncontrollably Pakri used the energy of the sword and held steady because he knew that at the very peak, only those who enter the realm of the highest mastery can barely comprehend it. Hui heard Saul's warning, but he also knew that there was nothing in the world that could not be cut, and the sword itself was no exception. Pakri put strength and anger into his sword swing, but without proper control and self-discipline. Cho, in turn, always approached the battle wisely and accordingly put up a defense in front of himself. But since the technique was tied to a dance with two blades, the mentor connected another blade to the blade that held the head sword, thereby making a blow. The old man could barely hold on to this power, and on top of that there was the blinding light from the blades. Quite unexpectedly, blood poured out of the head's mouth after Cho crossed blades. His legs no longer obeyed his master, and Pakri slipped halfway away from his mentor. Trying to hold on with his hand, the head continued to move across the floor further and further from the master, and Cho understood that Pakri Chong Sun was unable to strengthen the sword only because of his skills. The mentor saw Chan spit out blood from his mouth and realized that he had clearly suffered damage to his internal organs as a result of the blow. Hui crossed his blades over his head, deciding for himself that it was time to end this useless battle. And then the mentor lowered the swords to the ground as Saul once told him to start with this. It was by the two swords lowered to the floor that Saul understood what the mentor was going to do. Master Cho brought the sword together in front of him in two sweeping movements, leaving an amethyst trail. The swords rang out with their blades facing each other, and this was the end of the Pakrisol technique. Therefore, after drawing the swords back, an amethyst crane ascended in front of Mentor Cho. This was the final blow aimed at the head of the bakery family, Jong Sun. The old man spat out even more blood, as if from an explosion, and flew to the end of the hall. Jong Sun, like a doll, fell to where he had shown his menace at the beginning and broke the table with his fist. At this point, the duel was completed, and in front of the owner of the house, stood the man to whom Chan did not show respect. Mentor Cho turned to Saul and being terribly pleased asked how she liked what she had just highlighted. While the girl was afraid to move and looked at her father lying on the floor, Cho explained to her that he had just completed her white crane ascension technique. Poor Saul, having experienced so much humiliation and being now very frightened, could do nothing more than cry. She cried because finally someone stood up for her and was able to free her from the golden cage. The mother could not believe that her husband was lying on the floor, and the son said in a trembling voice that his father had really failed. With a hoarse voice from the blood in his throat, Chan Bakery tried to curse at his mentor, and Cho drew attention to this. Trembling and holding his ribs but rising to his feet, Chan asked what kind of tricks the mentor used. Chan stood bent over and breathing heavily, and told himself that this was impossible and that he had never seen such a level of sword control. Cho looked at the shabby old man indifferently and asked him if he really was such a fool. The mentor took Sol by the wrist and led him forward towards his father. Chan Bakery was barely sitting on the floor on his knees,
But Cho was determined and walked towards the head so that Sol could barely keep up with him. Mentor Hui came close to Chan and sharply pushed the old man in the chest and knocked him onto his back. The master took out a notebook from under Chan's clothes, where the technique of wielding a double blade was written. Hui held the notebook over Jung Guk to make sure he really saw it and told the old man to look at it. Chan could hardly speak, but he stood up and asked his mentor what he was holding in his hands, and that was his best technique for wielding a double blade. Teacher Cho held the notebook in front of everyone and explained that mastery of the double blade is rare, especially if warriors study old-school martial arts. Hui pointed to Merchant So and asked if this was the man who brought the notes, and then asked how an ordinary merchant managed to find the mysterious technique, and So's face changed dramatically. The mentor interpreted the situation more clearly for those present, explaining that this technique cannot be quickly mastered without guidance and only with talent, because the technique belongs to the demonic art and so began to deny. Saul asked the mentor if she understood correctly that Cho wanted to say that Mr. So was a demon, but Hui responded negatively, arguing that that was why So tried to use someone else to complete the technique. Saul was horrified to hear from the master that the mind control technique was used to complete it. Mind control is used with the help of drugs and hypnosis, thanks to which you can penetrate the weakened mind of a person and strengthen his negative emotions and then turn the person into your puppet. The princess realized that it turned out that her father all this time was not a father at all. The daughter looked at her exhausted father and wondered if all this meant that he was not himself right now. Saul turned to Mentor Cho, asking what needs to be done to dispel the mind control. Hui looked at the girl trying to understand if she would be ready for such an answer. After a pause, Cho still replied that if you kill the sorcerer, you can free yourself from control. No matter how sweet and gentle this girl seemed from the outside, she immediately turned her gaze full of determination to where So was. So sat on the floor and could not believe that the princess was now actually picking up the sword from the floor. The merchant sat and trembled, but did not move from his place, and Saul walked towards him with a sword in her hands. The girl looked at So, and in her eyes one could read the irrevocable decision that had already been made. Merchant So, still trembling with fear, sat on the floor and looking at the princess asked her for mercy. So backed away but pressed close to the wall, and Cho, as a true mentor, was nearby even now, and told the student that if she wanted she could stop and leave, but if she killed the merchant, there would be no turning back. Sol brought the sword in front of her and firmly told the master that she could do it. Cho took the girl by the hand in which the sword was, and holding it, tried to dissuade her and think again explaining that she could return to her old life. She just needed to forget today. The mentor continued to persuade the girl to simply live on as a precious treasure of the Pakri family, but these same terrible words worked as an advantage, and Sol said that she had decided everything. Cho Un said that Sol was indeed a very headstrong student and asked the princess to look at him, but he thought to himself that he was working for such a pittance and there was so much hassle. Sol opened her eyes and told her mentor that she had already chosen which path she wanted to go. The master was surprised, but answered that he was very sorry and let go of his hand, and given the weight of the sword, Saul's hand began to fall down on Mr. So. The sword flew straight at Mr. So's head and he screamed furiously, covering himself with his hands. Saul was already holding the sword with both hands, but she closed her eyes so as not to see the man's death. But when the princess opened her eyes, she saw that there was no blood at all. Cho held his sword so as to kill not a person but a more important enemy, and so lay unconscious like a doll that had been gutted. The sword with which Saul wanted to kill so pierced the package that the merchant showed where his ex-wife was drawn terribly similar to the princess. When the mentor explained that there is no law according to which a sorcerer is considered a full-fledged person, the scroll caught fire, the painting burned, and along with it what was put into it by someone evil and greedy. Cho told Saul that this is a soul absorption technique, and it involves the fact that every time a human heart breaks into pieces, the demon seems to draw lines on it one after another. The master concluded that when the complete picture is completed, he can easily take possession of a person's soul. And as soon as the mentor finished his words and the scroll burned, a black entity appeared in the hall and screamed piercingly, as if from the underworld. Hui understood who they had called and therefore held Princess Soul behind her back with one hand. Hiding the girl behind him, the master had a sword in his other hand, which he pointed towards where the entity was. When Cho swung his sword to awaken his energy, an amethyst train trailed behind the weapon. And after the swings and with his energy, Mentor Cho threw the blade towards the entity. The amethyst beam flew straight into the black clot of demonic power. The sword illuminated the silhouette of a small woman who took the blow of the weapon with her bare hands. The heavy and thick blade of the blade froze in her small hands 
as if she were holding a stick and not a piece of iron. The servant's eyes burned with a red flame, and due to the fact that the human body could not withstand such force, the veins in his hands bulged. In a creepy, hellish voice, little Ryong Ryong looked in the direction of Cho and Soul and growled how they could do this. The princess looked at the girl whom she had recently allowed closest to her and considered her faithful assistant and could not believe how she saw her now. The head of the family, Paikri Chan, also could not believe his eyes and realized that there had been a monster at his side in his family all this time. Mother and son also did not expect such a transformation from the inconspicuous and gray little servant. And then it became clear that Merchant So had no intention of getting married at all, but was only part of the plan. The demon turned to the mentor, asking how he found out about everything. And Cho, smiling, replied that the servant was close to her mistress, but at the same time she watched her train until exhaustion. But Cho made an assumption, unless the demon had other motives to watch the mistress's torment, and the monster was angry that the master knew everything from the very beginning. Saul looked at her savior and couldn't comprehend how he had just managed to understand everything. Cho knew that in order to complete a harmonious marriage union, Pakri Saul had to be mentally and physically exhausted. While the princess stood and looked at Ryong Ryan, whom she trusted with her life, Master Hui understood that the soul absorption technique would only work when free will was completely eliminated through constant suppression and breaking of the mind and body for a long time. The technique is quite difficult to use, but as soon as someone is caught, he becomes a puppet forever, and the demon needed a woman, and Saul was the ideal candidate, because if it were a man, he would be too strong and the technique would not work. The mentor finally remembered among his incarnations that it seemed to him that he had seen Pakri Saul somewhere and realized that in the future, it was she who was called the Red Witch. Chui realized that at that time, the body of the Red Witch was possessed by an evil spirit, and in the future, as a result of this forbidden technique, her body weakened and she died. And having compared what the mentor already knew and knows, he now concluded that this red-haired witch could not leave the body of Salt, who had the talent of heaven. Having completed the dialogue with himself in his head, the teacher smiled and thought that this would never happen again. The demon got tired of waiting and using his power began throwing blows towards Hui and Saul. In front of the mentor and the princess stood the guard who received the first blows of the demon. As far as the guards had enough strength and training, they fought off the demonic blows with their swords. The guards shouted for the others to quickly protect the master and madam and also for the madam and young master to be taken out of here. The guards shouted to each other to stop the demon no matter what and that help would arrive soon. But this did not stop the monster and it continued to cause damage. The master simply stood and, as if playing a sports game, repelled the demon's blows, covering the salt with himself. The princess looked at Hui and asked if he would just stand and watch. While the demon was stronger than all the guards who attacked him, Cho asked Sol if she wanted to help. Sol asked the mentor whether it would be dangerous if the evil spirit escaped and the demon heard this. The princess added that if the light and dark factions find out about this, they can be executed immediately and Cho, scratching the back of his head, said that apparently he has no choice. The demon made an effort to repel the last guards and turned towards the exit. The spirit bared its teeth and warned that today he would leave, but for what they had done, he would never forgive. The demon ran to the exit and Hui, sighing heavily, told the spirit that nothing could be done and shouted to listen to his order. The master told the demon to look at him and the evil spirit obeying stopped at the door. The demon turned to the one who was stronger, and looked at him with his red, cursed eyes. The spirit saw a man who was blazing with an amethyst flame, showing that he was a difficult person. Poor Ryan's face looked terrible from the presence of the spirit in her body, but the demon, as indicated, looked at the mentor. The master calmly continued to be in the same place and said the next order to obey him. Because of the order to submit, the body turned black like coal, and the red eyes were not visible, and the spirit screamed furiously. The demon grabbed his face with his hands where his eyes were and let out terrible screams. In pain, the spirit tore his face with his hands and screamed because his eyes were burning alive. The demon bent over and continued to scream, and his pitch-black eyes fell into his hands. Hui stood and watched the torment of the evil spirit while continuing to radiate his power. Due to the fact that the body was human, tears flowed from the empty eye sockets and the demon wanted to say something about this man. But the thoughts and words of the spirit were interrupted by the master's last word, and he commanded the demon to disappear, after which Du gritted his teeth and the body began to collapse. The human shell splashed with blood as if the body was being torn apart from the inside. 
The mentor just stood idly by and watched as the remains of the man fell, illuminating the entire room with amethyst light. The red ribbon that held the guy's hair broke, just like every time he uses his power. The ribbon was torn due to the fact that the master's hair stood up along with the energy that he released. Cho stood and looked in front of him, and in complete darkness, along with his whole body, bright amethyst eyes glowed. When the threat of the demon had passed and the night had truly become calm, Master Hui headed to the only place he thought was safe. Teacher Mei was fast asleep and was already dreaming her tenth dream when footsteps were heard along the corridor towards her room. But Mei jumped out of bed only when she heard three loud knocks on her door, and at first was shocked that someone was breaking into her door in the middle of the night. Since the mentor knew how to stand up for herself, she stood up and walked to the door, pushing it aside, but was doubly stunned when she saw who was standing behind it. Mei looked at Master Cho, who was holding Bakery Soul in his arms and also unconscious, and this picture immediately raised a lot of questions in her head. To begin with, Mei decided to at least ask what happened, but even to this single question, Hui said that he would answer later in detail. Cho apologized for such a spontaneous and late visit, but said that the situation was emergency and no one could take better care of the girl now than the mentor. So far, only Hui knew what a shock everything that happened in her house had been for Seoul and how seriously it could affect her condition both physically and spiritually. But now, the master knew how to communicate and behave with Pekri, considering that she had experienced bullying from a family whose members were under mind control. But the most terrible shock for the young lady was that the nanny whom she trusted the most and allowed the closest to her turned out to be possessed by a demon. Although Mentor Cho had seen everything in all his incarnations, he was understanding of the fact that young Saul was unable to accept the reality she faced. May approached her student and gently placed her hand on her forehead, removing the worries that Pakri was injured, because she clearly saw that she was simply tired and fast asleep. Although Saul had slept, her face still showed the experience from which she had passed out, and now, sighing heavily, she could probably still see all that horror before her eyes. Teacher May covered the girl with a blanket as carefully as possible and gradually Soul's breathing evened out, at least because she began to warm up. Hui stood there all this time, stretching his arms with a dissatisfied expression on his face, after which he complained out loud in a whisper that he barely carried the student, even though he had strong arms. As always being straightforward, just blurt out what this young lady eats if she's already quite heavy today. And then, although also in a whisper, May's angry voice was heard from the side, and if Saul had not been sleeping, she would have really shouted at the mentor. May put her hands on her hips and made a remark to the master that he should learn manners and a softer attitude towards his students. But Cho did not understand what the problem was at all, because he was sure that he already communicated quite nicely. Quietly screaming, May indignantly replied that there could be no talk of any mercy here, and then Hui realized that perhaps that was enough for today, since he was at risk of getting caught. The master made one last attempt and assured May that he really did know how to say some nice things to people. May, being a mentor, remained a girl, and girls are always curious about what cute things a man could say, and she asked Hui to give an example. You could say that Hui suddenly became immortal since he thought of telling his colleague that she looked very cute in her pajamas, and in fact, even if she had done something to him, he really did have medicine. But May immediately grabbed the first thing that came to hand and threw it at the impudent fellow, who had almost disappeared without a trace. Even though no one had yet started walking around the Dongchen residence, with the sunrise and the birds flying above it, it already looked alive and bubbling with energy. But Master Hui didn't quite agree with Dongchen and his energy, especially after a rather productive night when he had to kill the demon. Like a blow to the head of Cho, the loud and joyful voice of the head of Zhong, which at that moment shone brighter than the sun, hit him and at the same time kindly greeted the guy, calling him for the first time his dear mentor. Not yet fully awake, Hui had no idea what the hell was going on, and immediately asked the chief what had happened or, perhaps it would be more correct, what he had done again. Zhong looked like he had knocked over a cup of sake for his friend because he had hugged the new guy he had once hated and even said that nothing had happened and that he simply liked the whole cool mentor, and Hui asked if he had eaten something spoiled for lunch. Still smiling and in a great mood, Zhang said that nothing had happened and that lunch had nothing to do with it. The leader was beside himself with happiness, expressing gratitude to the master for personally going to the home of the student Pekri Sol, and Hui, just in case, asked again whether there was really so much joy just because of this. Zhang barely contained his emotions as he explained to the young man that he had misheard 
and that the head of the Baikri family had admitted that his daughter's departure from school was a mistake. So he withdrew his application and asked him to continue to take care of her and also expressed his gratitude. In front of Cho stood not the head, but a satisfied child who was surprised how the mentor managed to achieve such a result after visiting the Pekri house once, because the head of the family is an experienced swordsman and rarely thanks anyone, and even less so about changing his mind. Zhang was bursting with curiosity about how the young man was able to accomplish something that at first glance seemed impossible or at least difficult to achieve. Hui scratched his head, realizing that it would be a little difficult to explain to the head how everything actually happened while staying in Pekri's house. The young man, thinking rationally, realized that he could not tell Zhong how he came to the house and defeated the famous master. He also broke the connection between him as a puppet and between the demon as a puppeteer. And by the way, he also killed the demon. Zhong clearly wouldn't believe that someone like Hui could kick the great swordsman with his foot and he would fall like a sack of vegetables. But the head was so delighted that without waiting for an answer from the mentor, he continued to tell him that Mr. Chan highly appreciated Hui and promised him a promotion in the future which meant resignation in Inchen. It turns out that this was the most important and joyful event that the head was so eager for, which is why he told all the news and laughed loudly, unable to bear the overflow of feelings inside. Meanwhile, Saul was sitting on a chair in the room, combing her long hair and looking somewhere into space. At some point, the young lady became despondent, lowering her head and stopping combing her hair, and froze, which indicated her gradual return to reality. Sol felt sad from the memories of how Ryan Ryan braided her hair and from these pleasant and warm feelings she almost fell asleep on the go. The lady also recalled how Ryan sewed up her things so that she would have something to train in while she herself was preparing for classes. Although the nanny, as it turned out, protected Peckery from Master Hui from her own bad intentions, it was still the only protection at that time, unlike her relatives. And the last time when the girl burst into tears during training because she was exhausted and upset that nothing was working out, Ryan was still there and supported her. Salt began to cry both from the grief of loss and from the acceptance of reality, simultaneously letting go of what had weighed on her so much and freeing herself from the stress she had experienced. And so the young lady rushed at full speed to her mentor in a state of complete combat readiness to study the new and improve the old. Folding her hands in greeting, the lady, like a new penny, happily announced that the student of Bakery Soul had returned to the Dongqian Martial Arts School. Master Cho rarely does this, but this time he smiled at his student and praised her, saying that he was glad to see her here again in such a good mood. Not only did Soul manage to dance with the sword, but she also asked her mentor, at the same time, how to best master the technique. But without receiving an answer from the master, the young lady herself noticed that if she made a swing of the sword as she showed, it would turn out better than before. For the first time in such a long time, Cho sat and really looked at his student with interest, feeling proud of the young talent. Watching Sol perform the technique, Huey assumed that she had recovered, thereby gaining strength and confidence. Seeing how Pekri began to succeed, the mentor showed her a reference book and asked if she knew the name of the presented fencing art but the student replied that she did not know because she received a book where not only the letters but also the cover were erased. Due to her young age and lack of experience like her mentor, Pekri thought that the names of sword techniques were not that important, but Cho convinced her otherwise. The mentor argued his opinion by saying that often the name of the techniques is not just for beauty, but to show its content. And the master praised the student for how quickly she figured out the content of the techniques using examples of the technique of the surpassed chaos of the sword, where it was necessary to apply colossal efforts, or the technique of plum blossom, where lightness and dexterity are important. Looking at the manual with the technique, Master Cho indicated that this martial art was called Phoenix Flame Dance, which surprised Pekri, and she asked again if it wasn't the ascension of the white crane. At that moment, Hui realized that although Ryong Ryong tried to control the lady like a puppet, at the level of intuition, she still remembered the basics of the technique, which meant that the master could completely take her under his wing. Now Cho took it upon himself to explain to Sul that she needed to train by concentrating her thoughts on a higher being instead of practicing basic skills, and the young lady did not quite understand what was meant by thinking about a higher being. The master, as if introducing the girl, clarified that the phoenix or the red falcon has always been the personification of immortality and also showed her the reason why he was telling all this, 
and she was in the fact that she needed to learn to finish this dance with swords in one breath. After these words, Sol froze with her eyes wide open from understanding what would happen if she were to train in the Phoenix technique, and it would be nothing more than getting closer to the flame goddess, Jang Ok Bin. Teacher Cho immediately confirmed to his student that she was thinking in the absolutely right direction regarding what she could achieve. With a sly smile on his face, the master pointed his finger at Sol and said that training the Phoenix technique would be their secret, which in its own way caught the young lady's attention. Chui mentally asked the student to train hard because in that case, she would become another one of her trees that would grow well without supervision. Thoughts about hard training disappeared a week later when the mentor came to Saul's student's training and was truly surprised by what he saw. Young Mrs. Peckery, after only a week, showed results that were difficult to achieve after months of hard work. Cho was a little taken aback by the fact that Saul had essentially reached almost the culmination of the technique, and this once again confirmed that the girl was talented enough for the Red Flame Witch to pursue her for more than ten years. But everything was not so chic, and there was one hitch in Peckery that Hui noticed, namely her haste, so the observation still had to be continued. After all, you can't get by in training on talent alone. So supervision was also needed, since Cho understood that the lady had started late and problems could arise. It would seem that the master had just been filled with pride for his student, but now he was clutching his head from what was following Peckery's success. The poor guy burst into tears because the faster and better his students become, the less time he has to search for his beloved. While Saul was taking a break and wiping her face from sweat, Nam Gung started training next to her and the girl asked him if he had seen the master since he had literally just been sitting on the bench. The young man did not expect to see the young lady, so at first there was silent surprise instead of an answer to the question. But after thinking about it, Nam Gung answered Sol that knowing the master, at such times he usually went to the dining room and this surprised the girl. But the guy said that for Mr. Hui it was normal practice to spend time there after work. Peckery explained her surprise by the fact that just recently the mentor had eaten, so why did he need to go there again? To which the young man replied that it could be a matter of habit, because even if he didn't eat, he just sat at the entrance. Sol's curiosity overflowed, and she asked Nam Gung why the mentor was hanging around the dining room, to which he replied that he didn't know, but he would also be interested in seeing. It was already getting dark and the boys headed to the dining room to catch their mentor, and finally solved the mystery of his eternal presence there. As Nam Gung said, their master really stood at the entrance, unlike the people who were leaving and coming and simply watched. Hui carefully looked among all those who were in the dining room for the one he had to find, and so he chose the place and time so as to be at the very peak of the presence of people in the dining room. At some point, Cho caught the eye of one of the silhouettes among many other people, but for now, it was limited to just a glance. The incredibly familiar clothes and long, dark hair hadn't yet pulled the trigger for Hui to run after the girl, but he was at a low start. And when the person turned in profile, it was like a sign from above for the guy to break loose and run to the one he was looking for. Cho stood with his mouth open and looked at such a painfully familiar silhouette, not fully understanding whether it was true or whether he was already imagining it due to his nerves in order to have time. The master finally ran up to the man and grabbed him by the shoulder, asking him to stop for a second, and nothing mattered anymore, and everything was like in a fog. And even though it was a girl, Cho realized when she turned around that it wasn't her, and he removed his hand from his shoulder so as not to make the moment even more awkward. The young man immediately asked for forgiveness for the disturbance, raising his hands in front of himself, showing that he was very uncomfortable with the current situation. As he left the dining room, Hui scratched the back of his head, feeling uncomfortable and realizing that even in the past, the lady was too good to work in Dongcheon. Turning to the dining hall with some kind of false hope, Cho realized that if he had understood how difficult it would be to look for the mistress, he would have listened to her more attentively, especially to stories from childhood. There was just one more problem with listening carefully, which was due to the specific circumstances that had developed at that time. Hui clearly remembered how he met the one, and they were initially enemies, which as a consequence influenced the indifference to the history of man. The guy treated the girl as one of those and thought of her as one of those whom he had already killed and forgotten. But the situation changed dramatically when problems with the Manchion cult arose. The entry of the Manchion cult into the battlefield turned everything around so that opponents became friends and vice versa. Supporters turned into enemies. And then, quite logically, being in a meat grinder, neither one of them wanted to discuss anything from their lives, 
but at the same time, the young master and mistress were united by a common enemy towards whom they pointed their swords standing side by side. The man who had recently wiped the demon off the face of the earth now took out his anger on a stone that he kicked and cursed in despair. Hui grabbed his head and like a wounded animal furiously screamed that everything would have been different if it weren't for those idiots from the Manchin cult. Although if you think about it, it was those guys who helped him find the love of his life. The young man was overcome with panic because he knew the only fact about his beloved, and that was a name change to escape the past. But at this point in time, she should still have the old name. We understood that the girl had changed her name to avoid problems associated with the Manchin cult, but he reproached himself for not having thought to find out even a small fact about her past that would have been a clue now, and instead of talking, they simply fought on trust. The pot was boiling so much that the master stopped at the wall and holding it with one hand and his head with the other, he thought about the death of his past self, who was an idiot since he now knows nothing about his beloved because even the age that he knows is approximate. Fee's despair had already manifested itself in physics, and the poor fellow was bent over, but he still held onto the wall with his hand, calculating that he didn't know his name or exact age. The only fact that came to mind was that the lady treated the mentor as a junior, and this gave her a reason to joke about him, and immediately after this thought, Cho felt as if someone had doused him with cold water when he thought that he might not recognize her. Having shaken his head thoroughly, the young man realized that this was already too much, and such thoughts would not lead to anything good, especially since it would not be possible to lose sight of the girl since they had spent a lot of time together. Having stopped the snowball that was growing from all the terrible thoughts, Cho took a deep breath and exhaled, and looking at the sky, he firmly determined that he would definitely recognize her even if she did not recognize him and simply passed by. The mentor felt even more at ease when he confidently told himself that he remembered the girl's words about her being here at this time. Also, hope was not completely lost because the master did not study all the students and other teachers in Dongcheon, so there is still a chance of a meeting. But the task of checking everyone who was in Danshan was also not an easy one, and Cho, heading to his place, grabbed his head again, realizing what a huge job he had to do. Before Kui had time to go far from the dining room, someone called him from behind, expressing their surprise at meeting the mentor here. When Cho turned around, he saw that the voice belonged to teacher Mo Yan, and she, walking towards him, said that quite a lot of time had passed since their last meeting. Master Hui also greeted the teacher and agreed that they really hadn't seen each other for a long time, and in order to keep the conversation going, he asked how the lady had arrived in Dongchon, to which she said about meeting with Mei, but she had been called somewhere with Yom, so she was already getting ready to leave. Cho's teeth clenched at the mere mention of that toad Yoma and he got angry at him out loud, thinking that he had decided to screw him over again. But Mentor Mo assured the master that there were no plans there, and shared that she had heard about a gathering of a large number of Donghyeon's mentors, but it turned out that only Hui was not aware of it. The young man spread his arms out to the sides and confirmed that he had indeed not heard about any gatherings. But it didn't matter to him, because if it was something important, then he would find out about everything one way or another. And Mo was amused by the fact that Hui had not changed, and she suggested that since they were already here, they should eat together and talk. When food and drinks were placed on the table, Mo's mentor, as the initiator of the conversation, began it, indicating that rumors about H. Wee's active work as a mentor had reached her. Mo Yan mentioned how Master Cho was able to bring Bakery Soul back to school and also receive gratitude from her family. And the news about this was so sensational that even in Incheon it was flying around like hotcakes. And Kavi, having drained the cup with the drink, although he was surprised by such news, did so with his usual coldness and indifference. And since the young people came not only to talk but also to eat, Cho did just that, appetizingly savoring the dishes that were on the table. Although Teacher Mo was embarrassed, she was touched to see how good the young man's appetite was. Cho's speech took on a lisping character due to his mouth being full, but it was possible to understand that he asked the lady what she wanted to talk about and that it would be possible to get to the heart of the matter. But Mo, no matter how nice it was for her to look at Huai, asked him not to speak with his mouth full. As the master had asked, Mo Yan got down to business and said directly whether Cho would like to accept another student. While Hui was tearing his cheeks apart to eat the tasty piece of meat whole, Mo explained that if we go by May's words, he likes those students with whom you don't have to bother too much. And the young man agreed with this judgment. When the mentor answered affirmatively, Mo told him that she had a student with good potential. Cho immediately realized that if a girl spoke like that about a student, 
then it was a child from the Mo Yan family. And the lady confirmed that the girl is really very wonderful and was not even afraid of this word, the cutest child in her family. And the baby's name is Mo Yan Sohi, and she is very bright and active. Hui said that the child, according to the teacher, was charming. But at the same time, he said that he already had a similar student, also with good qualities and full of strength. And Mo decided to assume that it was not about Nam Gung Yun Ho. Master Cho made it clear that he meant bakery soul, which greatly surprised the lady, and she could not hide the fact that such an answer was truly unexpected. Mo mentally concluded for herself that it was Sol, who was bullied by students and masters because she always considered herself special, who truly became such a student for her mentor. Returning from her thoughts to a conversation with Cho, the girl explained that Sohei was talented and full of energy, but the problem was that her family kept her away from martial arts and did not allow her to develop her talent and Hui immediately asked what the reason was. Mo felt uneasy sharing such a revelation, but there was nowhere to go, and she explained that Sohi's mother died while getting carried away by the world of martial arts. Continuing to gobble up the food, Cho repeated the girl's name in his head, but realized that he didn't remember it and continued to look closely at Mo. It is quite logical that the master became interested in why the mentor asked him to do her a favor, and she explained that she was told about the eyes of a specialist who can recognize talents and now she can't wait to see what comes out of it. The next day after Hui and Mo's conversation, a 14-year-old girl, Mo Yan Sohai, came to the training ground, and in the master's opinion, she turned out to be quite smart. Cho sat on the bench and watched a very cute picture of how, among his other two students, who were already quite grown up, the new student looked like a real child. The master never got up from the bench, but simply leaned closer, looking attentively at the girl, and only now pretended to understand who she was and repeated the name. What was a little confusing was that Sohi was very small, although if you believe her words that she was 14, then she was only a year younger than Sul, and the master did not understand whether the child was eating poorly. We summed up the whole situation with one word, good, and added that he heard about Sohei from Mo Yan's mentor, and the girl, although nervously, confirmed that everything was correct. Looking at the baby, the master concluded that she looked more like a frightened puppy than the cheerful cutie that Mo described to him. Cho tried to look nice so as not to scare the girl even more and asked her to first show what she knows and can do today. Sol and Yun Ho stepped aside, standing next to the master to make room on the platform for the young talent, standing as far away as possible to avoid injuring anyone. So he folded her arms as one does before training and shouted loudly that she was ready to begin. Watching such a little girl even with a training sword was quite a task, and the hardest thing was to take her seriously. Besides the fact that Sohi moved quite funny compared to how Sol and Namgung had already done, she also made no less funny sounds. Master Hui's face showed how out of it he was from what he was seeing on the court right now, and he couldn't believe that this was all Sohi could do. Making his eyes even wider, Cho did not hesitate to ask the little girl if she really could do anything else. So he stood still and reported that she had learned several more techniques, including the martial art of the dagger and the golden art of the sword. But Hui said that he was not sure about the golden art of the sword, but asked if she had learned the martial art of the dagger by heart. The little girl confidently explained that, from what she had heard, it would be very useful to master the basics of self-defense, such as taekwondo or judo. Cho did not lose hope, and agreeing with Soe's opinion, asked her to show these skills as well to which the student replied like a soldier that she was starting to perform them. Again, it seems like movements from techniques, but they are uncertain and funny. And in addition to them, the same sounds after each sharp swing or jump. And when it came to the dagger, it really did resemble either a monkey with a grenade or a child who was trying to show how formidable he was. Hui sat in a stupor, admitting to himself for now that the spectacle of the skills that Sohei had shown was pathetic and terrible. But Cho would not be the one who is said to be able to recognize talent if he had not taken a closer look at the fact that the little girl's technique and hand movements were not bad, but there was one but. And this but consisted of the students being at an intermediate level, possibly due to the fact that she had only studied the basics, while Cho came to the conclusion that by directing this sprout in the right direction, it would be possible to achieve excellent results in the techniques that she had already learned. And still there was one more problem that Hui didn't know how to deal with yet, and looking at the girl, he realized that it was her character. Sighing heavily and lowering his head, acquiring a dejected look, the master decided in his head that there would be too much trouble with the new student, and Sohei herself noticed this. 
The little one was terribly upset by the mere sight of her mentor after her demonstration techniques, and the first thing that came to her mind was the wrongness of everything she did. While Huai was looking disappointed, putting his hand to his face, Sohei looked at him and remembered that this was an unusual mentor who finds those students who have hidden talents. And knowing the fact about the master, about his ability to select, the young lady thought whether she had a chance on him. So she asked Mo to give her the opportunity to show herself, but feeling awkward and sad, the little girl also lowered her head, losing hope for training. Both the mentor, who could not recover from his stupor, and the student, who had already buried her talents, were distracted by a loud cracking sound in the wood, and they simultaneously looked in the direction from which the sound came. At the training pole stood exactly the same frozen pole in the form of Nam Gung, who understood that he was about to get into trouble, but all he could do was gasp. The top of the pole lay on a tiled floor, all cracked, and the floor, by the way, was also not in the best condition. So he was genuinely shocked that the guy was able to break the training dummy without realizing how much effort it took to do so. And the next realization that made my jaw drop was that the mannequin was made of that same strong wood that is called steel. It didn't take long for the mentor to give him a kick in the ass, as well as his insults towards Nam Gung, saying that he was a puppy and a clumsy bastard. Cho asked Nam Gung again what he had done, although he had already seen everything himself, but he had to teach him a lesson from the furious mentor and added that his salary was now lying on the ground and an explanation of how it happened. Poor Yun Ho holding his head because it hurt and at the same time covering himself from the next blows like a kitten quietly squeaked that he had hit him lightly, but the evil coach sarcastically replied that of course that was how it was. When Nam Gung tried to convince the master again that he really tried to hit weaker, he surprisingly said that he believed him and asked him to stand still because now he would also hit weakly. And so he looked at all this without understanding what the problem was. The little girl turned away from watching the student being beaten and turned her attention to the broken part of the mannequin. While Hui was still kicking Yun Ho in the ass and cursing him like crazy, and he was covering himself by asking for forgiveness and shouting out how much it hurt. So he called out to the mentor while holding a part of the mannequin in her hands. Cho turned questioningly to the girl while she, with an unreal and titanic effort, lifted the mannequin, which no longer looked broken. Today was a day of impressions for the mentor because his face showed genuine surprise at what he saw. We couldn't understand what the hell happened that the mannequin became whole again, nor how this little girl was able to fix it and lift it up. Soon, thanks to Soha's explanations to everyone, what and how she did everything became clear as day. The little girl showed clearly right away on the mannequin where he had a small seam. And if Sol and Master Cho listened attentively and understood what was being said, then Nam Gung, although he listened, even scratched the back of his head because he still could not understand how it happened. And Soki continued to lay out on the shelves, immediately showing that if you remove the broken part and make a recess in the remaining part, then there is a chance to fix it, but with more severe damage, it will be difficult to restore. The little one also mentioned that the mannequin was specially made for its purposes, which means it can be repaired, and when Sohei saw so many looks on herself, she became embarrassed but was proud of herself, asking that it was not at all noticeable that the mannequin was broken. When the little girl saw the mentor's face, she was afraid that something was wrong again, and poor Kavi was shaking. But he couldn't say a word at first. But in order not to mislead the student, he was grateful to her with tears in his eyes for the fact that he would live, because he was sure that he would not see his monthly salary again. The snotty feeling gave way to anger because three months had passed since Kavi had started working as a mentor, and during that time he had not seen a penny. The students didn't need to know this, but Cho decided to complain out loud that the asshole Yun Ho did nothing but break the mannequins, and the master hoped that at least this month he would get his salary until something broke again. Having pulled himself together, the mentor asked the student to allow him to take responsibility for her, which shocked Sohei. The student began to list all her shortcomings in the form of a slight dexterity and the ability to only repair mannequins or remember the most common techniques, asking whether the master would really teach her despite this. And Hui replied that there was nothing shameful in the above and that this would be enough for a start, because it was pointless to compare yourself with someone who only breaks everything and leaves his master without a salary, which made Nam Gun feel ashamed and Saul giggled. Little Sohe wanted to ask something about her martial art. But Master Cho asked her mid-sentence to continue fixing the dummies and that would be enough. Making a super cute and friendly face, the mentor promised that in return, he would teach the student something that would help her kill anyone who dared to harm her. So he did not think for long, 
but bowed and agreed to the conditions that the mentor put forward to her. Immediately after the verbal agreement between the student and the master, a question was heard at the entrance to the site, asking what had happened here from a man whom everyone except Namgung had seen for the first time. A man entered the site who looked neither like a master nor a student, given his bright and luxurious clothes. The young gentleman raised his hand in greeting and addressed Namgung specifically, asking how he was doing at school. Yun Ho wasn't particularly happy to see his friend, and all he could squeeze out was J. Kaltan's full name, thereby showing that he shouldn't blurt out anything unnecessary. While he didn't understand anything, and hugging his friend said that they hadn't seen each other for a long time. Not paying attention to everyone else, even to say a basic hello as if they weren't there, Tan continued to communicate only with Yun, asking why the firstborn of the Namgung family looked like a beaten dog. Then smiling, Tan only managed to ask his friend about Master Cho, whether this was the person he was talking about, again being so impudent that he pretended not to notice the person, and Yun immediately asked his friend to bite his tongue. But Kal Tan briefly replied that he had no need to stand on ceremony with someone he had not yet recognized as his mentor. Namgung stood and looked at the one who was getting closer and closer to his death, or at least to the same appearance as his. Salt also noticed the young man's reckless selflessness, but sarcastically turned it into false praise for the monkey's bravery. And here Tan finally changed his wide smile and impudence to at least a questioning expression on his face, not understanding what the student meant. In this case, Kui was in charge of the parade on this site, so noticing the new guy's strange mood, he asked what was going on. Tan nevertheless, with a lordly air, asked the master whether he was the one who was taking the uncut diamonds for himself. Cho bowed and replied that indeed he was the mentor who selected talented students for himself. The air smelled of something fried, and both Sol and Yun realized this, looking at how the situation became more dangerous with every word Tan said. Tan voiced that he would also like to study with the mentor, but he immediately cut him off with an apology that the recruitment of his students had ended just before the arrival of the newcomer. The cream of society heard a refusal for the first time, and for Tan the answer was so unexpected that he repeated to himself questioningly that the recruitment was over. But for Master Hui, repeating his answer was not a problem, so he once again confirmed to Tan that the recruitment was closed. The mentor gave Soya a little fright when he took her hands in his, and introduced her as his third disciple and the invincible candidate, Mo Yon Sohye. The young gentleman asked dismissively whether the master was really going to teach a little girl who still had milk on her lips. Cho didn't even turn to the new guy and didn't react to such a remark in any way, but continued to look at Soha, who in turn noticed how the young man's fist clenched in anger that they weren't reacting to him. The little girl turned her gaze to the master, but thanks to the fact that he remained level, she was able to withstand this onslaught. But Sol and Yun looked at Tan, realizing that if he blurted out something out of place now, it would be bad for him. Tan hissed in displeasure and put his fake smile on his face again as a sign that since he was not welcome here, he would not stay long. The young gentleman decided to be the first to end the conversation, so he expressed his desire to stop today on this note. Passing by the master, Tang threw him a word that he understood that he would like to continue to look worthy in the eyes of his students. The young man also didn't want to leave himself without attention. So he emphasized that he was not some kind of heartless cracker who would do something to ruin the relationship on his first day in Dongcheon. As he was leaving, Tan, without even turning around, pompously addressed his mentor with a request to be more judicious in making decisions next time, since he was not in favor of blood being spilled in Dongcheon. When His Majesty Arrogance left the stage, Master Cho remained standing in place, silently enduring all the theater that took place in the person of one actor and did not even look after him. Yun Ho realized that he urgently needed to go have dinner and only then return, so he headed for the exit. But the mentor decided a little differently and asked the student to wait and not rush, since it was still too early for dinner. Of course, Nam Gung understood that it was better to freeze in place since there was a risk of getting punched again, and Hui asked if it was his friend just now. Sol gripped the training sword as tightly as ever and turning to the mentor said that he did not need such a student, and they did not need such a training buddy, and asked only to say how she would immediately finish off the bastard. And Namgung was already prepared for another beating, mentally cursing at Jekaltan so much that the poor guy was clearly already hiccuping somewhere. After some time, Sohei stood next to the mentor who was carefully examining the mannequins and turned to him with thoughts that were troubling her about that student. And Hui asked the invincible healer of the mannequins to clarify. The little girl was upset that the master had refused that student. But Cho smiled and asked curiously, 
why she thought so. So he, although she was young, already knew about the guy's bad reputation in Incheon, because there he was called a hunter of instructors, and therefore, even in appearance, he was more capable than her. But this was all in her thoughts. But in fact, while Sohei was thinking about what to answer, Hui took her hands in his and said that the student had nothing to worry about. It was not for nothing that Cho took the girl's hands in his, because the next moment he pressed on certain points and two clicks occurred. The master, smiling broadly, asked Sohei to move his hand to check if everything was okay, but in fact he knew what he was doing and it was more of a reassurance for her. Judging by the way the student reacted, this was her first experience, and she asked again what the mentor meant. Shui saw Sohei's lack of understanding, so he took it and showed the necessary movements on his hands, and the girl began to figure out how to repeat it. The student started with one hand, sincerely not understanding why all this was happening, but when she tried to move it, she was surprised by the effect. So he admitted that she felt such lightness in her hands as never before, as if she was moving someone else's fingers. The little one admitted that it was incredible, because every time she took the sword in her hands, the pain disappeared, and Hui assured her that from now on he would take care of this important detail. Folding her hands in gratitude and bowing to Soha, she now definitely believed that this was not a dream and that the mentor would really take care of her. Meanwhile, from the place where the masters were called, shouts could be heard in the direction of the director asking whether it made sense why they had gathered. The loudest was, of course, the Toad Yom, expressing his indignation at how they could send a student here who had caused trouble in Incheon. Yom didn't stop asking question after question about whether that student shouldn't have just been kicked out and, in general, why the head agreed to such an unprecedented thing. Zhong remained silent because, in fact, Yom was telling the truth, and then he asked if the leader hadn't heard about the mentor hunter, but he replied that it would be impossible not to know about such a thing. The situation was complicated, and because of her isolation, Zhong hid his face, burning with shame that he could not refuse, since the head of Inchen himself asked for it. Yom was angry but understood that it really wouldn't be possible to refuse, but he knew that the director had agreed only to look decent in the eyes of the head of Incheon. Jung opened his hand slightly like a little child who was afraid of being spanked and told Yom to think carefully about whether it was not the duty of a mentor to guide the student on the right path. The toad's jaw clenched from the fact that he was simply left with no choice, but he still didn't understand why he would have to take the rap. The tension in Yom's head only grew because he knew that even if he forgot that Tan was considered a problem in his family and his sister and brother were capable, he was still strong enough to defeat the instructor, and if he was reined in, then the family would also get involved. At stake was Yom's authority and the discipline in Dongchon that he had built, because if the guy did something crazy and the master tried to put pressure on him, his family would intervene. So after all the thinking, he directly asked what they were suggesting he do. The discontent of one affected the others, and the masters began to jump up from their seats and shout that it is possible to set someone on the right path only with selflessness, and that using violence against a mentor is generally bad form. The masters rebelled against accepting J. Kal Tan into Dong Cheon school, calling him trash that needed to be gotten rid of, and Yom was just watching the headmaster when the others finished him off. Suddenly the door to the hall where the meeting was being held opened and the one who came did not even knock before that. Being on edge, all the masters turned to the doors, shouting at the one who came, how dare this man burst in like this in the middle of the meeting. But when they saw who had come into the hall, everyone suddenly fell silent, and such silence reigned that you could hear everyone's breathing. The very hero of the discussions appeared in all his glory, asking from the doorway whether he had greatly disturbed their meeting. Everyone suddenly became good boys and spoke very humbly, while being terribly nervous and even lowering their heads. But the wolf was already looking at the flock of sheep with an appraising glance, and eventually came to the conclusion that there was nothing special about them. Tan walked past all the masters and even past the head as if it was his domain, while demonstratively tapping his folded fan on his hand. And so the wolf approached the largest and most delicious sheep, carefully examining his future victim. Tan smiled sarcastically, asking if this was really the same teacher Yom to whom he would be assigned as a student. Poor Yom nervously and hesitantly answered that it was indeed him, although in fact he really wanted to lie. The young master immediately warned the mentor responsible for him that he had a hot temper and was not always able to control himself. So Tan apologized in advance for any possible inconvenience in the future. Although Yomu was scared at the beginning, now he was more irritated by the way this asshole allowed himself to treat him. One of the mentors also could not stand such impudent behavior, 
and getting up from the table made a remark to Tan that his address to the teachers was going beyond all bounds. The guy pretended not to understand what the conversation was about, but the master continued to teach Tan that even though he had arrived for a short time, he should follow the rules of conduct between a teacher and a student. The mentor also pointed out the manifestation of respect and obedience that comes from the student following his words. And suddenly, the young master laughed, contradicting everything he had just been asked to do. Tan's smile suddenly disappeared, and he decided to turn the situation to his advantage by asking if it had really become the norm to treat students like trash. The mentor did not give up his position, making another remark to the young man about not forgetting where he was and who he was being rude to. To everyone's surprise, the student held out a folded fan right in front of the master's nose and he too clenched his fist. So holding a fan in front of the teacher, Tang warned him that in order to treat him as a teacher, it was necessary to first check whether he had the right to be considered as such. It was a blow below the belt and the master's words threw the student off track so much that he didn't even know what to answer. But Tan decided not to stop, and this time, he gave the teacher a verbal slap in the face, asking how he could take him more seriously and respectfully if he was weaker than him, and immediately offered to test the mentor's abilities. The emotional component took over and the master went overboard shouting at the guy, but that was all he needed, and now he could continue to bombard him with questions like whether he was really so unsure of himself that he wouldn't engage in a fight with the student. This time, Yom rose from the table, briefly and clearly telling Jay Kaltan to stop this one-man show and finally start watching his words. The doors to the conference room opened again without knocking, just like the first time the young gentleman entered. The discussion that arose between Yom and Tan stopped because it was more interesting who had burst into the meeting. The other mentors, including the director, froze in such wild incomprehension that no one even shouted about the brazen appearance. Cho who with a satisfied face dragged four mannequins shouting to the chief that he was able to repair them all, stunned everyone. And when there was no answer, the mentor opened his eyes, looking at the same return glances and asked what was going on here. The way everyone suddenly fell silent was like the calm before the storm. But Hui stood there, waiting for an answer, not embarrassed, and did not go anywhere. And then, that very storm fell in the form of the shedding of the purest anger of the head of Zhong, who turned red as a lobster, shouting to the newcomer where he had gathered so much courage and impudence to burst in like that. But Master Cho was delighted by such words, and smiling broadly, confirmed what the director had said about his behavior, since he had already heard similar things said about himself many times. Zhang, seething, slammed his hand on the table and explained to the young man that he had not been complimented, and then asked why the hell he had missed the morning meeting, since yesterday he had been told to come after work to receive an important message. Almost releasing steam from his nostrils like a dragon, Zhang threateningly asked the young man if he had really come to this job to do nothing but eat, sleep, and fix mannequins. Now Kivi was in a stupor and explained for his part that he was given to understand that repairing mannequins was now more important than other activities and the chief barked that he had blurted out such nonsense. Cho hesitated for a second to answer, realizing what this would lead to, but turning his gaze to the culprit, he said that the order was given by Teacher Yom. The dragon director awakened in all his glory, releasing fire at Yuma, wanting to know what the master wanted to achieve with such actions, and whether he was still suffering from nonsense in the form of mockery of new mentors. Any emotion is contagious, and now the toad was angry at Hui, and gritting his teeth, he looked at the guy thinking about how this puppy was turning everything to his advantage while Zhang sat putting his hand to his face, experiencing unbearable shame for these two idiots. Yumu felt uneasy, because the guy had gotten lucky again. And if he had known yesterday that mentoring Je Kao Tan could have been pushed on to Cho, he wouldn't have assigned him to fix the mannequins and wouldn't have given him any tasks at all. Kvi had no time for these small talks, so he again first of all thought about himself and threw the mannequins on the floor, saying that in any case, he had completed the task assigned to him. But the climax of it all was that the foreman, although politely, asked to remove the penalty points as the head and promised to do so, and his teeth gnashed from what he heard. The director's second wave of anger was ignored by Cho, and he decided to add that from now on, there would be no problems with repairing the mannequins, and if necessary, he would bring at least ten of them next time. The dragon had to become active again, because this was the only way the young man could understand that it was time for him to leave. Otherwise, there would be trouble. And the mentor, clutching his head, ran away only when the leader, in his tried and tested manner, 
began throwing at him everything he had at hand, which included notebooks and a brush. While Tan was looking after that same mentor who was unbending under him, the unhappy director was sitting at the table, clutching his head and worrying that one day he would finally kick the bucket with such idiots. The young gentleman became even more interested now in what kind of person he was who managed to radically change the situation for a moment. The most important trigger for action for Tan was the comments from other teachers that this new guy was coming in and driving the principal crazy in seconds. And now the gentleman had a good reason for the decision in the form of arguments that the mentor really was not like everyone else, and moreover, Yun Ho praised him. Regarding the entire situation, Zhe Kao Tan uttered one single word, interesting, before continuing his thought. And when attention was again turned to Tan, he turned to teacher Yumu with one very unexpected request for everyone present. The toad became seriously nervous and looked questioningly at the gentleman, realizing that anything could be expected from such a person. Meanwhile, little Soa had her own shock from what she saw, which could not leave her face for a long time. There was a mountain of broken mannequins in front of the student, and she understood that it all needed to be fixed, but she still asked what it was, and Cho gave a completely reasonable answer that it was treasure that would save his salary. The mentor asked the student to take care of these unfortunate and abandoned pieces of wood, again calling Sohei an invincible healer of mannequins. To make the picture clearer, Cho explained that repairing this inventory was enough to return half of its points, and this really shed light on the situation for Sohei. And she asked if the mountain of this repair was only half of the points, then how many were there in total? But Hui decided not to tell the girl everything directly and simply asked her to save him because the probationary period would soon end and if he delayed, he would not take up an official position, which meant he would be kicked out. The master once again became a good boy just to appease the student, but so he hesitated for the first time before answering something and looked closely at Cho. The little girl looked at this strange mentor and for the first time wondered whether she should trust such a person with her teaching. Hui began to pretend to fix the mannequin, but in fact he only made it worse, and Sohei, exhaling, came to the conclusion that apart from this teacher, she had no one who would take her. The student asked the mentor to stop doing what he was doing because it would only lead to a worse result, and Cho happily stopped. Time passed quickly, and everyone had their own tasks that day on the site where Sul and Yun Ho were training. But Cho kept encouraging the mannequin healer, praising her and how well she was doing with the task at hand, which did not go unnoticed by Pekri. While the teacher couldn't get enough of how his penalty points melted away with each repaired dummy, a shadow appeared behind him and Sohei. Sol was distracted from her training and approached the mentor and student with a displeased look and indignantly snorted. Someone became jealous of the teacher, and Pekri took one of the mannequins and loudly declared that she, in fact, could also fix such things. In an attempt to pretend that everything was as it should be, Saul broke off the part of the mannequin that served as a hand. Outwardly remaining calm, the girl also broke the pole in half, but in her head she was already panicking about what was happening and why it was breaking. It was difficult for Saul to admit his defeat, because from the outside everything looked so easy, but in reality it turned out to be terribly difficult and incomprehensible. All that Master Hui could say was that now, with this dummy, both his salary and his promotion as a teacher had died. Cho headed for the exit with a mournful look, explaining that he had received so many fines that it would not be possible to get by with just a salary cut. So he said goodbye to everyone, and Sol shouted her apologies to the mentor after him. So he simply looked after the master, already knowing a little about his joking manner of communication, and Yun Ho, clutching his head, sighed heavily from all this pun. Suddenly the little girl laughed loudly, both because Sol couldn't fix the mannequin and because the mentor played it all out beautifully and tragically. But so he didn't expect to hear someone else's laughter behind her, and her body immediately reacted by sending goosebumps through it. Zer Tan also stood at the entrance and covered his mouth, giggling, asking everyone why it was so funny. Cho stood in front of the student, bowing his head with a question like, what the hell did you come here for again? But to his silent question, without warning, he received the same silent answer. The master, like a ninja, caught the wooden medallion in front of his face, asking Tan what it was. The young gentleman explained that this was his entrance ticket, but Kui still did not understand why he needed this thing. Still with a smile on his face, Kao Tan did not understand such a stupid question from the teacher who was given the student's entrance ticket. With false politeness, the young master explained that teacher Yom had appointed Cho and Hui as his temporary tutor. Cho, with the same stony expression on his face, asked the boy a counter question who said that he would take on him. 
The guy, raising his voice and pointing his finger at the master as if he were a servant, explained that he had just clarified everything regarding the instructions of Teacher Yom and moreover the director's consent. The mentor had something in his nose and decided to clean it with his finger at the same time as he indifferently replied that it was not his job and he was right because he was not an official teacher, so Tan would not be his student until Cho himself agreed. The scythe met the stone and this arrogant mentor began to really piss off the young master. Tan mentally branded the teacher as the most ordinary teacher in Donchen, no matter how skilled he pretended to be. The mentor hunter's fist began to itch and he realized that if this master continued to put on airs, he would hit him. But before taking such drastic action, Tan turned his attention to his friend who had been watching him from the side all this time. The guy noticed how Yun Ho looked at him with concern, and his face was written with a request not to do anything stupid. It was unclear where this nobility came from, but Tan decided that for the sake of his friend, he would restrain his ardor and try to observe the teacher for some time longer. The next day, the meeting place for all the heroes was unchanged, but for now the site was empty and silent. Today, Tan, not Hui, occupied the observation post and carefully watched what the students and the teacher himself would do. The guy sincerely didn't understand what the hell these two were doing, looking at how Sol and Nam Goong were standing in the same pose, focused on their energy. Tan caught the moment that the guys are now training with the help of acupuncture, which stimulates blood flow, and this method is mortally dangerous if you do not know how to do it correctly. The height of shock for the guy was that the needles were stuck exactly where the vital points were, but everything was fine with the students. Tan turned in the direction where the mentor was and veins appeared on his face from anger because he did not understand how he dared to teach his friend in such a dangerous way. Meanwhile, Cho was calmly trying to fix the mannequins under the watchful guidance of Sohei. And although the little girl praised the master for how well he was doing everything, he also called himself a genius of sorts. Returning his gaze to his friend, Tan was more inclined in his thoughts to scratch his fists on the master's face. But watching Yun Ho calmly continue his training, the young man did not move beyond his thoughts. Doing a great favor to his mentor, Tang talked himself out of beating him and persuaded him to watch a little longer. After the needles, the students found three purple balls in their hands that looked very strange and even dangerous. Yun Ho and Sol froze looking at the strange thing in their hand, and the guy said that they also smelled terrible, which made him want to eat them even less now, but Pekri reminded him that the master himself gave it to them and asked out loud if he really wanted to kill them. But even after being suspected of attempted murder, Sol, with a deft movement of her hand, threw three balls into her mouth at once. Nam Gung followed the example of the fearless girl and also put this incomprehensible thing in his mouth and already grimaced. The guys made such faces and bent over so much as if they were about to die, and Saul even grabbed her neck thinking she was suffocating. Nam Gung could hardly say anything, so he muttered through his teeth that he suspected it was poison and continued to grimace. Pekri agreed with her partner but also told him through gritted teeth that it was too late and they couldn't just spit them back out. But literally a moment later, the students were sitting next to each other in the lotus position and meditating, while Tan looked on in wild shock. The young man turned towards the teacher again, not understanding what he was doing to his students. But Hui sat contentedly like a child next to Sohei, concluding that if they continued at the same pace, he would soon be freed from fines. And after that, he told the little girl to take a break and give him her hands to once again create the magic of massage. Tana was completely overcome after that scoundrel Hui didn't even bother to check if everything was okay with the students he almost destroyed. The young gentleman finally decided to approach the teacher, but with a very pressing question. Does he even think about what he is doing to his students? Cho turned to the upstart, asking what exactly he needed now. And if it wasn't so urgent, then it would be worth coming later. Tan said that the master was lousy from his observations over five days, from which he came to the conclusion that Cho was a charlatan who had learned strange tricks and asked if he really thought that such training would make the students stronger, to which Hui answered in the affirmative. Holding his head in his hands and almost tearing his hair out with anger, Tan told his mentor that he had been holding back as much as he could and was simply observing his activities solely for the sake of his friend. When the guy fell silent, Hui pushed him to continue, and he indicated that he was now so furious that he couldn't find words to describe his state. At that moment, Sohi ran onto the site, shouting to the master that she had gotten the tools to repair the mannequins, which made him very happy. The little girl stood there pleased with how happy the teacher was because now the repair would happen faster. And at that moment, Tan's fists only clenched even more. The young gentleman was faced with the fact that not only was he not being feared, 
but he was also being ignored, and he warned the teacher for the last time not to make a fool of herself by not understanding what she was saying to him. Cho turned to the guy and absolutely calmly said that he was in the way at the moment, so it would be better for him to go to bed. Such an incomprehensible remark took Tan by surprise, but there was no trace of anger left, and there was only a silent question about what this madman had just said. Instead of a word, such a loud sound followed in response that the last thing the guy saw before his eyes was a bright spot in the shape of a star. With a sharp gasp and a scream, Tan woke up and saw his own hands in the night sky before his eyes. The young man screamed, either from anger or from not understanding what had happened, or perhaps all these feelings merged into one. But Yun Ho stood next to his shocked friend, waiting for him to wake up so that he could help if necessary, or at least explain what happened. Nam Gung shook his head sympathetically and sighed heavily when Tan looked at him with a question in his eyes. The young gentleman sitting on the floor asked his friend what had happened and why it was already so late, since it seemed like it was daytime and there was some kind of mark on Tan's face. Yun Ho clarified the situation to his friend by telling him that Mentor Hui had put him to sleep like a baby with just a slap. It was a sharp turn in the young man's life, and he reached out his hand to where there was a modest evidence of what had happened and asked his friend if he really wanted to say that he had been cut off with one blow. Nam Gung was understanding about the fact that it was difficult for his friend to believe this because he immediately told them using his own example that when his mentor hit him for the first time, he also did not believe it. Tan's cheekbones began to ache because the teacher turned out to be a coward for attacking him at the most unexpected moment, so he decided to take revenge on him tomorrow. Yun Ho, hearing all these thoughts out loud, warned his friend not to think badly of the teacher because even though he was strange, he had skills and experience that were a million others, but Tan was outraged by the master's charlatanism, and moreover, he was ready to beat him first. Tan decided to calm his friend down by reminding him who he was, but Yun Ho remained silent, and the boy decided that he would not let his guard down in the future to avoid such attacks. The next day, Jay Kal Tang came to the training ground looking for the target he wanted to teach a lesson today. But the young man found only students at the training and watched Saul and Yun Ho warming up as well as Sohei, who was still fixing the dummies. Tan realized that he was so upset that he had arrived too early and had forgotten that the teacher was the last one on the playground. The guy decided to watch for now how little Sohei diligently and very successfully puts the wooden pieces in order. And at the most unexpected moment, Sohei turns towards Tan, but looks somewhere behind him, greeting the mentor. The young man turned around, realizing that this scoundrel had crept up so silently and was right behind him. Tan was prepared today, and had already swung his training sword to show the master who was who. But the young master caught the star again before he even had time to say anything to the mentor, much less hit him. The next day, Tan, with a sword, waited for the teacher, who he considered lazy, at the dining room, already knowing that he never missed lunch. The guy was so amused by the fact that the mentor was not the only one who was capable of suddenly appearing out of nowhere and attacking. Tan looked out from around the corner to check if the master was heading towards the dining room and noticed him, but in doing so, he made a huge mistake. Logically, the young man understood that Hui would turn the corner, and that's where he would catch him off guard. Tan prepared the sword in his hand so that he could strike immediately, but he didn't yet know how naive he looked in Cho's eyes. From around the corner, instead of a whole mentor, only that same ill-fated hand that had been giving the guy no peace for many times appeared. The collection of stars was replenished with another rather bright one, but this time Tan even managed to curse before switching off. The next option for how to attack the teacher, the guy decided to carry out from under the shelter that was under the house. Due to the fact that the houses stood on stilts, Tan had the opportunity to crawl under them to hide from view. The young man lay silently and motionless, only his thoughts moving in his head about the fact that the master would definitely not notice him here. But when the guy asked what he decided to try to hide in, even in such a place, the devil's hand appeared again. A new and bright star was born before his eyes, but this time Tan didn't even curse but gave in to such a suddenness. The guy thought about how the master's palm constantly appeared in front of his face, and when he opened his eyes a little, he saw its owner, who stood smiling over his soul. Hui did not leave the unfortunate student this time, but was pleased that he had woken up and perhaps this time it would be possible to have a different conversation. Tan looked at the master with a displeased and dirty expression on his face. And although he was angry as hell, he no longer had the strength to resist. But Cho was so happy that the guy was making less noise and asked him if he himself had noticed changes in his behavior. But only one thing remained for now, and that was the frivolous attitude towards the mentor. 
Hui continued the conversation, expressing his thoughts that the guy clearly doesn't like being constantly out of it, but he himself doesn't leave a choice, because he can be found everywhere. Tan started to object, but Cho immediately warned him that it was better to choose his words before opening his mouth, and his inherent energy emanated from him. The young man froze lying on the ground, experiencing such sensations for the first time, and, moreover, he actually fell silent instead of resisting any further. Tan felt the fear that the master somehow instilled in him, just as everyone who forced Cho to take such extreme measures felt it. The mentor decided to continue the monologue for now and explained to the young gentleman that he had found out information about him because he had been too intrusive. Cho hit the nail on the head when he told about the rumors about Tan's family where the older brother is the smartest and the younger one is talented in martial arts. Adding fuel to the fire, Hui asked the guy if perhaps the reason for his expulsion from school was his unwillingness to crawl out of the den of self-pity. A wound that sometimes heals and sometimes breaks always hurts terribly, and I had to protect myself just like now when Tanu felt pain and he barked at the master. How dare he? But Cho reminded the young man to watch his sharp tongue and looked closely into his very soul. At that moment, Tan looked like a cornered, helpless kitten who they wanted to help, but he perceived it as a threat. The young master could not find the words to speak out because in his mind he was struggling with the fact that he was not going to obey this scoundrel. Tan knelt down but bent over in pain and screamed from it too about how the teacher could talk to him like that as if he knew everything about his life. Finally, the dam of disconnection with himself broke and the guy splashed out the accumulated resentment, remembering how his mother's attention was focused on his older brother. And the father devoted time to teaching the younger one which led to an unbearable feeling that Tan was superfluous, not only in this family, but also in life. The young man shouted again to the master, who had been listening to him until now, that he did not know what it was like when he had to give in. Tan asked the most important question to the teacher, but in fact he did it for himself, asking how he could know the feeling when everyone has forgotten about your existence. The guy was kneeling and much quieter, but with terrible melancholy, he asked again if the master knew what it was like when you were branded as less gifted and your brothers were singled out against your background. Tan said something for the last time that resonated with Huey, and it was a feeling of being forgotten that was echoing from everyone around, which inspired the thought that you simply did not exist. Cho thought for a moment about the one who might have also already forgotten him, and all attempts to find him were reduced to zero. But closing his eyes, the mentor remembered how he had recently set himself the task of finding that one at any cost, and now he drove away useless thoughts. Tan staggered and gradually got to his feet without looking at the teacher, and then Hui told him that he was wrong and that in fact he understood him perfectly. The young man froze halfway to standing up to his full height, sincerely surprised by the mentor's answer, but he continued to explain that he really did not experience such heavy feelings, but for the reason that he took from life what he wanted. Tan asked the teacher to clarify what he said, because he did not quite understand his statement, which was not surprising. But Hui told the guy that he was thinking too much and too hard, and that he needed to get some more sleep now, and directed his palm towards Tan's face. The guy cursed as he fell to the ground in another knockout, but this time there was no resistance or anger. Before reaching the ground, Tan caught himself thinking that he felt much better in terms of sensations, and this pleasantly surprised him, causing a smile to appear on his face. The young man plopped down on the ground as if it were a soft and comfortable bed, and Hui remained standing in place, controlling the situation. And when Tan began to snore sweetly, Cho leaned towards him, trying to understand whether he smiled or it seemed so. And even if so, did the young man really have strange inclinations? The next day, the young gentleman appeared on the platform as a humble student who politely asked the teacher to take him under his tutelage. Tan begged on his knees and Cho, turning to him, did not understand at all what was happening, but he once again begged for some instructions on training. The mentor was, to put it mildly, in shock, and immediately asked if the guy was sick or if the beating format suited him. But Tan said that he would like to take up the sword again. Hui continued to directly mock the student, as if he was specifically testing his desire to learn for sincerity, insisting that he go home and play these games with himself, hiding under the blanket. But the young man did not back down and spoke in a completely different way about how he really wanted to study martial arts again and regain his self-worth. Just as Yun Ho once fell to his knees and cried in front of the master, believing in himself again, Tan now also shouted from the depths of his soul for Cho to help him, such a stupid student, to learn awareness 
even if now he is a complete zero but is ready to learn. The teacher immediately understood what was being discussed and emphasized to the young man that if he looked at Yun Ho and thought that he could do the same, he was wrong. H. We saw that the guy was not going to give up and turned to Seoul, who was training, saying that he would not fight with the student's friend, hinting at a duel with the girl. Pekri was just finishing a sword maneuver when her mentor called her to make an offer she couldn't refuse. When the lady approached the new guy, the first thing she asked the master was whether she could kill the guy. But Cho really upset Saul by saying that, in fact, murder is prohibited here and reminded the girl that they were in a school. The mentor noticed the indignation on the young man's face, wondering if such a conversation was really taking place, and in general that they had put a girl in a duel with him hurt his pride. But Tan was understanding about the fact that he could not refuse. Huai praised the guy for his honesty but warned him not to treat the student so frivolously because it was written on his forehead that the duel was too easy. All that the master told Tan was that he should try, but what exactly he tried was something the student himself had to understand, and at that moment he most likely meant to survive, because Saul swung her sword so hard that the dust under her feet split into two sides. The girl allowed herself to gloat a little, saying that it was terribly difficult for her to react calmly to how the guy treated her mentor. Pekri immediately warned Tan that in her heart she would gladly torture him properly but she was stopped by the fact that the master would misunderstand everything and take her for a wayward person. The young man smiled sarcastically and said that such words would belong to him now, so he promised to try to finish the fight quickly so that the defeat would not be miserable. Saul sarcastically thanked the new guy for the care he had shown, but she herself already understood that he was a bastard and wouldn't last a minute. The armored train picked up a mind-blowing speed towards the enemy, preparing to blow him to smithereens while Tan simply pointed his weapon forward. The guy froze in his tracks with the sword in front of him, naively thinking that the girl was simply intimidating him. But suddenly the sword flew out of the young man's hand and he only had time to blink, let alone defend himself. The wooden thing did a few somersaults before returning back, but not into the hands of its first owner. Time could only stand there like a pillar trying not to lose his jaw somewhere on the court in shock. And the sword had already managed to very gracefully return down into the hands of the one who knew how to control it better although at first glance, it did not seem so to some. The young lady gripped the handle of the training weapon tightly, and now she had a double opportunity to teach the impudent fellow a lesson. Sol placed the captured sword on her shoulder, telling her opponent that he looked very cute with this sword, but it was clearly superfluous for him. Rejoicing that she could now make fun of the asshole, the girl nevertheless returned the sword to Tan, realizing that without it the battle would be difficult for him. The young man caught the weapon and there were already a bunch of questions in his head about who this student was and how she achieved such skills. Sol did not stop at leaving the young man alone after the first unfortunate loss of the sword and continued to fight. Tan nevertheless made an attempt to at least dodge the countless blows that were flying in his direction. When he managed to avoid the blow, the guy decided that he would continue to act at least according to this scheme. Pekri smiled at this way of fighting, emphasizing to Tan that he was performing the dance quite well but the lady had a different vision of their joint battle dance, so she ran up to show what she was capable of. Since Cho had once turned off Tan with his last slap, Saul now knocked down a forehead that was several times larger than hers with her foot. Tan again experienced the feeling of falling that his mentor had given him many previous times after slaps. And when the young man tried to get up, Pekri was close enough to hit him again properly, but he reacted in time and dodged the blow. But the girl also played up the situation by pushing off her opponent. Tan was not prepared for the fact that after he dodged the blow, he would receive the next one so quickly and Saul's foot would end up in his face. While the young lady remained firmly in place, the guy flew back a decent distance after his face came into contact with the leg. Pekri shouted after the student her apologies for not being able to calculate the force of the blow, and she was very sorry. Tan had a cut on his face, and he wiped the blood from his lip and looked at the student. Wondering where in Dong Cheon such a young person with such outstanding abilities came from. Once again, for everyone who watched the battle, there was confirmation of Pekri Sol's talent, which was also noticed by Hui. And thanks to her training, she only improved and was now able to enter into a duel on par with the warriors of the great families. The girl stood and looked at the one who was strong and powerful, only in words and talked more than he did. So she immediately understood that the guy had no chance especially considering that he had let himself go and was holding a bottle instead of a sword. Tan lowered his head and admitted his defeat without any caustic words or disdainful glances towards his opponent. 
Saul was surprised that the young man backed down so quickly and allowed herself to be a little sarcastic in his direction, saying that she could have tormented him a little more. But this time the young gentleman no longer showed insolence or anger, but simply silently accepted the fact that he had been indifferent to himself for a very long time, and therefore to others, which was a mistake. Tan headed towards the mentor and Soha, who continued to repair the mannequins. Hui heard that the new student had returned and reacted to him even before he said anything. The teacher was the first to speak to the young man when he came close enough and asked if he now understood the essence. Tan wanted to know about Yun Ho's level now. What about bakery soul? And the master answered that in general it could be said that way, but added that Namgung has a different specificity of talent. Jay Kal Tan realized his mistake and how overconfident he was and how he didn't take what was happening on the court seriously. The guy asked his mentor if he could try to go out on the court again and fight, despite the fact that he was already like a beaten dog. Hui laughed at how selfless the young man had become, and he asked him if he wanted to enter the ring, which meant going against a child, and pointed his finger at Sohei, causing the girl to gasp. Tan lowered his head again, feeling regret for everything he had done and had done, and asked for forgiveness, explaining that he had never intended to go against the little girl. Cho happily informed the student that although he was currently superior to Sohei, she was quite fast and would soon overtake him. So he was surprised by what the teacher said, and she decided that this was impossible because she was just fixing mannequins. But Hui convinced her that she was studying now and the girl asked again if it was really with the help of repairs, to which he answered in the affirmative. Zhe Kal Tan sat on the floor of the court watching his friend train and thoughts kept haunting his head. For the first time, the young man felt like a frog at the bottom of a well, because although it could jump and was like a home in the water, it was also a hostage to the situation. Now the guy saw something he hadn't noticed before, like the acupuncture training that looked dangerous, but now thanks to it, Yun Ho's movements became smoother. Tan also remembered those poisonous balls at first glance, which was also a strange order to eat them, but later he felt how much heavier his friend's energy became. So he didn't pass by without noticing that there were 30 mannequins left, and Cho started whining that his arms were already hurting. The new guy noticed that if at first the girl whined that she had to attach the limbs to the mannequin so many times, now she moved her arms so deftly that it was completely unnoticeable. Tan caught himself thinking that he didn't understand what he had been doing in his life up until this point. And even if he had done something, it had been superficial. And how could he now make up for lost time? The young gentleman felt rather uncomfortable being so trapped in his own thoughts that he even grabbed his head. When the training was finished, Nam Gung approached his friend asking him if he was in a position to talk now. The guys headed to the river among the small mountains, which at the moment was the best place to unwind. Tan walked depressed by his own thoughts, and until he and Yun Ho reached the riverbank, his friend did not ask any questions. For a while, the friends simply sat next to each other and silently watched the flow of water without disturbing the silence. And suddenly, Yun Ho handed his friend a jug of drink, which surprised him. And at first, Tan did not dare to pick up what had replaced his sword for so long. Tan reminded Nam Gung that he doesn't really like to drink, but he took some alcohol with him. And his friend replied that when he's feeling down, he can allow himself to drink a little. While Tan drank the drink like water, Yun Ho emphasized that this was the perfect way to end today, in his opinion. The alcohol was quite strong, and since Tan pounced on it, and drank from the bottle, he ended up coughing and decided to stop for now. The young man felt terrible shame for having lost so miserably today, but he never thought that he would suffer such a defeat in his life. Tan relaxed and gradually his tongue loosened, so he continued to speak without looking at his friend, that he shouldn't have even tried to compete in the first place because he was driven by competition. Nam Gung didn't say anything, but simply listened to his friend, realizing that he was not going through the best period in his life and also took a sip from the jug. Yun Ho also stopped coughing and Tan, in a friendly manner, emphasized that he was not at all an expert at drinking. Nam Gung decided to shift his friend's focus from what was making him sad and reminded him that he really liked the defense technique. Tan confirmed his friend's words by pointing out that his family had become famous thanks to the possession of this technique, but it alone was not enough to become famous. And Yun Ho asked a counter question about whether it was possible to mix the technique of defense and the sword. J. Kyle Tang, already with a blush on his face, told his friend that he was drunk to suggest such ideas since it was impossible to surpass the master himself in the art of swordsmanship, but then asked why he was still studying it. Yun Ho agreed with his friend's opinion about the impossibility of surpassing a mentor, but at the same time it was just as dangerous to demonstrate one's knowledge 
and Tan did not understand why. Nam Gung remembered all the times he showed off his knowledge and tried to formulate an answer for his friend as clearly as possible. And so Yun Ho took as an example that when he has a headache and he talks about it, Master Hui immediately appears next to him with a kick in the ass. Nam Gung shared his thoughts with his friend that he could also try to mix the techniques that he liked. And the impetus for this idea was when Yun Ho saw So Ye fixing a mannequin. Yun Ho asked Tan if he would like to try to study sword art and defense techniques together. And this was an important question that made the guy really think about it. As an argument, Nam Gung used a fact from his friend's life that these were the techniques he was confident in because he had studied them, which meant that the impossible could well be possible. Yun Ho reminded that Tan's older brother, although smart, was powerless in battle, while the younger one, on the contrary, was a good warrior but was a zero in studies. Tan understood what his friend was seeing but asked if he meant for him to use the skills in which he was strong. In fact, Yun Ho no longer had to answer his friend's question because the process of change itself had already been launched. All that was left was to make a decision. After some thought, Tan looked somewhere far into the sky and replied that perhaps such changes could be quite interesting. In the evening when the training was completed, everyone did their own thing before going to bed. Master Cho, while in his room, unrolled a scroll that was very important to him and could not contain his joy when he read what was written there. Chui even hung the manuscript on the wall so that he could see this beauty every day and in general so that it would serve as a reminder. Happy as an elephant, Cho looked at the confirmation that the temporary contract had finally expired. The hero rejoiced not because of the piece of paper or because he was now officially working, but because he could now focus on finding the one. Since Hui was standing at the door, he clearly heard that Teacher Mei had returned to the room next to him. The girl immediately headed to the now familiar window in the wall that Cho had once kicked through and called the master. Mei congratulated the guy on finally officially taking up the position of mentor. Hui was doubly happy when they shared this achievement with him, and although he understood that Mei wouldn't see it, he still smiled. The young man came to his senses because he couldn't let such an opportunity pass by and sank to the floor in front of the bed, slipping his hand under it. A hand with a cup containing a drink appeared through the wall through a rag, and Cho offered his partner a glass in honor of his official status. At first, Mei didn't want to and hesitated since no one had canceled work tomorrow, but in the end she agreed to a drink and an evening heart-to-heart -heart talk. The girl admitted that this method of drinking through the wall was very funny, but Hui reassured her that this would soon no longer happen since he now had money for repairs thanks to fixing the mannequins. The teacher looked dreamily off to the side, saying that she would be a little sad that this window would disappear, but overall she was happy. May replied that it seemed like not much time had passed since the mentor's appearance, but so many events had already happened and Cho agreed with her. The guys clinked glasses and the hole in the wall through which they met and remembered how awkward it was and laughed about it. And then they drank to Namgung who came back to life and to Bakery Soul who was truly special. May's cheeks were flushed from the amount of alcohol she had consumed, and she said with a hint of nostalgia that the children had grown up quickly, and with that it had become quite noisy at school. The mentor lifted the curtain that covered the hole and offered her another glass, but Hui noticed that she was already quite drunk. May waved it off, saying that she was fine and that she could have another drink, and then she remembered an important question that she wanted to ask the master about whether he was preparing for the tests. Hui, without suspecting anything, replied that of course the preparations were in full swing because he was going to win, and May explained that the monthly battles between students were an individual competition, and there was also a team competition during the midterm exam. This was something new for Cho, and he repeated these important words about the midterm exam in his mind, and was surprised that besides the monthly tests, there were others. The guy wanted more useful information, so he asked May to explain in more detail and the girl said that the team competition was used to evaluate the unity of the warrior's team spirit for admission to the ranks of the Murim Alliance. The girl was already answering very slowly, and it was audible that a little more and she would switch off. But she continued to tell that, for example, the four-sided exam must be passed first upon admission and asked the master if he really didn't remember. And Cho really saw the light from the fact that he completely forgot about all these checks and which one follows which. While it was not too late, Hui hurried to find out whether the exam was only for students, and May answered that it was definitely. Already in flight to the pillow, the mentor could barely speak, but told the guy that all this was unimportant if he was not interested in promotion. And so, very slowly and one word at a time, 
May said that if she and Mentor Cho were promoted, then they could safely go to Incheon and fell onto the bed, instantly falling asleep. Hui sat in shock, digesting all the information he had just received while simultaneously hearing his partner's quiet snoring. The young man was glad when he realized that everything was going well, because he had planned to continue searching in Incheon, and now he also found out how to get there. And despite the fact that May was already asleep, Cho still thanked her for the important information and wished her good night. The next day, from the house where the meetings were held and the director was often present, this time it was not his voice that was heard, but Master Hui's. Headmaster Zhang did not expect the mentor to appear, and he asked so directly why the hell he was brought to his office so early, to which Cho wanted to hear confirmation that there was a team competition during the midterm exam. And the director confirmed that everything was so, after which Kavi came to his senses, and arguing that she was now an official employee, demanded an explanation for why he had not been told all this information earlier. The dragon was calm but alert this time, and turning to the newly minted mentor, he asked if he had left his conscience at home, since he himself does not attend master's meetings to learn everything there. And besides, he himself had recently run away because he was busy with other things. There was no answer, and Zhang continued asking what the guy wanted from the team competition, and running ahead asked what Hui was thinking about, namely getting a promotion. Cho said exactly the same thing, that he plans to take part in the team test because he needs to get a promotion, to which the boss asked him not to beat around the bush and say it straight out. Hui said in fact that all the mannequins had been repaired, and the director, looking at the young man, asked if he really thought that it was just a matter of repairing the wooden parts. Cho actually thought that fixing the mannequins was important until the boss asked the question, and now he asked what was important then. Zhang shocked the mentor when he told him about the minimum number of students for the team exam. Namely, there should have been four, but the master only had three. After returning to the site, Cho grabbed his head, realizing that this was a failure, while Sol asked Yun Ho what was wrong with the teacher, but he was unaware, and so he continued making mannequins. The sadness, sorrow, and despair suddenly disappeared when a possible salvation appeared before Hui in the form of Jakal Tan. Tan was still as dejected, not fully knowing whether his teacher would accept him, but he was ready to at least try to do something. Raising his head, the young man put his sword forward, expressing to the master his understanding that perhaps there was no chance anymore, but at the same time he wanted to demonstrate what path he had found for himself. It wasn't that he was happy, but the feeling he caught from the guy was completely different, and it was felt in everything. Tan got ready, stood in the starting position, and holding the sword firmly with both hands, began to perform the dance, breathing evenly. Cho watched the new student with genuine interest, expecting the guy to really surprise him with something. In Kaltana, everything changed, starting from the look and ending with the movements, which became smoother and more deliberate, and all the dirt that was in the thoughts went away. The young man realized that even if he couldn't convince the master to take him on, he would at least try his technique in practice. Tan moved as one with the sword, taking not only steps but also jumping if necessary. The energy of the young master was activated and he, feeling it with all his work, made the sword his extension. Kui watched the guy perform the technique and was glad to see that he was changing his opinion about him and now Tan didn't look like a dud. Tan completed the maneuver. But it was at that moment that Cho stepped in to help the young man continue combining techniques. The teacher smiled slyly and pointed his finger at Tan's sword, asking him not to stop the weapon but to continue its movement. And the guy began to move the sword as the mentor's finger pointed, walking in complete trust toward the man who was once strange to him. Hui made a repeated and circular motion with his finger, watching as Tan walked perfectly just as he was told. It was a moment of multiplication of the power that had been dormant in the young man for a long time and was not recognized by him. Namgung asked Sol why the teacher was pointing his finger at Tan, and the girl explained that the master told Tan to clearly follow the movement of his finger without stumbling. The teacher was genuinely surprised that the young man used a method better than fencing technique, which consisted of creating the illusion of a large number of people while remaining at a distance from the enemy. And indeed, from certain swings of the sword, it seemed as if he was not alone there and it looked like a huge fan. Tan made every effort to complete the technique with dignity, activating the energy from within. At that moment, Hui looked at the guy and couldn't believe what he had just seen, so he mentally asked himself if it was really a spiritual illusion. A man with vast experience in combat has learned a sword technique that creates protection around its owner, causing the enemy to become disoriented, 
because the weapon's energy reflection diverges in eight directions and creates the illusion of an environment. Y noticed that the guy was a little short of perfect use of the technique and began to set the movement with his finger again. The teacher activated his power, thanks to which he decided to help Jay Kaltan improve his technique performance. Hui came up with the idea that it would be possible to tell Tan that his internal energy was a thread and the sword was a needle. But the mentor remained silent, and raising his finger up, remembered that spiritual illusion is a method in which the enemy's sense of distance is lost. And lowering his hand down, Cho knew that after honing the technique, one can create a false impression of the length of the sword. And when the sword seems longer in battle than it actually is, the trajectory of the attack disappears, which only plays into your hands. Kui asked Tan to mentally remember well how he felt after completing the spiritual illusion technique. Suddenly the guy coughed up blood. It was such a strong technique that his physical body, out of habit, could not withstand it. Exhausted, Tan fell to his knees, but this time he did not fail, but rather gained something more important. The mentor approached the young man but did not speak immediately, not allowing him to come to his senses and catch his breath after such an incredible dance with a sword. Cho smiled widely and this time without any mockery or ridicule, he praised Tan for finding a good path. And the master finished his praise by calling Tan his fourth student, who was able to once again believe that he is important and needed. Half a year has passed since Cho and Hui took up the official position of mentor and recruited four talented students. At that moment, the fifth day of the selection exam was taking place, for which the team was excellently prepared. At the main competition square, both mentors and students were gathered, discussing the latest and most recent news. Teacher Yom, as always, with the look of a puffed-up toad, asked his charges if everyone was present, to which the team unanimously responded that everyone was in place. One of the mentors approached Yumu and asked for forgiveness for distracting the students from preparing for the exam. It was Mei who came to warn her colleague that mentor Cho was still not there, thus asking him to wait a little longer. But the indignant toad did not answer the teacher, but instead thought that the bastard was always late, regardless of the situation. What Yom didn't like even more was that such a prominent young lady always took the side of the new guy from the very moment he appeared in Dongchon. Yoma couldn't stop thinking about getting rid of the fool Hui before he led such a pretty mentor away from the path that was directed towards him. The toad stopped hovering in the clouds of love because everyone who was in the square almost unanimously exclaimed that Jie Kaltan was also walking next to the ghost of Dong Chan. The girls were also recognized, and if there were those who looked arrogantly at Bakery Soul and Mo Yan Sohei, there were also those who were happy to see their acquaintances. Yom watched as the idiot Hui led his team of outcasts, not suspecting what these guys would eventually be capable of. The team, although late, had already created a sensation on absolutely everyone present with just their appearance, even without doing anything. Cho spoke to the students, stating the fact that there were more students in the square today than ever before, to which Tan supported that this was the last stage before the midterm test, which many would be interested in watching. To everyone's surprise, Hui said that he would be happy to earn a few points, although usually they say something like gnawing out victory with their teeth. Before talking to the boys and giving them some parting words or instructions, Cho looked at the future opponents of his students standing in front. Having assessed the situation visually, the mentor turned back to the team and asked them to listen carefully as they would now learn today's battle strategy. The master slightly surprised the students when he explained that today, they were obliged to win three fights each. But at the same time, Hui smiled and, like a wrong mentor, told the guys that they didn't need to jump above their heads since the scoring was based on whether there were more victories than in the previous competition. The teacher asked the team not to create problems for themselves, and on the contrary, to look for easy ways, because no matter how many victories they win, they will not help him advance in his career. And here, Nam Gung found himself in a stupor from the fact that they usually asked to try to jump above their heads. Cho explained to the stubborn student that if they win 10 fights now, then in the next exam, they will have to do it 11 times. But Yun Ho still persisted, asking if they should not do everything possible as warriors. The master was fed up with Nam Gun like a ram, not calming down and hitting the same goal over and over again. So he asked him directly if he wanted to die right now, to which, of course, the answer was no. Sol suddenly appeared next to her mentor and, playing her role as fragile and defenseless, complained that she did not have the strength to fight. And after that, the cunning fox asked the master to whisper something in her ear as a sign of support and motivation. The teacher turned to the actress of the burnout theater and told her to go to the arena and fight like a wild moose, just as she usually did. 
While Sol stood there pouting and offended, Hui turned to Tan and asked him to look after this kindergarten. Finally, Cho reminded the team that they simply needed to score as many points as needed and no more, because this would determine who they would spend time with until the next exams. So he hesitantly raised her tiny hand and asked what the mentor would say about her. Huawei didn't put the jokes aside, so he told the little girl not to hit the opponents too hard, since later he would have to fix a couple more dummies. But Soka didn't really like this answer from the teacher, and she sighed heavily because of the work ahead of her after work. Cho commanded the guys to go to the duel and asked them to do everything exactly as he said. The master remained behind and the warriors went not to jump above their heads, although they really wanted to show this world what they had already achieved. As they say, repetition is the mother of learning, and Nam Gung went out again against Sagon, whom he had beaten up last time so badly that there was not a single living place left. Yun Ho looked at the poor guy and spoke to him first saying that they hadn't seen each other for a long time since the last battle. But the boy was still angry and the scars on his face reminded him every day of the shame and defeat he had experienced. Sagon was considered the most talented warrior in Dongcheon before he fought Namgung, but he sank to the very bottom after the competition. On that fateful day, no one expected that the ghost of Donghyeon would defeat the warrior, and in addition to the ridicule and rumors that haunted Sagon, Yom also turned away from him because his reputation and authority were more important than his student. Sagan looked at his opponent and sternly warned that luck was on his side today, so Yun Ho should prepare for a defeat that would wash away the shame from the young man. Nam Gung didn't care about Sagan's plans because he was focused on calculating everything several steps ahead. Yun Ho had an internal dialogue with himself, reminding himself that his strength was in the sword, so he needed to weigh the steps of his actions every time thanks to which an iron wall of swords would be built and he would be able to withstand. As soon as Sagon took a single step towards the enemy, Namgung already understood what would happen next. Sagon thoughtlessly rushed towards Yun Ho, shouting that the fight would now be finished with just one blow from him. And the ringing blow really happened as there was a clash of two training swords, but the ending that Sagon spoke about did not appear. More precisely, everything really ended with one blow, but only for Sagon whose part of the sword broke off and flew upward. The piece of wood spun briskly, rising high above the students' heads, and began to fall down. Part of the sword landed behind Sagan, clattering onto the plaza tiles while Nam Gung held the tip of his weapon right in front of his opponent's nose. Sagan looked at the sword that was a couple of centimeters from his face and nervously swallowed the lump that had formed in his throat. Yun Ho didn't move a single muscle on his face. He simply remained in place, holding his sword in front of him and looking at his opponent. The judge's voice rose into the air, concluding that Nam Gung Yun Ho had won and called the next opponent to come out to fight. But it so happened that Yun Ho, who had become a mountain in his defense, did not stop being one until he had defeated all his opponents. The former object of mockery and ridicule loudly challenged the next person willing to fight him and ended up winning three times. It was Pekri Sol's turn, but the girl watched as the mentor communicated with other masters of the opposite sex. The girl caught herself thinking that she would like to know what the teacher was so zealously discussing with those young ladies. The student's opponent was outraged that she was looking somewhere around instead of fighting, and Sol spoke, but only to herself, sad that she was fragile and would now dance with the sword while the teacher was busy with something. The girl turned around only when the enemy could no longer stand such impudence and shouted directly at her. Sol came to her senses that she was at an exam, and generally remembered that she needed to win the duel now. Shouting to her opponent that the game had begun, Pekri rushed at the student with such speed that even a bull would be afraid of it. But the girl had different feelings from such a fast movement because she was almost taking off like a bird. When Pekri was close enough to the enemy, she swung her sword for the upcoming strike and it looked like she was trying with half the strength that was asked for. The guy also decided that he was a tough nut to crack and screaming furiously, he also made a swing towards the student's attack. But the story with the broken sword repeated itself in Pekri's opponent who was trying his best. The young man looked at the stub of the weapon in his hand, realizing that this was a fiasco and there was no turning back and there would be none. Saul looked slyly and allowed herself to be a little sarcastic, saying that it turned out that it wasn't she who was in danger, but the guy. The next blow landed on the shoulder, which was already the girl's direct path to victory. All that was left was to wait for the enemy to fall. And when Pekri froze with a sword in her hands over the enemy who had already fallen to his knees, she was declared the winner. Dancing and moving easily around the square, Sol also defeated the opponents that her partner Namgun had before. 
The student terrified her enemies simply by rushing at them as the master commanded her, that is, like a wild elk. And perhaps the girl didn't consider herself that way, but the way she rushed towards the enemy still looked terrifying. The student's movements were dexterous and nimble, which gave her a head start in maneuvering compared to those who simply stood in place like a blockhead. It was Jay Calton's turn, and no one had any doubts considering that this guy was definitely a talented warrior, and the swordsman of Donghyeon, even with multiple efforts, would not be able to match him. Tan fulfilled his master's request and also won three victories, after which he looked closely at his friends. The boys gave each other silent signs that it was time to move on to the next stage of the dying swans. Cho Eun-hui also watched the team closely and mentally reminded them that now they needed to be actors for a little while. A frightened Mei ran up to the mentor, telling him that something incomprehensible was happening to the students, and he pretended not to understand. Mei said that Namgung, having won three victories in a row, easily fell to the ground like a doll. Everyone thought maybe Tan would be able to continue fighting, and it looked that way until a certain point. But after a moment, a crunch was heard, and it turned out that his weapon was cracking. The sword broke in half, which only happened from very strong blows, like in the case of Bakery Sol or Namgung. Zhe Kao Tang stood dejectedly because his weapon was no longer suitable for battle. So he lost, while the enemy stood, and thought that he was carrying after all, he had just broken his own sword. In the situation with Pekri Sol, it was a separate case worthy of a theatrical award when she fell to the ground and holding her head, complained that her legs had suddenly gone numb, but the opponent asked if she had just been jumping like an elk. May told all this being so scared that Hui had never seen her like this before, no matter what the situation. Cho remembered very well that it was Sohei's turn, and for May he feigned what a pity that this happened, and he himself thought that the guys were great students, but lousy actors. But poor Sohei was the most worried of all after going into battle with a student who was much better than her, and she cried so bitterly that everyone thought the fight would end there. But the little girl asked her opponent for forgiveness and beat him so hard with her small but fast hands that the guy didn't even have time to dodge. In order not to torment the unfortunate man for long, Sohei hit him one last time, and the enemy suddenly fell to the ground like a dead weight. The girl stood and shouted that she was very sorry for what happened but the student no longer cared about anything at all because he was out cold. But Hui was glad that he had made the right decision to improve the little girl in the art of fistfighting. The mentor was a little worried about Sohei's soft and vulnerable nature, especially before a fight that could fail. So repairing dummies was the most suitable activity for training her hands even when she was sleepy. As a result, the student's hand movements happened faster than she had time to think, and this was clearly visible during the fight, but for now, the little girl was wasting away over her opponent, upset that she had dealt him such a strong blow. The performances of Cho and Hui's senior students were amazing, but what So Haie did threw everyone off balance, and one of the masters noted that the cute Yulso had turned into a bloodthirsty one. By naming the girl Yulso, the teachers meant Yul Chestnut and So Mouse, and together this meant a squirrel, with which they associated little Sohei in their heads. But after today's fight, this comparison disappeared by itself. Cho heard how the students were crying, because such a tiny girl had blood flowing from her hands, and they didn't understand how she had come to such changes. But Master Huai was pleased with the result, and mentally answered everyone that little Soe had become a real warrior, and from now on she would be known as Bloody Yul So. Zhi Kao Tan came to the aid of his little partner, patting her on the back and reassuring her that everything was already over. Meanwhile, Kui was distracted by someone from behind who praised him for the fact that the children he teaches are growing both literally and figuratively. When the teacher turned to the one who spoke, at first he couldn't find what to answer, because in front of him stood a mentor whom he rarely saw. And the master asked if the girl was the same mentor Cho Hyun, who teaches students hand-to-hand -hand combat, which surprised her because she thought that he did not remember her. Hyun admitted her doubts about whether her mentor would recognize her, since he very rarely appears at meetings. Huai smiled, confirming that yes, in this regard, he was a real sinner, and he thought that he had checked almost all the women in Dong Cheon. While Sohei was still in tears, Hyun told the mentor that she once took in a girl and taught her, but noticed that she was sensitive, which meant that she needed time to grow up, but now she realized that she, as a mentor, was lacking something. Hyun admitted to Hui's face that she was such a mentor if she couldn't see the abilities in the little girl, but the guy replied that she shouldn't underestimate herself like that. 
For his part, Master Un explained that he had completely accidentally come up with a way to improve and at the same time use the dexterity of Zoe's little hands, and the girl noted that all mentors dream of being able to find an approach. So he couldn't stand it and ran up to the student again, who was still unconscious and began to cry even more, worrying about the fact that she had killed a man. And at that moment, Hyun and Hui looked at this picture, and the master concluded that he was just lucky. The moon was up and it was too late to do anything else, but the light was still on from the conference room. Headmaster Zhang, leaving the hall, asked the teachers to complete the report on today's exam by the morning, and when he heard that the teachers understood everything, he left. It was strange for Hyun that this non-urgent matter was asked to be done before the morning, and the day was already quite busy. Surprisingly, in Dongxiong, which was the lowest level among other schools, it was necessary to submit reports on a regular basis due to the order from the one who was higher in rank, so it was normal for them to be completed in a short time. Looking at the journal, mentor Cho Hyun saw that the grade for today's exam was incredible, but the job was different, namely, to briefly outline the opinion and recommendations of each mentor about the exam and the examiner. It would seem that there is nothing complicated, but it requires time and concentration, because if you make a mistake, the management will be furious. And now the masters have coped with it, and leaving, they ask their partner in a friendly manner not to stay too long. Hyun answered the guys that she would also soon go to rest. And after some time, having finished work, the girl put everything back in place, realizing that it was really time to go to bed. The most terrible and difficult thing compared to writing was to pass the test of teacher Yoma, and for this the girl prepared herself mentally because she would also have to get up early. But fate had its own way, and the teacher heard from the door the very voice she had just been thinking about. At the door appeared a drunken teacher, Yom, who shouted that he was not drunk at all, and offered mentor Yan another drink. Toad noticed the mentor, wondering if she was still there, and headed towards her while Hyun politely tried to answer that she was just about to leave. Yom, being in an inadequate state, began to compliment the teacher and asked her to come up to him, which the girl did not like. But Yan stood up for him, saying that the teacher had drunk too much. The drunkard barked at Yan to shut up and justified himself by saying that he was only behaving this way because of the beauty of teacher Cho. Yan somehow sat the raging Yom down in a chair, and he began to shout about how hardworking and diligent the mentor was because she was late at work again. When no one answered, Yom continued talking to himself, shouting inaudibly that Hyun was different from that bastard Hui, who only does what he does to gather around the same crazy students as himself. Jan asked why the teacher suddenly remembered the new guy to which he could only curse the guy incoherently. Yom fell on the back of the chair, almost falling off it, and with a threat somewhere to the ceiling announced that someday he would grab that asshole Hui, to which Yan, experiencing Spanish shame, put his hand to his face, quietly saying that the teacher was at it again. Opening his huge toad mouth, Yom almost passed out shouting something else absurd, and Yang tried to justify the teacher by explaining to Hyun that he was terribly upset because of today's exam. But the girl already understood perfectly well that Yom was pouring out nothing more than sadness and anger at the same time, since the strong students he had counted on were singled out one after another, and this loss ruined the teacher's reputation. Hyun looked at the poor guy and remembered the rumors that someone had suggested waiving the midterm exams. Being drunk to the point of squealing like a pig, Yom, with his head thrown back, wheezing and gurgling, invited the mentor to have a drink together, to which she agreed if only he would leave her alone. And to herself she thought how much she hated him. Hyun turned to the teacher saying that he had come in on time and asked him to check the report by tomorrow morning since the principal had asked to do everything quickly, and he agreed. The girl smiled and bowed saying that she relied on the teacher in this important matter. When Yun found herself outside the door in the fresh air, she breathed a sigh of relief that she had finally left this madhouse. The mentor slowly returned to her building where the rest of her colleagues lived, and the light there had not been on for a long time. The girl tried to climb up to the floor she needed as quietly as possible so as not to wake anyone. For one second, Yun stopped, looking at the door of one of the rooms, and tried to figure out if this was the one where Hui's mentor lived. And when the mentor approached her door and pushed it open, she looked again toward the new boy's room. After quickly changing her clothes, Hyun headed towards the most enjoyable part of the day when she would lie down on her bed and fall fast asleep. The girl let down her hair, which she tied up for the work process, and now she needed to lie down in bed as comfortably as possible. Hyun sat down on the edge, thinking about something of her own, and this did not allow her to lie down completely and relax. 
but the desire to sleep and overall fatigue from the entire rather busy day made itself felt. So the mentor lay down comfortably on the bed. The girl's thoughts were occupied by an unusual man whom she had finally met, and he seemed to her to be much younger in appearance than she had determined from the dialogue. Hyun analyzed that all the students that Hui teaches are from great families, and just recently he received gratitude from the head of the bakery family himself. Plunging into the sweet world of Morpheus, the mentor thought that she was even a little jealous of the newcomer, because maybe he himself came from some great family. At the last moment before going to bed, Hyun told herself that it was impossible and wanted to persuade herself to do something, but then she pulled herself away, saying that it was pointless and that she would rather sleep. Wrapped in a blanket, the girl fell asleep with the thought that tomorrow would be better than today. The next day, Hyun ran as fast as she could to the meeting in the principal's room, which meant getting from one corner of Dongchon to another. The teacher ran as fast as she could, scolding herself for having overslept everything and for now getting into trouble. Hyun flew into the meeting and from the doorway bowed low, reported that she had arrived and asked for forgiveness for being late. The director was already furious and pointed his finger at the girl and sternly asked what she was thinking, even though she hadn't even done anything yet. Poor Hyun stuttered and asked what exactly she had done wrong, and Jong explained to her that he had asked her to make a report without mistakes, but in the end it turned out that she had ignored these words. The teacher was completely confused and it looked like she was mumbling uncertainly under her breath until she caught sight of the bastard Yoma, who was already throwing a sideways glance at her. The girl bowed low to the head, saying that she had checked everything yesterday and everything was in order with the records. Jong slammed his hand on the notebook and shouted that the names of the mentors were incorrectly written in two places, and the names of the students were even more incorrect, and asked again whether the mentor had checked the work well before handing it in. Hyun once again felt extremely awkward about the fact that she now had to bear the brunt of both of them. The girl looked at Yom, who was giving her a condemning look, and additionally hinted to her that she shouldn't dare blurt out anything unnecessary. Hyun realized that that drunk ghoul didn't check a damn thing and handed the magazine over to the director in the same condition in which he received it. Jong raged, cursing that he couldn't go to the meeting in Incheon with such mistakes, and began to shame the girl for the fact that he would be embarrassed because of her inattention but Hyun obediently bowed and promised to fix everything. The head didn't stop at scolding Hyun, but also accused her of feeling like she was doing something nasty on purpose to set him up. The girl's face turned crimson and bowing again, she denied everything the director had said and once again promised to sort everything out. Zhang continued to press Hyun with accusations that she was deliberately setting him up because she was working overtime, but she said that she would never do anything like that and the director asked what was wrong with her then. It came upon Yom, and he, hiding his horns, put on a halo with which he scratched the ceiling, turning to the director with a request not to be angry with Hyun, because she would not have done such a thing on purpose. Zhong covered his mouth with his hand, and said with a calm face so that only Yom could hear, wondering who said that he was angry now. Toad reported to the head that, given the rumors, preparations for the midterm exam had begun in Incheon, and what happened in Incheon only meant the director's absence for about five days. And during this time, Yom guaranteed that he would personally oversee the correction of the report. Jong didn't quite expect this from his right hand, but he agreed to the conditions, but once again emphasized that the teacher really made sure that everything was done correctly. The dragon became a little more active again and barked at everyone not to forget their heads in the hull before going to the meeting and finally getting down to work. Hyun remained standing in place while the others had already come out discussing why the director was so angry, and the guys were betting that he would be in this state for a couple more days. The teacher was dejected by how severely she was reprimanded, but stood silently while the true culprit of what happened approached her. Passing the girl on the way out, Yom casually told her that he really was going to check the journal and return it to Hyun, but the trouble was, the director asked for the report first. The mentor smelled this stench that was called a lie because she knew that the director was not one of those who were so passionate about work that they would run to look at a magazine that had not been reported. Yom put his paw on the mentor's shoulder, comforting her so that she would not take what happened to heart, and suggested that she cheer up and then fix everything. Hyun didn't answer, but the toad had already started to stretch his jaw, inviting the girl to hurry up and have something to eat and improve his mood. Something inside woke up that had been dormant or suppressed for so long, but now, Sleep-deprived and scolded like a little girl, Hyun realized that she had had enough of this crap. As promised, the mentors worked hard to correct the mistakes after Jong left for Incheon. 
Every single one of us was tired of the paperwork, but finishing it was the most enjoyable moment that somehow motivated us to get everything done faster. Hyun was incredibly happy to have completed this tedious task, and after such a long time in a sitting position, the girl stood up to stretch herself well. Yom reminded all the teachers that they would soon have a midterm exam, so he suggested that they have a proper rest at a corporate dinner, and the crowd of teachers were all for it. Almost everyone was for it, and when Yom noticed how some of his colleagues hesitated to go, he said that the newcomers especially should be present, although the guys had their own plans for the evening, but they had to go with everyone. When it got dark, Dong Chon's mentors arrived at a fancy restaurant to enjoy delicious food and drinks and to meet the newcomers. Three tables were filled with delicious food, the variety of which was so varied that it was hard to find anything, and there was enough drink for everyone. The employees of the establishment looked at each other, and in their eyes one could see where so many mentors had come to them from. Yum decided to command the parade again, and announced that since everyone was already assembled, the new teachers needed to come forward and briefly introduce themselves. The first was a young man who loudly and clearly announced that he was Yong Mok and was Dong Chan's hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor. After Mac, an even more serious guy came out, but because he was nervous in front of the public, all he could get out of himself was that he was Dong Chan's mentor. The same teacher Cho Hyun stood in front of Yom, also introducing herself, but the teacher was already familiar with her. Hyun gave the information that was asked for and said that she studied sword art and that this happened in Chonmun. After Hyun, Yo Mei Hong spoke, saying that she had studied swordsmanship, which ended successfully and after which she received a letter of recommendation. The biggest news of Danchen and other schools came out, and with complete indifference to those present, introduced himself as Cho Un Hui. Hui turned to leave, but one of the mentors called him, pointing out that he hadn't heard how his partners had introduced themselves before him, and even if he hadn't heard, he should still have given a more detailed answer about himself. Here Yom started biting, throwing mud at Cho because he treated them all in such a way, to which the young man replied that if this was already a party with drinking, then shouldn't they all get drunk? The senior mentors were shocked by such impudence and bold speeches, especially from a newcomer who, judging by his youthful appearance, clearly still had milk on his lips. One of the teachers chuckled in Hui's direction and asked again if he really wanted to tell them all that he could drink. Now the situation was becoming more interesting for Cho, and turning to the elders, he suggested that they outdrink the three craftsmen. The old school master did not understand how one could behave so disrespectfully towards more experienced people, but he did not refuse. Another teacher sitting nearby agreed that the young man, although a newbie, knew how to be cheeky, and after that warned him that now he would have to keep his word. There was no food on the table anymore, but instead there were empty jugs and bowls with a ladle next to them. The bowl that needed to be drained was the size of Hui's head, but he coped with his task perfectly, slowly but surely drinking the drink. There were two mountains of such bowls next to the mentor, but he was able to empty the next one without any problems. The guy looked at his opponents and, smiling contentedly, said that they could continue, and it seemed as if he was drinking water. The colleagues were horrified by the difference in condition between Cho and his opponents, so May asked the mentor to stop. The masters told Kvi the sad news that all the supplies of booze were now completely emptied, and the young man did not understand how this could happen, but if the masters who were out cold had one column of cups, then next to Cho there were four. One of the elders was unconscious in a very bad state, and this only indicated that the morning would be terrible. While the young mentors ran up to the old men to check if they were alive at all, in the distance Hui noticed a man who was also drinking. The strict gentleman was a member of the investigation squad, and once again when the mentors were having fun, this noise irritated him, and the masters couldn't do anything. They had to drag the drunken bodies home, which was especially difficult with Yom, and was accompanied by a hum in the form of screams or laughter, and all this interfered with the master's ability to collect important information. The informer stood up from the table, took a closer look at some guy, and was about to head in that direction, but the man couldn't take a single step because he felt some kind of terrible sensation that was restricting his movements and thoughts. The informer turned right to where Cho was sitting, and for some reason he was emitting an incomprehensible energy. The guy smiled at the stranger, glad that he felt his vibrations, which meant that all that was left was a small matter. The unknown person realized that he had most likely been spotted, which meant that he had to hide from his reconnaissance sight as quickly as possible. As soon as the informer was outside the restaurant, he ran away in a blaze so as to remain unnoticed. With a sharp and dexterous jump, the man found himself on the roof of the house in order to move further away from the place where he was spotted. 
The informer didn't look like a ninja or an assassin, but he ran across rooftops so well that an ordinary person wouldn't notice. Having covered a sufficient distance to hide from prying eyes, the stranger jumped one last time, but only to land on the ground. The landing was successful, but there was no time to hesitate, so the informer continued his movement. The unknown man walked forward for some time, checking if there was anyone behind him, but behind him, everything was clear. The man recalled how for a moment in the restaurant, he felt a feeling of fear that he had never experienced before, and in front of him was only a young teacher. Sometimes you should be afraid of your desires because they tend to come true, which is what happened to the informer. Because when he turned around, he saw in front of him that same strange guy who was standing in anticipation, asking why he didn't run away anymore. The informer naturally froze in place, being in a stupor, but Hui continued to wonder what the hell the Manchin cult dog was doing in this place. The man was once again overcome with a feeling of fear, but now a reaction in the body in the form of twitching was added to it. Hui didn't hear the answer, so he brought the stranger to his senses by removing his hand with a sharp movement. The informer bent over in pain and screamed furiously as he watched a stream of blood gushing from his limb, but he could do nothing about it. Cho approached his old enemy, warning him that it was important to answer his questions without lying, and he said that he came to Dongchan to find out about the latest news at school. Hui repeated the enemy's words about the task of finding out about the pressing matters at school and asked why he needed it. The informer held on to what used to be his hand and said that he didn't know why the management needed the information because he was only collecting it. Another blow flew past the man, but he didn't even have time to react or somehow dodge it. Monchon's servant screamed exactly like a wounded animal from the hellish pain he felt shortly after the first one, which already caused agony. The man felt such pain for the first time, although he had undergone many trainings and tests, but this was something out of the ordinary. The master stood in front of the future victim and in a non-human voice, said that the conditions were such that if the informer told the truth, he would be able to die in peace. There was another condition that didn't fit in because Cho explained that if the servant lied, he would be able to live not much longer. Before the stranger had to decide, the mentor only said that in both the first and second cases, he would have a good time. Amethyst eyes glowed like crazy, and after a moment, Hui asked if the informer had made a decision for himself. The lights were still on in the tavern when the mentor returned there after a wonderful stroll through the night city. Mei immediately asked where Hui had gone, and the guy, as always, got out of it by saying that there was also a mess on the street, which the girl was not at all surprised to hear, saying that people were vomiting left and right here because of someone. Cho, in turn, not understanding the hint that he was to blame for getting the masters drunk, declared moderate consumption of alcohol, to which Mei quietly replied that it was a shame. Hyun took it upon herself to ease the tense atmosphere by pointing out that there was a beautiful side to all this horror, which surprised Mei. Hyun explained that due to the inability of some to drink, this was the fastest feast, because often such an event lasts almost until dawn. In addition to everything else, today the elders were humiliated, and this is a lesson for them in the future not to involve newcomers in drunkenness. The surviving mentors leaving the tavern exhaled that the cleaning was finished, but after conferring, they decided that the feast had ended early, and they could have a drink in a small circle before dispersing. The young people moved to the dining room where, as always, incredibly appetizing dishes were brought to the table, piping hot. Mei, looking at how Cho was gobbling up the meat, was shocked that he was so hungry again. But the young man argued that in order to grow, you need to eat a lot. Hyun also looked at Hui and drew the other's attention to how the mentor had grown recently. Mei doubted that Hui had changed, but Hyun explained that it was possible and not noticeable to her since they saw each other often. But since she saw her mentor less often, she was more struck by the changes in his appearance. The boys also turned their attention to Una and agreed that his facial features had indeed changed. One of the mentors approached Cho and asked him about his age, but an answer had already been prepared for that. Wai, chewing with gusto, replied that he was at the perfect age to get married, namely 25 years old. The young man's suspicious gaze became active and something flashed through his head like, can people at that age still grow? After all, Kui looked much younger than his years due to the lack of hair on his smooth face. And what else the guy noted for himself was Cho's passion for food, which was really similar to that age stage when the body is growing. But it's not 25 years old. The young man found it strange that all the listed and obvious facts about the behavior and appearance of the mentor did not match his age. Kui drank again, and ate more than everyone else while the others scolded him for being a terrible drunkard and glutton. And a little further from them, at that moment, an old man appeared whom only Cho noticed. 
The mentor turned his attention to the old man, who gave a slight gesture of greeting and bowed. Hui asked the elder to give Yuran something from him and expressed his hope that she would like the gift, after which he took his leave. It seemed to Mei that the mentor said something unintelligible and quietly, but the elder was already leaving the room, and Cho replied that he had not said anything but was simply slapping food. The old man headed to the Hao clan residence, which was still important and needed as a source of valuable information. The clan's mistress was at that moment spending her time in silence, smoking her pipe. She heard footsteps approaching the room where she was staying, realizing that it was her faithful servant who had returned. The old man silently appeared before his mistress and, placing that very gift on the table in front of her, bowed in anticipation. The assistant confirmed to the owner that her assumptions were correct since he personally checked everything. Yuran asked again if the person she asked to find was really there and if the old man had confused him with someone else. The elder answered affirmatively, confirming that he had seen the right person, since as he was leaving he heard how he was expressed the hope that the lady would like the gift. Taking a close look at the head that the servant Yuran brought, she was very surprised that this was called a gift, which meant that this was a reason to think. The lady continued to sit in place and began not just to think, but to make an effort to remember everything while the severed head stood to the side. Yuran thought that she would never again meet that person who once suddenly appeared in her life and then disappeared. The woman demanded information from the assistant about how he found that man, but the old man hesitated with his answer because, in fact, he did not know how it happened. The only thing the elder could say was that he left the residence to go about his business and it just so happened that this man was there at the place where he came. It was important for the lady whether the servant remembered the face of the mysterious guy because it would be a good reminder for the future of who not to deal with. The old man looked ahead as if remembering the man's facial features and told the hostess that he had definitely seen him. But the problem was that he didn't remember what he looked like except that he was a middle-aged guy or a young man. Yuran herself at that moment also tried to remember the appearance of the unexpected guest, especially since he was sitting right in front of her. But no matter what effort she made, she couldn't remember. The most mysterious thing is that the lady never had problems with memory, since her activities did not allow such errors. And the woman was infuriated by the fact that the guest's appearance just didn't want to pop up in her memory, although the general picture was present. Yuran caught herself feeling as if the guest had climbed into her head and brought the necessary order there in such a way that he had only erased his own face. In order to better clarify the situation for herself, the lady asked the elder that if there was a gift in front of her, then this meant that she could do whatever she wanted with it, after which he bowed and replied that this was undoubtedly true. Miss Yuran, based on the fact that she can do whatever she wants with her head, decided that this was an excellent opportunity to make the Murim Alliance owe them considering that in front of her was a servant of the Manchim cult, which the Alliance would not be able to pass by. With a wealth of experience in various machinations, Yuran indicated that it was necessary to send a spy into the territory of martial arts schools and into the evil faction, and if everything was planned correctly, it would be possible to get rich in gold. The lady remembered that the guy was talking about the appearance of flies on the streets of the Endless City. That is, it was not just about one such head, so Yuran gave the order to the old man to sell the story to the people from the Alliance at the highest price. The owner also added another task in the form of assigning a reward for a deed that will be called Dark Saint. Yuran decided that the best outcome would still be to keep the Dark One's name a secret while spreading the story. The assistant replied that he understood everything and bowing to his mistress, went to carry out the instructions she had given him. The lady filled her pipe with fresh smoke while thinking about the latest breaking news about the situation in the Pekri family, where the young master Pekri Zhongyang was unable to cope with his chi. Taking a good drag on the smoke, Yuran put together all the puzzles she knew before and recognized now to put together the whole picture. Exhaling smoke that spread in waves throughout the room, the hostess, looking at the head that was brought to him, also thought about the traitors in the Hao clan. Remembering her encounter with the ghost sage, the lady realized that the right decision would be to treat him as an enemy who comes and goes as he pleases. But the problem that Yuran didn't drive away the guest back then was that the gift he gave her back then was worth more than its weight in gold because it was a list of traitors. Then from the mouth of the young man, a huge amount of important and valuable information for the clan flowed into the lady's ears like viscous smoke. And immediately after the Dark Saint announced the list of names and surnames, the traitor whose head stood before the lady was surprised and drew his sword. No matter how you look at it, 
The guy continued to be a mystery to Yuran, since she was completely unable to figure out his motives. The training ground was bustling with life as always, and Hui watched as his loyal students improved every day. It was also interesting to watch the newly minted student Jay Kaltan, who kept up with his friends. The young master was improving the technique that he had first shown to his teacher before he took him under his wing. Tan once again managed to reach the culmination of the spiritual illusion technique, in which it was clearly visible how the swords became eight. And the most important thing was that with each lesson, Tan's technique became more and more powerful without any damage to the body, like the first time he coughed up blood. But all four students became more crowded with the development of their abilities. Like, for example, Tan's swords hit straight into the dummies that Sohei was repairing, but she jumped away in time. Shui was furious and immediately turned to Tan, shouting at him that he was an asshole. But he did not get up from his place because he was lazy. At the same time, the mentor did not leave the young man without attention and with a deft movement of his hand threw some small object at him. Only the object, although small, hit Tan so hard that the strong guy couldn't stay on his feet and stepped back as if the master had personally approached and hit him. Cho began to scold the student for the fact that he was incurring losses by destroying something that was already difficult to repair. But Tan shrank from a feeling of guilt like a little boy who was being scolded and asked for forgiveness, justifying himself by saying that he had gotten too carried away. Huawei pompously waved his hand at the guy, driving him away to his corner of the site and forbade him from coming here at all. Suddenly, Sohi was distracted from her super important work and turned to the master, who immediately responded. The little girl started to cry that she was already sick of looking at these mannequins, and instead of them, she would really like to do some real training. Cho thought about the little student's words before answering her with something that would suit both him and the girl. The teacher happily announced that he would teach the little one the technique of bloody tree 108 hands, thanks to which the pain would go away and the enemy would be broken, and asked Sohei how she liked this idea. But the girl screamed that she was not happy with this and demanded something less destructive from the mentor. So he asked to teach her an adequate martial art because after the exam, all her friends stopped communicating with her. But Aishui explained that this is what happens with warriors, that they cope alone, that is, without friends. The teacher thought that he was tempering Sohei's spirit by explaining to her that those friends were future competitors who needed to be hit first. But this only made the situation worse, and the crying little girl realized that the master had no friends, and at this rate, there wouldn't be any. But she didn't want that for herself. After some time, Soe sat by the mannequins and quickly but very angrily fixed them while Hui watched from the side. Jay Kal Tang approached the mentor with some tension in his body, which indicated that the young man wanted to ask him something important. The guy asked the master if he could try to coordinate four sides during the exam. Cho happily agreed to this, and then Tan, not expecting this, backed down a little, saying that such a technique first takes place under the guidance of a mentor. But before he could finish saying that the result depends on this, the teacher said that everything is in the hands of the young man. Tan, not understanding why the master agreed so easily and quickly, tried to persuade him again that in the event of training they would already have some kind of plan, expecting that the mentor would still say something contrary, but he only confirmed the student's thoughts and agreed with his opinion. The young man became terribly anxious because he did not understand what was happening since he had no experience of mentoring behind him, but he was so easily allowed to lead the training. And then Tan remembered his conversation with Yun Ho about how if a problem arises that results in a headache, the mentor can give him a kick in the ass, so the guy decided not to say anything else. All four great disciples of the great teacher stood on the platform, only this time Tang came to lead the parade. But Sol immediately rebelled against following the guy's instructions because she was absolutely calm and learned the technique herself. The girl indignantly continued to tell how she would figure out her coordination during the exam without anyone's help, not noticing how her biggest nightmare was approaching her from behind. When Hui asked Pekri if she was really so independent that she would just take the exam without training with other people, she turned around, pleased with the appearance of the master, and replied that that was true. But Cho had his own plans for this matter, and with the most mournful look possible, he approached the student, explaining that if they fail the test, he faces eternal hanging around in Dongchun. And to make matters worse, the mentor became even more sour than a lemon and began to whine about how after the promotion, everyone would go away, and only he would be here teaching forever. Hui approached Pekri, scaring her with his whining about how he would be given pennies and that he would eventually die here 
to which she immediately agreed that she wouldn't mind trying to train with the others. The students stood as follows, Namgun in the north and Payekri in the south. Tan himself was in the west and Sohei in the east. This arrangement was necessary in order to test the student from all sides for attack or defense against attacks. Tan reminded everyone that despite its simple level, the exam was basic in a martial arts school and then commanded everyone to move quickly regardless of where the attack was coming from and at the same time act in such a way that Yun Ho remained in front. Tan gave his instructions briefly and clearly, saying that after Yun Ho's attack and his departure, Bakery would intercept and attack the gap in the defense. So he finally had a chance to prove herself in something else, so she was told to be on Sol's side. Huai sat there, genuinely pleased with how well the guys were doing at teamwork and how well Tan was showing leadership qualities. Looking at the sky, Cho suddenly acquired a dreamy look, and it was not for nothing that his thoughts were occupied with that very thing, since now the trees he had grown were now managing on their own, which meant that now there was time to search and he could breathe a sigh of relief. It was a wonderful moment of peace that it seemed nothing could spoil. But every cloud has a silver lining and vice versa, and Qi was convinced of this while attending a meeting in the house where the director was. There were no shouts or heated discussions at today's meeting, and all the mentors simply sat in complete silence waiting for words from the leader. But Zhong was not just dejected or angry as always. This time, the director had the appearance of being unable to bear some event that he could not come to terms with. Zhong returned from Incheon with a white bandage on his arm, which was noticed by absolutely all the masters present. The mentors began to quietly whisper that this was quite unexpected and then waited for news from the head. One of the masters still decided to ask the director what happened, while Cho did not understand at all what was being discussed. Hui quietly asked his mentor Mei what the white bandage meant, to which the girl explained that the white cloth that is tied to the left hand has only one meaning. And when Cho heard that such a sign indicated the death of a mentor at a martial arts school, he himself almost died from the mere thought that everything he had strived for had collapsed. Zhang began to list everyone that would be discussed before explaining what had actually happened, and that it was about ten warriors and two instructors from the Golden Heavenly Hall. In addition to the previous participants, the leader also clarified about the five instructors from the Silver Heavenly Hall, and when all were accounted for, he announced their departure to the other world. One of the mentors asked how this happened to them and Zhang told about an incident that happened near the Mukan Fortress. The guy asked the director a leading question about the fact that if the instructors left the academy at that time, then it turned out that this happened because of Kang Ho Hyun from the Silver Heavenly Hall. But Zhang, lowering his head, sadly said that he could not give out such information because the information was secret and belonged to the Union. The director folded his palms together, asking the students to begin the day with a minute of silence for the dead since there could have been acquaintances of the mentors among those soldiers. The head also added that if we take into account the criminal's hidden presence in the Mukan fortress, then any internal and external activity will be suspended and ask the mentors to increase vigilance in order to avoid mistakes. The masters each went their separate ways after the meeting, but Hui and Mei were not yet planning on rushing off to training. The girl couldn't hold back her tears from the news, and after saying Yun Heiwal's name, she burst into tears to which Hui turned his attention, asking if he was someone famous. The teacher, wiping away her tears, said that this teacher was known as the Eight Swords of the Wind because he was a great swordsman and was able to do this thanks to the creation of his own unique swordsmanship style while being a student at the Mudan School. Mei couldn't calm down and cried even harder when she said that Hevel was one of her teachers when she was in the Silver Heavenly Hall. The girl remembered with bitterness how they celebrated the teacher's promotion to the Golden Heavenly Hall, and Cho, after this information, concluded that there was nothing like this in his past memories. The guy discovered for himself the change in that the Society of the Destroyed Sky began its activities much later. Hui, still with some doubt, thought about whether he had really changed the course of fate in this incarnation. While the mentors were walking towards their students, Cho analyzed that he had destroyed the organization that was supposed to be captured by the Destroyed Sky Society and he had also warned the sects of the righteous and demons about the society's spies. And for example, the very last action of Hui when he told the Hao clan about everything, and this could mean that if Yuran did tell the Murim Alliance about the bloody investigator and double agent, then this would lead to a change in the course of events. After the latest sad news, the atmosphere in the new military academy was oppressive, regardless of time and weather. If before the death of the warriors at school, people behaved freely, now restraint reigned all around, 
and even the exciting impatience and anticipation of the intermediate tests was replaced by seriousness and silence. One day, when Hui and Mei were heading about their business, they were caught up by Mo's mentor, who was also saddened by the situation. Mo spoke sadly about Teacher Yun and told the boys that he most likely got into trouble while preparing for the journey of the students of the Silver Heavenly Hall to the world of martial arts. The essence of the campaign in the world of Marima was that it was a form of examination for the students of the Silver Heavenly Hall, who were considered full-fledged masters of combat, unlike the newcomers of the Eastern Heavenly Hall. Hui listened from the sidelines about everything and understood that it would be an absurd act to send inexperienced students into the clutches of death. The mentor realized for himself that, according to Mo, the instructors went to assess the situation, but on the way back they got into a fight between the Muram Alliance and the demons. Teacher Mo concluded that the chances of survival were very low since the warriors were facing a rather strong enemy. Mei was worried about the fact that if the warriors died while carrying out the mission, then why were the higher-ups hiding it instead of openly declaring it to honor their memory? But Mo answered her sister that she also did not know why it was being hushed up. Mo Yan agreed with her sister's opinion, and she also found it suspicious that no official statement was made as was often the case. But Kui had a hunch that the reason for the silence was that the case was tied to spies. The mentor remembered well that the well-known and main fact about the Shattered Sky Society was that they planted double agents into the enemy ranks. In order to sow discord and dissension among the warriors, the people of heaven placed traitors as pawns who planted the seeds of doubt and mistrust. Because of such games that someone needed for some reason, people began to suspect each other of hostility and, as a result, could not stand side by side in the face of danger. While Hui was thinking about the frequent practice of the Broken Sky Society, Teacher Mo approached him. The girl asked if the master had heard about those who had been invited to the academy as replacements, and May added that it was now necessary to make up for the losses. Mo said that as far as she knew, some rather famous people had been invited to the academy and asked the guy not to faint. But Hui was not one of those who needed to sit down before important news, and he absolutely calmly asked who they were talking about. Teacher Mo raised her finger up to clarify the importance of what she was about to say, and named the name of Master Doc Coyle himself, who is also called the One-Eyed Sword God. Cho's face showed surprise as it seemed to the girls, but from the young man's side it was more of a flashback from the past. The guy repeated the name of the great master in his head and caught himself thinking that it reminded him of something. But after asking the sisters who this one-eyed man was and who else he was, the master of the girls were in quiet horror, and Mo, not believing her ears, asked if Hui really didn't know Master Doc Coyle because he is one of the ten great swordsmen of the Celestial Empire. Cho was even more disappointed when he realized that this master was one of the impenetrable righteous men. The young man's face twisted as if he had licked a lemon, and in his thoughts were words of prayer asking that this one-eyed man be sent not to them, but rather to the Silver Heavenly Hall, or at least to the Golden Hall. At the next meeting, Zhong announced that, as he had warned, new instructors would soon appear here in the Eastern Heavenly Hall, since there were not enough people in the gold and silver, and then Yom indignantly asked why they needed this. Toad started his tirade about why they needed instructors here if everything was fine with them anyway, but the chief raised his hand and asked him to cover his mitten. Jong calmly began to explain that it would indeed be more logical to send people straight to the golden and silver halls, but the newcomers needed an adaptation period, and so the decision was made to give them the opportunity to observe the work here. Yom looked at Jong suspiciously and quietly muttered under his breath that it felt like it wasn't something that could be resolved by observation alone. And the director announced that he had weighed all the pros and cons and decided to appoint new people as group mentors. Yom jumped up over the table, slamming his hands on it and shouting at the head that it was absurd to appoint newcomers as mentors right away. Toad turned red with anger, completely forgetting where and in front of whom he was, and declaring a claim that strangers cannot be mentors. Other masters also supported Yoma's words, reminding the head that a mentor is not only the owner of martial skills, but also a leader. And if those who do not stay for long are appointed as mentors, then confusion will occur. Zhong waited until the children stopped shouting like they were the smartest and most knowledgeable and only said, Doc Koyul, one-eyed sword god. The faces of everyone sitting there changed abruptly, and a deathly silence fell, and no one objected to anything anymore but just the mention of the great master sent shivers down everyone's spines. The director stood up and continued to tell that D.O.K. was personally invited by the supreme leader's son Ikyuk, as well as the judge in white and Amma Gilsan, 
and the new mentor of the new Marshall Hall and the master of the shining sword of the flame flower style recognized him as a worthy opponent. Looking at Yom, who was sitting quietly and below the grass, Zhang asked if he really wanted to appoint the Great One as a temporary instructor. There was a chuckle among the masters at the mess Yom almost got into by not thinking before entering into a discussion with the director. Zhang said that if he could, he would give up his post to Doc and ask the mentors whether it was not considered a sign of respect that a person himself expressed a desire to visit their eastern hall. The head of the department opened the curtain to the masters on the important negotiations during which the decision was made about Doc's appointment as a temporary mentor, and also added personally for Yom that if he had any more questions, he could ask Doc personally. Everyone remained silent, and Zhong took advantage of this moment by telling the teachers that according to rumors, Doc Koyul stopped in Changsan County on his way to them, and the mentors felt uneasy when they learned from the director about the punishment of the Black Path sect by Master Doc because the scoundrels tormented the common people. Yum abruptly changed his mind, saying that Doc had done a worthy deed, and this surprised everyone who saw and heard him at the beginning of the conversation. The meeting ended, and the mentors began to disperse to their business, not in the best shape, since on top of the previous news came the fact that they knew who would be coming to them. The mentors no longer huddled in groups to discuss the latest news, because they did not want to escalate the situation even further. Unlike Kavi, who said out loud and in plain text that everything he heard was just some kind of nightmare that didn't fit on his head, the guy walked and openly expressed indignation about why the hell this great man should drag himself to their insignificant hall where they pay a measly pittance and constantly drive him around like crazy. No one paid attention to the master, and there was no one to discuss the situation with, so he continued the monologue in his head, indignant that not only was Doc a master, but he was also an asshole. Hui did not understand the meaning of the sword-wielding master who had latched on to the peaceful representatives of the Dark Path. He should have gone his own way, but he punished the sect that robbed peasants for no reason at all and routed the bandits. The young man felt disgusted by the fact that only a typical representative of the righteous could behave like this, and catching himself thinking that he had a bad feeling, he decided to find out more about this would-be hero. The mentor went to the site where he was able to listen about One Eye and blah 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 and how famous he was, because he was famous for his desire for justice and determination, and this was the most boring thing Hui had ever heard. As it turned out, Tan was aware that Doc not only eliminated the masters of the Dark Path while he was wandering, but also destroyed the Gate of the Scarlet Demon, which is one of the schools of the demonic path of the Xinjiang province, and all because the master hated demons. Yun Ho added that if the stories were to be believed, then Doc did not belong to any clans and was talented, since he reached the pinnacle of his skill at the age of 20 and since then fought only in the name of justice. So he also couldn't resist, and agreeing with her partner's words, voiced that she dreams of following in the master's footsteps and becoming a powerful protector for the weak. The mentor sighed heavily and turned to Tan and asked if he could ask him something, to which the boy agreed. Cho looked up at his student and asked in all seriousness, what would happen if this one-eyed lover of right and justice became his commander? Tan was a little taken aback by such a question, since one person who was authoritative for him was asking about another person who was even more authoritative. But Yun Ho, without thinking, blurted out that Doc doesn't like lazy people, and the master despises those who are able to act but do nothing. And when Nam Gung blurted out from above that Do Ke would become the mentor's nightmare, even so he nudged him with her elbow, asking him to stop. Cho put his hand to his head and a not very pleasant energy began to emanate from him. And when the mentor turned to Yun Ho, the poor guy twitched. Looking at his student with one amethyst eye, Hui hinted to the guy that it seemed as if he had relaxed lately. Yun Ho bowed low and asked the master for forgiveness, to which the latter, standing in front of him, sternly asked if it was really just words. Nam Gun didn't need to be told anything else. He understood everything himself, and taking a box of needles, began to inject himself with them, until the teacher did the same. Yun Ho took a pose and froze in horror and shook like an aspen leaf, worried about getting a kick in the ass. One day, when the director called all the mentors in anticipation of the guest's arrival, he did not show up, and Zhang informed everyone that the master was most likely delayed for some business of his own, since he planned to be in Dongchan in three days. After leaving the assembly hall, the masters discussed what could have delayed the master, to which others spoke about rumors about how he discovered a secret branch of the Hao clan near the Choyansen River. Hyun found it hard to believe such information about the Hao clan, while his partner concluded that there was a stir in the alliance because of such a discovery. 
The mentor explained her surprise by the fact that the Hao clan are professionals in their field and are hiding at a high level, but Master Doc was still able to expose them. The colleague was filled with respect for the master, saying that even while overcoming the path, he does not get tired of doing good, and Hyun shared this opinion, adding that with a person like Doc, the world of martial arts will become safer. Cho walked behind the boys and listened to their admiration, which made him feel sick since the exploits of One-Eyed had become the daily main news. Kui also received information that Doc killed enemies while standing still using only one swing of his sword, which indicated that a technique for controlling objects at a distance was used. From what Cho knew, this was the achievement of a person at the level of a master in his entire life, and only in the best case was this the level of perfection, and it was already divided into the highest, middle, and lower categories, which indicated the difficulty of climbing to this level. All three levels of perfection could be compared to an insurmountable wall, and in order to reach the level that everyone around talks about Doc, it was necessary to reach a level higher than perfection, namely transcendental. And so Hui thought about how one-eyed, at 30-something years old, had reached a transcendental level, but at the same time, he was not in the memories of past incarnations. The guy didn't understand how such a person with a powerful aura capable of turning the world of martial arts upside down had not been imprinted in his memory in any way. After some time, the mentors were called again and informed of the arrival of the master, and some of them could not believe that they would see the legend, while others were worried about what he looked like. The door to the meeting room opened and the head asked everyone to take their seats to reduce the crowding. Zhang cleared his throat to make himself heard better, thereby attracting the attention of the entire audience, and then asked them to listen to him. The director turned to the door and invited the guests to enter the teacher's room of the Eastern Celestial Hall, where everyone was happy to welcome him today. The one-eyed sword god looked at the young men's gazes and read many questions in them, and when visual contact was established, the master thanked them for the warm welcome. Although his name was already known everywhere and about his exploits, the master still said his name while smiling and not pretending to be a serious and terrible warrior. The appearance of this legend struck Kui the most. He could not believe who he saw in front of him, and it was not because he was one of the greats. While the acquaintance was taking place in the teacher's room, the elder Ma Kil Song and the judge in a white robe, Sun In Hyuk, the head of the Cheong Kwan Chu Martial Arts School, were standing at the gate, and looking into the distance, the men discussed how it might be noisy there. Elder Ma pointed out that throughout the entire time they had been watching the battles from the sidelines, and Judge Hyuk reasonably responded that they had no other choice because if they went to war, there would be no one to defend the monastery. For the elder, this was still incomprehensible since something like this could be said in peacetime, but now everything has changed a lot. Kilsyong emphasized that the Alliance did not need kids waving swords while being safe like their mentors, and the judge agreed that it was a shock to him as well. The leaders admitted their mistake in not taking seriously the Hao clan's warning about the impending danger right to the walls of the Mukan fortress, which was the main point of the alliance. And since the enemy who attacked the warriors carefully planned it, it was because of this that heavy losses occurred. Judge Hayuk, against the backdrop of everything that had happened, thought about the elite of the two halls that had suffered, and it already looked like a conspiracy. Taking up the analysis, Hyuk resorted to his knowledge about the two divisions of the Alliance, the Inner Hall, which is headed by the head and nine great schools, and the Outer Hall, which consists of five great clans and masters. In the judge's memory, these units of the Alliance often acted separately and independently of each other, but when the attack incident occurred, they acted together. But even with the combined forces of the warriors of the two halls, Hyuk grieved over the loss of more than ten people on the battlefield. The gentleman looked around the place where they were, and Elder Kill's son admitted that he had no idea about the presence of traitors in the ranks of the Alliance, to which Hyuk confirmed that their carelessness led to the tragedy. The Elder told the Chief that in addition to the problems that already exist today, there is another one, and it will be more serious, because according to the words of the Elder Chvigolka, only a handful of spies are hiding in the Mukan fortress. Hyuk, after listening to his partner, added that the Hao clan also confirmed his words, which indeed indicated another problem. The judge took into account the fact that two fairly strong organizations that have numerous connections and informants in their arsenal put forward the same information. Having caught his colleague's thought, Ma continued to unravel this tangle, commenting on the fact that, based on the judge's words about clans, it could be understood that the enemy was hiding under a veil of secrecy and at the same time could spread his influence. 
The elder came to the conclusion that the clans are weaving their intrigues among both the righteous and the dark, and they have no choice but to guess the purpose of all this. Ma, being a fighting man, assumed that maybe this time they would have to face something more terrible than the demonic path, and with this, the new military academy would undergo changes. After listening to his comrade, Yuck did not answer anything, but he liked the enthusiasm and warrior spirit that was always in the elder. The judge asked Ma if he was overwhelmed with emotion at the appearance of the one-eyed sword god. The timid elder asked his partner for forgiveness, justifying himself by saying that at his age, which had passed his forties, it was rare to fight a worthy opponent. Hyuk was amused by how realistically his comrade looked at the world, and at the same time was not afraid of self-irony, and in addition, he emphasized that it was clear that he was born specifically for martial arts. Since belligerence had already been mentioned, the judge was interested to know Ma's opinion and impression of Master Doc. The elder remembered how he and Doc had fenced, trying to put into words now what he was thinking at that moment. The warriors crossed swords with dignity and withstood each other's blows, showing who was good at what, considering also that both were quite strong. With each blow, the fighters, instead of words, got to know each other more and more. And thanks to this, they assessed both their own strength and the strength of the enemy. The elder was pleased with the duel with Doc and shared with Hyuk that although they did not fight seriously, even this was enough to understand that the master was stronger and more unshakable than it seemed. Hyuk was also glad to hear this because with a person who has both a noble heart and skill, he will influence the world of martial arts to live peacefully. But then Ma expressed his surprise that Doc reached such heights not in school but in real battles. The judge commented on the uniqueness of the master as the fact that such a person is urgently needed in difficult times, but at the same time, with a heavy heart, he added that it would be better if such a time did not come, but the problem was that it was inevitable. Ma drew a parallel with the fact that there is also turmoil among the followers of the Dark Path, and also a suspicious calm in Xinjiang, with which Hyuk agreed, indicating that if a storm is raging, then the monastery will not be calm either. The judge turned to his comrade and asked him to act as he saw fit in carrying out his reforms, and this surprised the elder, so he asked again if the gentleman was sure. Without answering yes or no, Hyuk only asked Ma to be careful when choosing assistance. Meanwhile, no one has come out of the teacher's room yet, and it's no wonder since with the arrival of Master Doc, the work has become even more intense. The mentors approach the master if not for a question or advice, then to give him magazines to read. One of those who handed the magazine to the one-eyed sword god was Yom, whose insolence and hot temper suddenly disappeared and he began to behave like a newbie among the elders. Toad suddenly became very friendly and smiling, which made his face seem even uglier to Kavi than when he was dissatisfied with everything. After reading through the magazines about the life of Dong Chien's school after graduation, Doc came to the conclusion that this explains a lot. When the preparations were completed and the mentors again went about their business, Two of the mentors walked along discussing what an incredible person Doc was and how he exuded glory, virtue, and wisdom, so it was not for nothing that he was called a master. Hyun shared that when Doc just sits, unimaginable energy still emanates from him, and Mei was shocked by such a statement. Having become convinced of what a real master is, and Hui walked behind and listened to all these inspired exclamations. What became disgusting is that if it's not the girls who go and discuss this one-eyed man, then the guys behind are worried about how they can stay here, because because of the temporary mentor they have been on dry rations for a week now, and they have to live like this for another six months. The guys who were walking behind the mentor complained to each other that this master would quickly finish his internship and go to one of the other halls just to get away from here. For the first time, Ki behaved strangely and did not sit on the bench, but walked in small circles on the playground, thinking about his own and Soka, who was repairing the mannequins as always, noticed this. The little girl approached the teacher and asked him what had happened to him that he couldn't find a place for himself. But this time the master did not smile, but tried to delicately answer that adults have their own headaches that she, as a little girl, could not yet understand. So he returned to the mannequins, realizing that the teacher was three-finger armor that could not be penetrated, but she guessed that he was in such a state because of the arrival of Master Doc Coyle, a... The girl began to imagine how Master Doc looked with disdain at Teacher Cho, asking if he was the famous mentor. So he also imagined how Doc scolded the teacher for the mess, and how Hui felt ashamed and swore that they would fix everything, bending over backwards. Looking at how the mentor was suffering and sighing heavily, so he tried to understand whether everything was really that bad for him. 
the little girl headed towards Saul, who was just training, but discussing the condition of the mentor was much more important. The little one approached Pakri asking what they should do, which the girl at first did not understand at all and asked to clarify what exactly the problem was. So he explained to Sol that the temporary mentor had arrived in Dongchon, and she felt that for this reason, Master Cho was not doing well. Sol turned towards where Hui was to look at what the younger one was talking about and make sure of what was said. And indeed, the teacher still couldn't find a place for himself, and so he assumed that if he was so nervous, then there was a serious problem. But she didn't know what to do, and she didn't understand how to help Kavi either. Pekri continued to watch her mentor and his behavior closely connecting it all with what the little girl told her. At some point, Sol said that it would be great if there were only five students, which shocked Sohei, not understanding what the eldest was saying. Pekri smiled slyly and explained that if you don't like the temporary mentor, you can simply leave the academy, because becoming a son-in-law in some noble clan is better than a teacher in a new academy. Namgung's brother joined the partners and said from behind that apparently a lot of pressure was being put on the teacher. Tan also picked up the conversation, explaining that it was obvious, because if Hui was good as a teacher, his manners left much to be desired. So he agreed with this judgment, but decided to make a springboard out of it, explaining that the master could become an easy target because of his character. Tan continued to spin this topic and added that when it comes to giving someone a compliment or something like that, he doesn't even know what to say. The guys began to worry that there was no way out and thought maybe the mentor should try to stay in the shadows for a while, but so he convinced everyone that Hui would not do that, and Sol again suggested that he should marry someone of convenience. And then all four of them thought about the fact that the idea sounded possible and good, but only in words it seemed easy. If they all spoke at the same time, the idea would be the same. None of them would want the teacher to be fired. As evening approached, Cho was one of the first to be in the building, as thoughts about One-Eyed had exhausted him so much during the day. Hui lay in a dark room looking at the ceiling and yawning sweetly, although he didn't want to sleep at all, so he just rested, thinking about his own things. Suddenly, May heard from her room that the mentor was there and asked him if he was going anywhere, and Cho replied that even if he needed to go somewhere, he still wouldn't go. May explained that it was important because Yom had called a meeting to discuss the midterms, and accordingly, Headmaster Zhang had told everyone to attend, after which she asked if the teacher hadn't heard it again. The girl waited by the wall for the guy to answer or for some movements, but instead she heard snoring. May didn't know if Hui had really fallen asleep or was just pretending not to go anywhere, but there was nothing to do and she just cursed in her head. While Cho masterfully pretended to be fast asleep and continued to snore loudly, May gave in and said that if there was anything important, she would tell him later. When Hui heard that the girl had left, he turned down the volume of his snoring a little and after some time stopped doing it altogether. The guy continued to lie silently and look at the ceiling, unable to calm his thoughts that were ready to tear his head apart. Hui was tired of lying down and doing nothing, so he groaned and got up from the bed, muttering under his breath that he was already tired of all this. The young man opened the window of his room, but not to admire the sky or breathe fresh air. Hui peered into the distance, seeing and hearing things that would be beyond the capabilities of ordinary people. It would seem that there was nothing special, and the eye was simply presented with a picture of sleeping mountains and forests under the moonlight. But since the young man couldn't sit still, he stood on the window frame in order to spend his evening a little differently. A second later, Cho disappeared from sight, jumping out of the window somewhere high up and leaving only a trace of his jump behind him. It seemed like the young man was flying straight to the moon, but his goal was the forest, so there was very little left before landing. Although the moon shone brightly and better than any lamp or candle, because the tree crowns were thick and stood close to each other, the light could not penetrate everywhere, which made the forest visually even denser. We successfully landed on the ground in the middle of the forest, using his power, but the walk did not end there. Cho's appearance was as always spectacular but creepy, and the mood with which he arrived in this forest was also not cheerful. Having stood up, the young man did not move from the spot and did not turn his head but simply waited in place for what he had come for. Looking into the thick forest, Kivi waited silently, and from there he could already hear footsteps that were getting closer. When the guy realized that he would already be heard, he asked if the man had called him here. There was no one in front of Cho for a moment, and it would have looked quite creepy from the outside when you stand like that and talk to nowhere and to no one. But a little later, the silhouette of a man appeared, heading towards the young man. From the dark forest thicket appeared the same beloved Doc Coyle who had called the guy here. Standing at a distance, Coyle bowed to Hui, greeting him and at the same time confirming that he really did call him. 
Cho looked closely at the mysterious man and asked what the purpose of his visit was. Doc also looked at the guy, but remained silent, not answering the question, but it was clear that he had something to say. Hui didn't expect that instead of words, One-Eyed would fall to the ground on his knees, which looked very strange. But the man had a smile on his face and he happily introduced himself as Sima Yul of the Sima clan, greeting his master. Hui looked at the unexpected turn of events, and in his head repeating the master's name, he understood that in front of him was the heir of the Sima family, and this clan was one of the noble clans of the Dark Path in Xinjiang, and moreover, also a loyal servant. Cho caught himself thinking that he had suspected about another person, so he asked who the one-eyed sword god was then. Yule stood on one knee, explaining that this was the form he created in order to walk around the world, and this moment Covey did not understand. The master said with such joy that he was traveling in order to behead the leading alliance of Murum, as if he was simply going to meet an old friend for tea. Kavi wasn't very happy about this news, so he kept silent. But he knew that this wasn't all that this man could tell him. Yule, noticing the severity on his master's face, bowed and explained that as soon as he gave the order, he would immediately go and kill the head of the alliance. Kvi didn't really like this idea, and he asked Yulia to tone down his ardor and leave the head of the head alone, because why would he want to end the life of someone who hadn't done anything nasty to him? Sima still kept going on about how the main thing in a fight is to cut off a head and asked if the master didn't agree with him, to which the young man could no longer bear it and became enraged that literally a second ago he had said no fights or battles. And after the scream, Cho switched to a calm but depressed voice because if he had known about such a thing as a fake identity, he himself would have acquired one and accordingly would not have suffered in this stinking eastern hall. But Yule responded to the gentleman's thoughts that he would not have been able to pull off something similar so easily. And Ki became interested in the reason. Sima explained that in order to create his image, he founded a fake clan several decades ago. And when he was still a boy, he hired actors who appeared in public with some frequency on his behalf. Cho felt uneasy when he heard how Yule and his people showed up about 15 times a year at the meetings of the righteous clans and also spent a lot of money, time, and effort on creating a legend. For a lazy person like we, it was a nightmare to hear how much time someone spent on such a hassle. Yule bowed again and menacingly declared that all this was done in order to deprive the head of the dominant alliance, and with this lay the world of martial arts at the feet of its master. Cho couldn't take it anymore and pointed his finger at Sima, threatening him to cover his mitten because such things sounded crazy. Huai got really angry and reminded Yulia that he was told to help their teacher, and after that asked what the hell he was doing here. Yule reported that he had wiped off the face of the earth all the puppets of the destroyed Sky Society, to which the gentleman replied that the society's authority had already been shaken. For Cho, the teacher's safety was most important. So he told Sima that they needed to stay close to him and protect him because no one knew what kind of misfortunes could happen. The fighter reported to the gentleman that he had found suitable people and had taken the necessary measures for everything that Covey had just listed, so he asked him not to worry. Cho sighed heavily, realizing that he had thought correctly that Yule would have turned the earth upside down just to carry out the order. Sima lowered his head slightly and timidly said to Hui how his master could think that the fighter would leave him because the shadow does not exist without light. Cho spoke briefly and clearly so that Yule could speak for himself and pointing his finger at the ground, demonstrated that he could live without shadow and therefore without light. Sima asked to leave his shadow alone but in his mind he thought about the master, that there was no conscience at all. After receiving a lot of information, Hui wanted to know more about how the servant found him. Yul told about rumors that a bill for a million liang appeared in the Hao clan, after which he began to get information, but Cho objected that a bill for such an amount, although rare, could still be found. Sima continued to explain that he was searching among those who were not related to trading houses and noble families, because he remembered that the master was not keen on luxury. Hui was not surprised by how once again Sima thought through every little detail, and it turns out that his carelessness was his undoing, and it was precisely because of this that the young man tried not to use bills of exchange. Cho asked to reassure him that the entire squad of the Phantom Blood Whirlwind was not heading here, to which Yule replied that he did not know what the master would like, so he came himself. Hui remembered very well how he had gathered and personally trained a squad of loyal warriors about whom he had just asked the servant. Finally, Cho praised Sima that it was the right decision to come himself, but he didn't know until the end whether his father would notice his son's absence or not. We became nervous along with Yule, 
agreeing that he was right about his father's anxiety. Cho remembered very well how Yulia's father, whose name was Guan, had been watching him since his early childhood, and this old man would sense something was wrong even faster than his son. The understanding that sooner or later they could be exposed made the guy nervous, because it was unclear what to do if his entire clan came for Yule. Cho decided to start with the fact that it was necessary to figure out what to do with Yule himself. But when he voiced the task to him, the servant could not believe that the master was looking for a woman. Sima asked what number this wife would be, because if you count in order, she would be in 182nd place, and now Cho was shocked where so many candidates came from. The servant explained that while the master was away, the noble families of the heavenly demon cult sent him brides. Hui asked again to understand that the ten great clans of the Dark Path presented a bunch of marriageable girls as a birthday present. Cho couldn't understand how such a number could have come about if there were only four of them, but Sima made it clear that while the master was away, competition had increased. The servant decided to gently warn the master that there was a fear that by the time he came of age, there would be more than 200 girls, which took Hui by surprise. Hui came to the conclusion that he himself had started this mess when he returned to the past and arranged a meat grinder in the cult of the Thousand-Year Demon in Xinjiang. At that time, the young master did not even suspect that his revenge would cause such a resonance and attract so many followers to him. Sima informed the master that the daughters of the ten great clans of the Dark Path were special, so he allocated them separate chambers that would suit their refined tastes but Hui insisted that one wife was enough for him. Yule understood that he would have to refuse all the great ones and their daughters, but he heard perfectly well that only one woman was important to the master. Sima shared with Hui that this is exactly what he expected from his master, that marrying the main woman is much more important than the severed head of the leader of the alliance. But Cho warned that nothing had been decided yet because he did not know whether she would agree. The servant decided to demonstrate how their school is famous for the art of controlling the dead, which means a girl can always be turned into a Zhang Shur. When dark eyes instilling fear and horror stared at Yulia, he realized his mistake and stopped speaking. The servant was again on his knees asking for forgiveness from his master, and without raising his head, Sima assured him that he could not worry, since he would be happy as a loyal servant to provide any help regarding love affairs. The guy continued to explain, kneeling, that as Sima Yule he was unable to do anything. But as Doc Koyul, he would definitely help. Sima voiced one of the master's wishes regarding getting into the Silver Hall and said that if such a thing were needed, then all he had to do was give the order, since even though he was a temporary mentor, he had influence on the leadership. Cho looked at this bastard and again remembered why he didn't like him and it all lay in the fact that Yule was terribly useful and everywhere and again, instead of meeting his beloved, fate brought the guy together with an unwanted guest. Yule looked at the log of Cho's activities and sadly announced that he would not be able to enter the Silver Hall, which shocked the young man. Sima closed the journal and pronounced the verdict that the matter would not move forward and that the plan was completely lost. The servant seriously stated that he needed compelling reasons to interfere in personnel matters, but such assessments are certain death. Chui wanted to know if it was impossible to do anything at all, and Sima voiced that there was an option to award additional points, and the guy picked up that competitions were needed for this. Doc assured the young man that there are no hopeless situations, and suggested organizing a special task for the completion of which additional points would be awarded. Shui did not quite understand the sinus yet, because he knew that all the halls worked separately from each other. That is, the students and teachers of the Eastern Hall could not leave their boundaries just like the people of the Silver Hall and this suggested the idea of removing the boundaries. Cho cited as an argument that after the recent tragedy, the halls began to unite with each other, and this was a reason to take advantage of the opportunity. The question remained whether the leadership of the academy would agree that Yule asked to provide this to him. The man's true nature awakened, and he assured the master that he would make good boys out of these righteous people, since it would be to their advantage. Sima made a verdict that no matter how talented the students were, they would not get far with these teaching methods, so it was necessary to give them a shake-up. One day, on the main square, the mentors stood in neat rows in front of the one who was about to give an important speech. Today, everyone was gathered to honor the memory of fallen comrades who, even while carrying out a mission, died as heroes. Sun and Hyuk stood before the soldiers, announcing that today he shared this grief with them, telling them that on this tragic day, they lost loyal heroes who gave their lives for a just cause. The judge began to call out each person's name, 
and the first were the warriors from the Golden Heavenly Hall, who had died a heroic death. Cho remembered that the teachers from the Golden and Silver Halls bowed their heads in sorrow, saluting their seven fallen comrades. It was obvious to everyone that the farewell ceremony left behind a bitter aftertaste, because until that day, no one understood why they couldn't do it right away. It was unclear to the representatives of the halls why the Alliance was silent about the incident, given that the attack took place near the walls of the Mukon Fortress, which is the heart of the Alliance, and such a reaction from the top looked disrespectful. Normally, there would have been an immediate reaction from the Alliance to the fact that the teachers of the Martial Arts Academy had died, but even despite the discontent and indignation that only grew, the silence still continued. Mei stood next to Hyun, expressing her dissatisfaction with the fact that such silence was inhumane towards those people who dedicated themselves to serving the Alliance, and her partner agreed that she also did not expect this. Hui stood behind his colleagues and listening to what they were saying. He knew much more than they did and understood that it was not a matter of wanting not to reveal the identity of the killer, but in general that the Alliance could not say anything. The judge began to read out the names of those killed in the Silver Hall, and then Cho thought about a very important thought. Standing like this among everyone, the young man thought that no one could know for sure that perhaps the killer was one of them, and that it was a traitor who came from behind with a knife to his comrade. The Alliance is silent precisely because even the thought that a friend could be an enemy could instantly sow the seeds of discord. The judge's mournful speech ended with words about eternal memory to the heroes who died for a just cause and wished their souls to rest in peace. As Kui watched a few days after mourning for the warriors, life began to bubble up again at the academy and everything began to return to normal. Classes resumed at the usual pace and number and battle cries could once again be heard on the training grounds. One day when Hui and Mei were walking, the girl asked him if he had heard the latest news that big changes were coming soon at the Martial Arts Academy. Cho looked questioningly at Mei, and in his head he also asked himself what was meant by big changes. While the guy was walking and thinking about what kind of dirty trick they would be given this time, the mentor explained that there was a possibility of their transfer to a contract system. The girl was so happy to tell me that now the selection of teachers will depend on whether they specialize in training fighters or not and the master asked what this phenomenon was connected with. May made the assumption that things would change due to the recent attack in which teachers took the brunt of the blow while protecting students, and so the decision was now made to prepare students for such situations. We understood that behind all these changes stood none other than Sima Yul, and he carried it out under a good pretext. Cho also heard that during the attack, even the students of the Golden Hall were confused and could not defend themselves which is why the teachers had to enter the battle. May summed it all up by saying that the students were really coddled too much, and that's what led to the tragedy. The mentor believed that it was important for warriors to be hardened in order to be strong, not only in body but also in spirit. And when May clarified that these changes were introduced by Master Doc Coyle, she melted, saying that this man had only just appeared at their school and had already changed something that had been at a standstill for years. When Hui came to the hope of the righteous schools and part-time head of the demonic sect, he heard from him that it was time to change the teaching methods. Namely, it was time for schools to abandon old traditions and begin to evaluate based on abilities. Cho agreed with every word Sima said because when the war began, those same vaunted young men who were false heroes were the first to die. But Hui also realized that it was not only the lack of combat experience, but also the fact that real warriors died because of such idiots who were striving for power. So he praised Sima for the idea. The mentor also added that if the righteous become stronger, then the society of the destroyed sky will have a hard time. And then Yule said that there is one problem and Hui asked what has already happened. The servant explained that there was another side to the coin and it was that if the students became strong, it would be more difficult to kill the head of the Alliance. Yule suddenly covered his face with his hand and sadly said that he didn't care about the righteous because there was nothing more important than finding a wife for the master so he might have to sacrifice his principles. And after his brave speech, Sima also added that the master should find his love and give birth to at least 30 children, which made Kui shocked and swear at the servant that he was not his breeding stallion. During another conversation, May asked her partner if his blood wasn't boiling in his veins because such changes were approaching. Shui refrained from answering, but in his head he told May that if only she and everyone else knew who this ideal warrior and righteous hero was. May clearly wouldn't have believed Hui if he had told her so directly that Master Doc was delirious, 
with the dream of cutting off the head of their leader. In the evening, Cho was again lying in his room, looking at the ceiling and racking his brains on what to do, because if Sima were an ordinary loyal servant, then there was nothing to worry about and you could just drive him away. But the problem was that Yule was as cunning as a fox, and Cho, despite his incredible strength, recognized the predominance of the guy's ingenuity. Kvi analyzed that if he gives in, then soon he will be surrounded by nothing but predators who will be as fierce as a bear and as cunning as snakes, which is now what Yule is showing by being very capable. The mentor fell asleep with the fear that Sima would devour the entire martial arts world without even choking. Cho has already learned that Yule is a natural actor and an ideal puppet, especially when you watch him communicate with students and masters about the radicalism that is needed to preserve peace. And Sima showed himself most vividly at meetings when he shouted that peace and tranquility were their main enemies, so they couldn't stand still. Master Doc raised the morale of his mentors by asking them to remember the time when, as young men, they dreamed of becoming great warriors like those they looked up to. All we watched from the side as the master's fiery speech awakened the hearts of the teachers and they were ready to meet the changes. The young man sat at the negotiating table and watching this cunning fox thought what a scoundrel he was, but most importantly, effective. Continuing to observe, the young man noticed among the teachers that the mistrust of the master had disappeared and they all kept saying that he had not let them down and that the academy was really changing. Cho wanted to puke from how others praised Doc as a leader and how he removed routine from the academy. All you could hear from everywhere was how the teachers were happy that something that had become so boring was finally gone. Even the senior teachers, inspired by the master's words, agreed that they once truly dreamed of becoming heroes. Hui, knowing the background of one side and the other, understood that they were so skillfully deceiving each other. The guy turned to the teachers from the influential clans and realized that even they were taken in by the incredible performance from a master who was not even one. Huai was already truly sick of such sweet speeches that were poured into the ears of the righteous. But the most intriguing thing was that most likely the world of martial arts was waiting for such a future.